Uh, so welcome to our second annual Engage Jane Studies online conference, academic conference that is. We have some wonderful notable scholars in the field of Jane Studies here joining us with some excellent papers. I've been working with them on this project for the last few months and I'm really, really excited with all of the presentations uh, that we have here. Um, so I'm going to, uh, oh, and I guess I should say, my name is Kojin Bohanik. I'm an assistant professor in Sanskrit and Jane Studies at Arihanta Institute. I'm also a visiting assistant professor at Claremont School of Theology, uh, where Arihanta Institute collaborates to offer a master's graduate uh, program in Engage Jane Studies. Um, so this conference has been conceived as a way of bringing uh, together Jane Studies and Yoga Studies into the broader academic discourses about social engagement and yoga. Um, and we're really seeing that the, um, the, the increasing growth in the field of yoga studies in general, and we're really wanting to see uh, the field of Jane yoga studies uh, grow as well, too. And there's a number of Jane texts and important Jane thinkers who have been working on Jane yoga for centuries, you know, and so it's important that those voices are represented, particularly with their unique and innovative contributions to the field of of yoga, of the yoga movement. So the goal of this conference is really to define and expand the methods and approaches that we can use in Jane research on yoga teachings and yoga practices. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Harveen Jane. Uh, part of Dr. Parvin Jain is the founder, CEO, and chairman of Arihanta Institute. Um, he's had an exciting career of over 30 years as an entrepreneur, founder, chief executive of multiple techn technology companies. But for the recent uh, couple decades, he's really mostly focused his attention on philanthropy. He's a disciple of Acharya Sushil Kumar, and he's authored an introduction to Jain philosophy, based on Acharya Sushil Kumar's writings and teachings that I had the privilege of editing. Uh, he and I are also currently working on a book on Jain mantra and Jain theory of language based on Acharya Sushil Kumar's writings and teachings. Please welcome Dr. Parveen Jain. Jai Junaid. Good to see everybody. Uh, we'll start with Namokar Mantra. Om Namo Arihantanam Namo Siddhanam Namo Ayriyanam Namo Uvajjhayanam Namo Loe Sabva Sahunam Eso Panchanamo Karo Sabva Pava Panashnam Mangalanam Chasabve Singh Paramam Havai Mangalam Jai Jinen, once again. We are delighted to welcome you to our Jain Yoga Conference. As Kodanji said, it's the second in our Engaged Jain Studies series. Just to give you an introduction of Arihant Institute, uh, Arihant Institute is a pioneering institute for education, research, and scholarship on engaging the philosophy of compassion and nonviolence, the bedrock of Jain Studies. We offer a wide-ranging platform to educate, empower, and connect everyone who is passionate about building a kinder and gentler lifestyle. Our offerings include MA in Engaged Studies in partnership with Claremont School of Theology, live and self-paced short courses for non-degree learners, public and scholar exclusive conferences and webinars, and we are building global partnership with aligned organizations. Everything we do is online, so we can reach the global community in short two years, we have received approximately 700 enrollments in 40 courses, 40 short courses, I should say, from over 20 countries. We held two public conferences in 2023 with approximately 200 and 500 registrations. In addition to the above two terms, uh, in addition, in the first two terms of our Jane degree program, which started in the fall 2023, we received 35 enrollments uh, in the six graduate study uh, courses that were offered. And we are truly appreciative of all the support we get from CST. We empower our students and audiences with ancient wisdom to build a modern lifestyle that is in harmony with everything around us. The unprecedented global response we are seeing uh, as, as, as I talked about in the last two years, indicates a high level of interest in what we offer. Clearly, there is a hunger for these studies when they are presented in the right framework. 
Today's conference is a special one. Yoga has always been an integral part of Jain tradition, fueling one's quest for spiritual awakening. Yoga in Jainism in somewhat understudies, at least I feel that way. And we felt it was the right time to bring together some of the eminent scholars of the field in this conference. We have approximately 300 registrations today, just, just FYI. Uh, in Jain yoga, Dhyan yoga is perhaps the most crucial element and multiple scholars are discussing that today, which is really, really good. Acharya Haribhadra Suri was perhaps the first to put, to put together a structure around yoga practice. And we will hear about that as well today. Uh, another thing, very soon we'll be embarking on another significant initiative, the Vegan Studies Initiative at Arihant Institute. It's the first of a kind. The ve vegan lifestyle is rising, although it is generally viewed in health-related choices, but veganism is much beyond, much more beyond that. Its roots are in compassion and nonviolence. We have planned a very comprehensive program to view veganism through the academic lens. We will offer short courses, like we are doing MA degree studies in partnership with CST, a webinar series, a conference, conferences, articles, blog posts, and much more. All of these are focused on vegan studies, and this is all in addition to what we do all the times in our regular uh, offerings. Some highly noted scholars and the who is who in this field, in the field of veganism, are joining us in this program. Please visit our website for some details which are coming forth uh, in the next few days. Finally, I want to take a moment to thank our educators. I, I believe they're the most precious uh, individuals among us. They're the educators, researchers, and scholars of Jain studies. Our world needs these teachings more now than ever. You are the purveyors, our educators, are the purveyors of the knowledge that has become a necessity and not an option anymore. You have committed your careers, which is really admirable, to become the torch bearers of Mahavir's program, Mahavir's messages. And we truly appreciate that very much. This year, Mahavir Jayanti is on Monday, the coming Monday, April 21st. And what better way to celebrate his birthday than what we are doing and what our educators are doing, day in and day out. In addition, the Earth Day is on April 22nd. Again, a great day to celebrate for the people who are really affiliated with the characteristics of our planet. Once again, it is truly a pleasure to welcome you all in our conference today. A great lineup of sessions waits for you, and I'm very sure you're going to thoroughly enjoy it. Thank you, and Jai Janetra. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Parveen G. Thank you for sharing this insightful words and also uh, for talking a little bit about the programs that we're offering here at Arihanta. It's very exciting, very cutting edge, innovative things that we're doing here. And our uh, academic research has been really astounding. So thank you for sharing those words. Uh, next, I would like to uh, ask a few words of Dr. Christopher Jane Miller. Uh, Dr. Christopher Miller is the co-founder, vice president of academic affairs and professor of Jane and yoga studies at Arihanta Institute. He completed his PhD in the study of religion at the University of California, Davis, and he's a visiting researcher at, at the, uh, at, oh, sorry, that was a typo there. He's a visiting researcher at a museum in Switzerland, Zurich, I think it was. Sorry, I didn't get that quite right uh, on my notes here. Um, but he's a visiting professor at Claremont School of Theology, where Arihanta offers the MA in Engaged State Jade Studies that has been mentioned. Uh, his current research is really focusing on modern yoga and engaged Jainism. Uh, and he and I are also co-editing in a volume where a lot of our panelists are uh, uh, authors in that volume. Uh, and so, Please welcome Dr. Christopher Jane Miller. Thank you, Dr. Bohanek, and thank you everyone for coming to this conference, the second annual Engaged Jane Studies Conference, Yoga and Jainism. I really want to congratulate my colleague, Dr. Kojin Bohanek, for his wonderful organization of this over the past almost year since we started conceptualizing this, and he came up with the idea to do 
a conference on yoga and Jainism. We really want to thank our coworkers and our team and the volunteers and everyone at Arihanta Institute who helped make this possible for us to bring this second conference to you. Last year, we had our first conference on engaged Jain studies, and this conference focused on defining applied Jain studies. Many of the presenters who are here today presented on that conference as well. So we have a small but growing community of Jain scholars in this online space, and it's been taking off fairly rapidly. So much so that last year after our conference, we invited our speakers to contribute to a volume on engaged Jainism that is, I'm happy to say, about to be submitted to SUNY in its final form after we get a couple final more chapters from our contributors. Uh, but we're almost there, and you can expect to see that volume on engaged Jainism coming out soon at uh, from SUNY Press. This year, we are bringing this conference on yoga in Jainism to discuss this very important and growing topic in the field. We have both senior scholars in this field, as well as new scholars who are making contributions to this field, very important contributions. And we do hope that Dr. Bohannik's conference that he's organized here with everyone will lead to some future publication in this regard to continue to advance this field of academic inquiry. So we'll see that it's, there is going to be a very interdisciplinary approach taking place here. And we're, we really want to encourage this, an interdisciplinary approach to the study of Jain yoga, what we're calling Jain yoga. I want to thank our panelists for agreeing to participate. And I also really want to thank our respondents. We have Tina Vekemans and as, at Ghent University, as well as Stephen Vos coming all the way from Colorado. I say that because I'm in Zurich. And uh, I'm at, it's the University of Zurich uh, where I'm a visiting researcher, is, I think is what you meant to say. But I also worked with Museum Rietberg here, as many as you may recall, on the, the Jain sign being Jain exhibition. There's so many wonderful things going on with regard to the Jain tradition and Jain yoga all over the world. And one of the things I want to just briefly mention to you is that we recently added to our master's degree engaged Jain studies program here in collaboration with Claremont uh, University, uh, Claremont School of Theology. We've added a concentration in yoga studies. And so you can take with us courses in that program to learn specifically about Jain yoga, its history, its philosophy, as well as its contemporary practice. And those courses are already rolling out over the course of the next year. If anybody's interested, we do have an MA info session about our program that will be launched on Monday. We can drop the link to that to register for, for uh, registration uh, in the chat. Um, besides that, I really know that this conference is going to add a lot of new thought to this growing field of Jain Yoga. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes out of it. And I do thank Dr. Bohanik once again for his wonderful organization and hard work around putting this together. And thank you everyone for joining us. Jai Janendra. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing those thoughts, uh, Dr. Christopher Miller. Appreciate that very much. And um, and I in turn want to thank all of our organizers uh, who helped me. We have a vast network of volunteers at Arihanta behind the scenes uh, and some of our staff. And then of course, uh, my superiors at Arihanta. Everybody has really done so much to make this happen. So I'm really grateful to um, all of uh, the people who helped make the conference happen. But of course, I'm extremely grateful to all of our uh, wonderful erudite uh, panelists today who have uh, decided to join us and to share their knowledge and their wisdom. So thank you all to the panelists and then our uh, growing list of attendees too, our participants. Thank you all for uh, coming today and showing up to be here for what promises to be a very enlivening uh, conversation. So I just wanted to say uh, a note or two about the um layout of the conference. Uh, the itinerary, of course, is posted on our website. I believe that um, uh, it's on the Arihanta site. You can find it, Yoga Jainism Conference. Um, so we basically have six panels. Uh, the first panel is going to deal with Jain Yoga and the issues of ethics and the lived tradition. Uh, the second panel will be on textual studies in Jain Yoga. Then we will have a uh, discussion on embodied Jain Yoga practices, uh, followed by contemplative practices, comparative yoga traditions, and various different methodological concerns. So this is really actually going to be a pretty uh, broad swath of topics that are covered here. Uh, a lot of what people think of as yoga studies proper and how that all um, is expressed in the Jain tradition and discussed in the Jain tradition. 
Okay, so uh, we're about five minutes ahead of schedule right now, which is always nice to be ahead of schedule. We'll probably end up making up that time somewhere, but I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just get started with our first panel. Um, our first panel is going to be the panel on ethics and live tradition, going from 820 to 920. So we have about an hour here. And our first presentation, I would like to introduce uh, Andrew Bridges. Uh, Andrew Bridges holds the Bhagwan Shantinath Lectureship at the California State University Fullerton, where he teaches in both the Religious Studies Department and the Philosophy Departments. Uh, please welcome Dr. Andrew Bridges. And Andrew, you can go ahead and screen share. Thank you very much, everyone. It is a uh, honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. All right. So, um, Let's go ahead and uh, begin. Once again, thank you very much, everyone, for the uh, invitation. Uh, it's an honor to be presenting uh, to you all today. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'll begin by saying I am uh, not an expert in yoga studies. My field of studies are epistemology and ethics. And my aim here today is to reflect on Jain yoga as it relates to significant philosophical questions that Jainism provides answers to and then to reflect on how Jain yoga positively impacts the field of ethics and epistemology. So Jainism provides particular answers to what we might generally refer to as significant philosophical questions, questions such as uh, what ultimately exists? How can we be assured we have correct knowledge pertaining to the nature of existence? Uh, what is the purpose, goal, or meaning in life? Given the manifold complexity of reality, how do we understand what ethical and unethical behavior is? And finally, how do we cultivate virtue in ourselves and positively interact with society so that moral behavior is more collectively feasible and uh, consistently achievable? Jain scholars um, have provided explanation on various meanings of yoga as well as descriptions of Jain yoga. Some of these descriptions I'll share in a moment, but I, but by beginning with these questions, I want to emphasize a dimension of Jain yoga that helps facilitate profound understanding and appreciation to the answers and idea Jainism provides for these aforementioned philosophical questions, as well as a non-superficial appreciation of the dynamic um, ways the answers to these questions interrelate and cohere. So the first, um, sort of explanation I found was from um, the Historical Dictionary of Jainism by Christy L. Wiley, who writes that uh, in, Jain in Jainism, yoga has several meanings. She then provides two complementary definitions um, or descriptions of yoga, as well as a technical meaning. So first uh, is included meditation, mental concentration, and associated practices as described in Jain yoga texts, such as, like um, by authors like Harry Bhatra. Second is spiritual discipline associated with proper lay and mendicant conduct as described in Hemachandra's Yoga Shastra. Shastra. And third is, as a technical term in Jain karma theory, yoga means movement or vibration of the soul, jiva, and activity of body, speech, and mind. Similarly, addressing the multiple meanings of the term yoga in Jainism in the introduction uh, to the volume Yoga in Jainism, uh, Christopher Key Chapel writes, yoga in Jainism carries multiple levels of meaning. In the early Jaina tradition, the term yoga uh, described the process in which karmas bind themselves to the soul jiva. In the medieval period, yoga came to refer to spiritual practice. In this sense, the word remains in general usage today. Concerning the question of what ultimately exists and the meaning of life in relation to existence, Jainism believes that the world is empirically real, mind-independent, and infinitely complex. The Jain philosophical religious tradition is one of four Dharmic traditions originating in India, the other three traditions being Hindu, Buddhist, and later during the modern period, uh, the Sikh tradition. Generally speaking, one of the dimensions of the human condition that um, the Dharma traditions address concerns the disparity between what the way we desire the world to be and the way the world is. This tradition or these traditions aim to reconcile this problem by correcting one's view, knowledge, and moral conduct to create congruity between one's expectations and one's experience. Elaborating on this point 
in his work, uh, Asian philosophies, John Kohler explains that the criteria for determining the quality of life are in turn derived from the basic impetus for philosophy, the drive to eliminate suffering. The vision that makes possible a life without suffering is properly called true philosophy. Degrees of philosophic truth are determined according to their degrees of alleviation of suffering. Put in a positive way, views are true according to the extent that they improve the quality of life. In the Dharmic tradition, Jain philo philosophy's primary focus is to be liberated from the samsaric cycle of life, death, and rebirth, which continually occurs through the process of reincarnation. And Jainism does not posit a creator deity or any form of what one might refer to as divine intervention or help with the liberation process in that way. Relating to the reality of the world in the liberation process in Jainism, Christopher Key Chapel explains in the fourth chapter of the work uh, Reconciling Yogas, entitled uh, The Centrality on the Real, that uh, Jainism's core philosophical uh, philosophy, as articulated by Umasatnis in the Tadvara Sutra, asserts that the world is real, that the soul is real, and that the pa religious path involves gradual ascent through se sequential stages away from influences of karma and towards final liberation. In one sense, given Jainism's assertion of the reality of the world, reality of the soul, and reality of the liberation process from samsaric existence, the meaning and goal of life is liberation. Jain yoga in this respect can be seen as answers and approaches to the questions of what actions, speech, and what thoughts bear habitual repetition in a mode of existence that does not itself bear habitual repetition in any ultimate sense. This dimension of the meaning of life, however, is not only one, is only one um, for Jainism, because as Chapel uh, explains later in that same paragraph of the aforementioned quote, Jainism posits countless souls involved in the quest to disengage themselves from karma. Jainism does not hold a fundamental distinction between human life and other forms of life, such as animal, insect, or plant, asserting that each of these forms of life possesses a soul, jiva, and therefore each life form seeks to eliminate its suffering, which ultimately is realized in the process of liberation. Jainism, however, emphasizes that it is only the embodied uh, form of the human being that the life form has the chance to be liberated. With this emphasis comes a complementary emphasis that human beings have existed as countless other life forms and will perhaps after death continue their existence as other forms of non-human life as they are continually reincarnated. This aspect of the ultimate nature of reality also has implications for the meaning of life in Jainism. In the chapter entitled Life Force and Jainism um, and Yoga by Chapel, uh, found in the edited volume, the, the Meaning of Life in the World Religions, the emphasis on nonviolence and the interrelated nature of life forms is explained with reference to passages from the um, Acharanga Achar Sutra, such as the following. Uh, to do harm to others is to do harm to oneself. You are the ones uh, whom you intend to kill. You are the ones whom you intend to tyrannize over. We corrupt ourselves as soon as we intend to corrupt others. We kill ourselves as soon as we intend to kill others. In reference to this passage, Chapel explains that it is uh, that it suggests that human beings are not different from one another, uh, nor are they fundamentally different from other living beings. We can observe that the interrelated emphasis both on liberation and on nonviolence, or the vow of ahimsa, expresses a coherent aim that the path of liberation is interwoven with the path of nonviolence of any kind to any form of life. These du dual emphases of the teleology of Jainism provide robust framework uh, for understanding how ethics relates to the meaning of life in Jainism. Furthermore, the thoroughness of Jain, of Jain emphasis on nonviolence to all forms of life in the context of liberation, as well as our contemporary uh, planetary context, provides much insight into the significant philosophical questions, uh, which deal primarily with concerns of ethics, virtue, and the good society. These questions are, as stated before, given the manifold complexity of reality, how do we understand what ethical and unethical behavior is? And how do we cultivate virtue in ourselves and positively interact with society so that moral behavior is collectively more feasible and consistently achievable? 
In our contemporary context, uh, when we consider how moral values, uh, moral theories evaluate action and individuals and how ethical theories um, aim to inform us of what moral consideration should ultimately be, various uh, relevant criteria run to be, now talking sort of globally, criteria such as moral obligations, ethical principles, virtues and vices, qualities of empathy and care, the considerations of intention and efficacy, collaborations and disagreements among perspectives ensue. Others, um, other related philosophical ideas uh, pertain to the meaning of life uh, and purpose, the nature of the human being, and how to incorporate ideas from sacred teachings that speak on matters of morality and ethics are also involved in the discussion as well. Disagreements over the ethics and morality Morality can become so complex and insights so varied, many are led to assume moral subjectivism or even moral relativism actually captures our ethical landscape. It is in this ethical situation that the thoroughness of the Jain concept of life and the principle of ahimsa applied to all forms of life continues to be the vanguard expression for nonviolence in the field of ethics. This can be understood in two but distinct um, two distinct but interrelated ways. The first way is within the Jain philosophical and ethical system in which ahimsa in cooperation with the four vows, uh, four other vows, facilitates spiritual development through reducing the effects of the accumulation of karma, reducing experiences of the intensity of the four passions while fostering the elimination of feelings of attachment and aversion so that equanimity is possible. In his chapter entitled Ethics and Mysticism in Jain uh, Yoga Spirituality, Kamal Chand uh, Sugani, not sure if that's the correct pronunciation of his last name, but Sugani um, elaborates on the vow of Ahimsa, explaining the first Mahavata um, consists of the due observance, even in dreams, of the principle of non injury to all living beings, mobile and immobile, gross uh, and subtle, by avoiding, threefold, the, by avoiding threefold ways of acting commanding and consenting through the triple agency of the mind, body, and speech. In order that this vow may be properly observed, the monk or nun is required to be cautious regarding movement, speech, mental thought, handling of food, uh, things, food, and drink. Within this context, the principle of ahimsa is lived out and the feasibility of the scope of nonviolence to all forms of life is demonstrated with the ultimate aim of liberation. The second distinct but related way is the principle of ahimsa, of the principle of ahimsa, can be understood as a leading expression of nonviolence in the field of ethics is through the consideration of the question, how can we positively interact with society so that moral behavior is collectively more feasible and consistently achievable? Here, the principle of ahimsa might be seen as a way of reducing harm to all life forms in the larger societal and planetary context. The focus here would not necessarily be on how the direct carelessness of a particular action had direct harm, um, harmful effects on another life form, for example, accidentally stepping on another life form like an insect while walking, but rather the focus would be on what actions can be taken to reduce harm to all forms of life, given our growing awareness of the interconnectedness we as all life forms are. Not, not in the reincarnated sense, but in, in the sort of the um, in the present sense, in the immediate sense. And when pondering how the principle of ahimsa might be applied in this vast planetary context in which various ethical theories also provide suggestion for moral obligation and praiseworthy action, we might turn to the one significant remaining question mentioned at the beginning of the paper that which has been addressed yet. This is the question, how can we be assured we have correct knowledge pertaining to the nature of existence? This question I find is slightly different from the merit and acknowledgement of the practical value that would be placed on an explanation of reality and application of its ethical system if it was to drastically reduce suffering and improve life, which Jain principles, it seems, have great potential to do, particularly if such practices became more pervasive and the ideas, for example, in the Jain Declaration of Nature and the Jain Declaration on Climate Change were transformed into larger global policies. Th this question is also somewhat different from the praise and appreciation for Jain yoga that essentially provides an individual with the spiritual knowledge, guidance, and techniques, which allows for greater expressions of nonviolence. With respect to how one can be assured 
their knowledge pertains to the nature of reality is correct. Um, Jainism asserts a few fascinating claims. The first fascinating claim is that an omniscient viewpoint exists. The second claim is that knowledge from the, that omniscient viewpoint has been expressed by Mahavir and aspects of this knowledge have been preserved in Jain Dharma, such that all the significant philosophical questions posed at the beginning of this paper could be given particular answers to. The third fascinating claim is that all non-omniscient viewpoints or points of view are ultimately incomplete. Jainism also uh, describes 14 spiritual stages um, of development in which one is capable of eventually progressing from an incomplete perspective um, to a complete perspective of omniscience. In this context, Jain yoga can be understood as providing a path from a partial perspective in which belief in the knowledge about the nature of reality cannot immediately be experienced in totality to an omniscient form of knowing. Forms of gradual spiritual progress and their experiential fruits or ex experience, new experiences, when approached from fields uh, of cultural, anthrop uh, cultural and uh, phenomenological anthropology, can be put into other interesting frameworks. Uh, frameworks such as um, history becoming nature, following the insights of uh, Pierre Bourdieu's um, and his understanding of habitus. Also, other frameworks uh, such as spiritual kindling, following the insights of T. M. Luhrmann. But the main ontological difference between these approaches uh, to spiritual development and their phenomenological experiences is that Jainism has an ontology of plurality expressed in Anakantavada, whereas cultural and phenomenological anthropology uh, does not necessarily assert any unified metaphysical system. Therefore, uh, given these ontological differences in orientation, um, it remains to be seen if Jain Yoga will attempt to provide any uh, larger coherent context um, to appreciate the various, various spiritual insights and practices, cultural and phenomenal, phenomenological anthropology continue to elaborate on in the context of world religions and world spiritualities. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for your attention. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Andrew Bridges, that was really a fantastic uh, presentation. If you could uh, stop screen share, that would be great. Of course. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you made some really fascinating points there. It's always nice to hear um, reflections from the perspective of philosophy on the Jain tradition. And uh, you brought up some really interesting philosophical uh, points of perspectives and questions there. I think we'll um, have time to uh, answer uh, in the uh, question section. So I just want to mention everybody, there is a question and answer function on the webinar. You're welcome to type any questions that you have. I will record those questions. Um, if you're around at the uh, question and answer time, you can ask them yourself. Uh, but if not, I'll probably end up reading them. Uh, so I'll record those. And then, of course, our, um, our question and answer section will be happening at... Uh, 1110 to 1140 for this uh, for this panel. Okay, so we're going to do our first couple panels and then um, our first three panels, and then we will do our question and answer uh, section following uh, the reflections um, of the first half of the conference. Okay, so just some notes about the um, about the format there. Okay, great. So um, thank you very much, uh, Andrew Bridges. That was really wonderful. Uh, let's turn it over to. Christopher Jane Miller. Um, I already did one uh, introduction for Christopher Jane Miller, but I think it bears repeating. He's an impressive enough fellow that I don't mind uh, talking about him and his accomplishments. Um, so Dr. Christopher Jane Miller, of course, is the co-founder, vice president, and the vice president of academic affairs uh, here at Arihanta Institute. He's a professor of yoga and Jane studies here at Arihanta as well. He completes PhD. PhD at University of California, Davis, and he's also a uh, visiting professor at Claremont School of Theology, where Ari Hanta offers our MA program that we've mentioned multiple times here. And there's also some links in the chat there if you guys uh, can see to some of our uh, programs with Claremont and some of our other Ari Hanta programs. Uh, so Dr. Miller's current research is really focusing on modern yoga and engaged Jainism uh, with an upcoming edited volume with SUNY on that, which I'm co-editing with. Uh, so otherwise, here's uh, Dr. Christopher Jane Miller and welcome, Christopher. So this paper I'm about to present to you is the paper that will appear in our engaged Jainism volume. So any feedback you all have as we get ready to publish that, I would really appreciate uh, to hear from you. The title of my paper is Jane Yoga on the Berlin Wall, 
Narendra Kumar Jain's Seven Stages of Enlightenment, this beautiful mural that you see here in the background. The artistic language is an ineffable language, which many intellectuals do not even understand. Art is the silent language of the heart, in that it communicates only heart to heart, asserted Narendra Kumar Jain in 2021. Jain said this during an interview about his contribution of the mural, The Seven Stages of Enlightenment, to the Berlin Wall's popular East Side Gallery in 1989. Along with this ineffable language, I was immediately captivated by the entangled layers of history, politics, and culture, which his mural so, mural so clearly conveyed, and which I began to disentangle here. Even as Jane emphasizes a universal yogic message and the apophatic nature of his mural, he found himself directly engaged with Cold War politics and the international artistic culture operating on both sides of the Berlin Wall before and after its fall. To consider Jane's artistic creation as merely derivative of this context, however, risks missing how he harnessed it in order to visually communicate to his public audiences in Berlin, his own Indian culture's situated yogic truths concerning what comprises freedom and enlightenment. His creative choices drawing from yogic traditions also indicate a strategy that Jane's and the diaspora use to share their cultural background when the broader communities are not aware of their tradition. I follow a method here of engaged Jain studies from our forthcoming volume, Engaged Jainism, to assess how Jain's ways of knowing brought from India encountered frictions with Euro-American ways of knowing at the Berlin Wall. Engaged Jain studies adopts Anna Singh's notion of engaged universals and frictions to account for the culturally productive outcomes that occur when universal Jain principles engage with new cultural terrain and wherein Jains attempt to in some way promote their culture. Born in Delhi in 1937, Narendra Kumar Jain is a self-professed Indian fortune teller, yogi, painter, and art historian. He learned yoga from his mother when he was two, but also from Gandhi, who he says taught him the lotus position when he was five. Following a lectureship position at the University of Agra that began in 1963, Jane first came to West Berlin in 1967 at the invitation of the German Academic Exchange Service. He arrived amidst an influx of thousands of students and workers from India in the 1960s and 1970s who came to East and West Berlin in the fields of engineering, medicine, and business. He later opened a yoga studio, which you see here, which we find by 2009, according to newspapers, is probably the best in Berlin and where some consider him as, quote, Berlin's best yoga teacher, end quote. By this time, he had evidently introduced around 70,000 people worldwide to the, quote unquote, magic of yoga. As we consider Jane's artistic yogic work at the Berlin Wall, we will pay close attention to here following Mitter, the, quote, artist's agency by analyzing art practices and reception as a cultural document that is historically situated, end quote. I do so here by paying attention to what Kular calls the quote unquote, worldly affiliations and the particular representational freedoms that were available to Jane. Affiliation, according to Kular, who's drawing from Edward Said, quote, denotes a historical process by which a national art world from India came together and became conjoined with an international art world, end quote. Studying Indian modern artists' worldly affiliations requires attention to the social relations and material conditions, which help us see how Indian contemporary art represents, quote, continuity with many projects of the modern. Translation, democracy, secularity, and cosmopolitanism, end quote. And how, quote, problems of visual representation from the colonial period persisted through the post-colonial period, end quote. That's citing Kular once again. This paper that I'm going to read you now shows how Narendra Kumar Jain's affiliative network influenced and enabled him to paint his seven stages of enlightenment on the Berlin Wall. Started in early 1989, the first iteration of the mural was in October 1989, which you see here, before the wall's fall in November. It conveys a yogic message of enlightenment with a meditating yogi seated above a lotus flower with seven chakras. The yogi's arms reach up into the air with the right hand depicting gyan mudra and the left hand an open palm. 
In the 2009 refurbishment, which you see here, Jane makes clear that the yogi's open hand is the hand of Christ with the stigmata representing the West, and the hand in Gyan Mudra represents India and the East. In addition to adding Mahavira's name to the wall, Jane says the mural was intended to connect, quote, Indian mythology and wisdom with Western religions and philosophy, end quote. But also to show how, quote, according to Hindu belief, the practice of yoga makes it possible to progress through the stages of enlightenment, which promise a better existence without suffering, end quote. Jane also says that, quote, seven stages means seven chakras. The seventh is full enlightenment. And I tried to interpret them in my Indian manner, end quote. When Jane was asked during an interview, which level of enlightenment have you reached? He replied, quote, that I cannot say. It is a yogi's secret. Geheimnis. <laughs> this is all, by the way, translated from the original German. Jane's artistic choices to convey the chakra system very broadly reflect the impulses of 20th century internationalist modern artists, such as Rabindranath Tagore, who sought to assimilate Western culture and the arts into his own Indian culture. Hungarian Indian painter Amrita Sher Gill and some who would follow her similarly, similarly sought to, according to Kular, quote, cultivate an art that was organic and vital, connected to the past and to the West, and to generate a national culture synthesizing East and West in the wake of colonialism, end quote. Cher Gill and others, quote, believed the task of great art was to establish between a connection between national and international community, end quote. Following India's independence in 1947, these twin impulses to develop a national identity and yet maintain a commitment to modern artistic internationalism continued to influence the development of Indian artists. Thought-provoking for our purposes here is how this manifests in neo-tantric art and Indian muralism. Combined with Western abstraction, common elements found in the neo-tantric genre included sexual symbols as well as mystical abstraction marked by the use of Indic symbols. Within this genre, Narendra Kumar Jain's work perhaps best reflects that of G.R. Santosh, whose work you see here on the left, according to Brown, quote, represents the wider movement of neo-tantric art, end quote. Santosh's work is diametrically opposed to the fragmented spirit of Ponikar's work, whose words and symbols you see here on the right had sought to undermine the idea of a monolithic Indian tantric culture. Characterizing Santosh's paintings is instead, writes Brown, a quote, philosophical interpretation committed to the purity of metaphysical categories, wherein the objects, symbols, and practices apparently transcend time and present a unified South Asian cultural heritage. Paraphrasing there. Santosh had a, quote, universal yet Indian conceptual visual well from which to drink. And he and the other neo-tantric artists found an idiom that allowed them to tap into the constructed authenticity of Indian spirituality, so popular in Western culture in the late 1960s and early 1970s, end quote. While Indian artists were contending with the simultaneous sentiments to develop respectable art within the secular, reason-driven space of enlightenment, neo-tantric artists still maintained a commitment to the spiritual, the iconic, and the religious, as you see here. During the same period that neo-tantric art emerged, other Indian artists were inspired by early 20th century Mexican muralism, intended to educate the illiterate public concerning the history of Mexico following the Mexican Revolution. Indian artist Satish Gurjal had studied muralism in Mexico with the famous muralists Diego Rivera and David Siqueiros in the 1950s. Following Gurjal, Indian artists, including Subramanian and Mukherjee at Kalabhavan, also began to use murals as a way to engage with a larger public in India. Subramanian's mural project, The Wheel, at Gandhi Darshan, for example, evokes Gandhi's ideal village republics through a wheel, connoting at once the Dharma Chakra and the Charka. Subramanian undertook such projects in the 1960s and 70s in the face of India's accelerated development, aiming toward a synthesis and the conjoining of the opposed forces of tradition and modernity. A crucial transition begins, however, in the 1980s, where Indian art is meant to create a conscious intervention into global and not just 
Indian history. Trained in art and art history in India and Germany, Narendra Kumar Jaini merges at the Berlin Wall at this point to paint his mural. His work represents an internalized neo-tantric approach to enlightenment visually materialized in his seven chakras. Jain's understanding of the yogic subtle body, including the chakra system, reflects common models that were popularized in the crucible of the Indian Bhadralok's encounters with colonial and romantic orientalist influences. Here, elite Indians and Europeans co-constructed an idealized, textually mediated yogic body from pre-existing South Asian practice lineages and Sanskrit yoga scriptures in the early 20th century. The chakra system that emerges in this context has textual origins in the 10th century tantric text titled Kubjika Mata Tantra. This text shows a similar six chakra system as part of its non-dual tantric system that would eventually spread through Europe and India through texts. This happened perhaps most prominently in the 1919 work of Arthur Avalon, which you see pictured here on the right, who democratized the internalized chakra system for the Western and Indian middle classes through his still highly influential English publication of the Shat Chakra Nirupana, 16th century tantric text, a scripture from Kala Shaivism's Southern Transmission. This text also discusses Sahasrara, the seventh chakra, which Jain included in his mural, which you can see here at the very top of the picture on the far right. Before Avalon's work, the chakra system was already becoming known in German-speaking Europe, including in the work of anthroposophist Rudolf Steiner, who mapped the chakras onto the Western astral body in 1909, and later Werner Bohm, who popularized the system in German-speaking regions in his book titled Chakras in 1953. The chakra system found institutional popularity in German yoga organizations, including the German Yoga Society, whose four-year yoga therapist training established in 1982 included, quote, theory and practice of mystical physiology, chakras, etc., end quote. This time period coincides with what Fuchs describes as a, quote unquote, veritable boom in yoga in West Germany. And even the public recognition of yoga in the GDR in East Germany, where yoga courses had become established in almost every large city. Yoga Vidya, a major yoga organization in Germany founded upon the teachings of the famous Swami Shivananda Sarasvati, still uses Avalon's translation of the Shat Chakra Nirupana to teach the chakra system today. Those involved in these yoga teaching pursuits have been selectively gleaning material from medieval tantric and hatha yoga texts that had begun to internalize, as James Mallinson has shown, these external sexual kala tantric practices within the yogic subtle body in medieval India, thereby following what uh, Birchett describes as a pre-colonial bhakti sensibility from North Indian forms of yoga practice that were highly compatible with later European and Victorian sensibilities. I have in my own new book, Embodying Transnational Yoga, described the contemporary transnational dissemination of these internalized yoga systems as engaged alchemies to convey the processes through which yoga teachers have brought yogic subtle body logics into contemporary social environments globally. Jane's mural clearly reproduces the history I have outlined here. That's why I've gone so much into it. He's capitalizing upon the popularity of what has become a well-known transnational yoga system, commonly conveying a spiritual journey through seven chakras on the path toward enlightenment. At the Berlin Wall, Jane encountered a fitting social and historical moment that was well prepared to receive his work. Scholars considering the Berlin Wall more broadly have described its location as a site of creative speculation and a place of engagement for engaged forms of cultural diplomacy that eventually gave rise to countercultural communities and expressive spaces beyond governmental oversight, where artists from both sides of the wall were constantly engaged with one another. And following the wall's fall on November 9th, 1989, the subcultures of East and West collided in the ruins of Eastern Berlin, where, as Hokanos observes, the quote, boundless untended spaces invited improvisation, end quote including at the East Side Gallery, where Jane would paint. Narendra Kumar Jane's mural stands here along the Spree River amidst the 105 murals from an international group of artists sharing particular messages of freedom. Part of what makes Jane's contribution to the gallery so important is that he began to paint his mural in East Germany, 
the border of which was the Spree River in March of 1989, which of course is well before the Berlin Wall fell in November 1989. Crossing the Oberbaum Bridge, each time to paint the mural on the wall just on the other side of the Spree, Jane was entering potentially dangerous territory. He nevertheless began his mural in the spring of 1989 with the encouragement of his German colleague, David Monty, who you see pictured here, since Jane had an Indian visa, which allowed him to enter East Berlin. These enabling factors are significant as they demonstrate the complex international political landscape in which Jane was working and how Jane's work was particularly enabled through his affiliative network, following Kular once again, that had depended on him as an Indian artist to help accomplish the gallery's goals. Nobody else could go across to the other side to paint. Jane was a perfect candidate to help get the project moving before the wall fell since India, of course, belonged to the non-alignment movement through which many formerly colonized nations refused to side with either the US or the Soviet Union. This political situation made it much easier for Indians such as Jane to acquire a visa to study and work in East and West Berlin without the kind of fear or prohibitions that members of other Western nations often had. Aware of Jane's very special status as an Indian citizen, West Berliner David Monty invited Jane to join the open air mural gallery project that he was organizing with his colleague uh, from East Berlin, Heike Stefan. Monty had personal connections to the border guards and encouraged them to allow Jane to cross to East Berlin to paint his mural with his visa. So all of Jane's worldly affiliations that we see here outlined in this paper clearly enabled him to paint his mural. As art historian Kular shows, Said's notion of worldly affiliations, or just affiliations as he would call them, encourage us to focus on the social relations and material conditions that show how Indian modern art is constituted by the world, as you see here quoted. However, Kular also encourages us to pay attention to Spivak's notion of re-worlding, which you see here quoted, which just the opposite quote shows how the world is produced by and through the imagination, end quote. And thus how Indian modern art simultaneously constitutes the world and how the image can actually become a world. Consider then how Jane's mural is wedged between two murals depicting seemingly universal Western messages of freedom, liberation, and enlightenment. To the right, we find Italian artist Fulvio Pina's hymn to joy, the express intention of which is to quote, remind everyone that all people are born free, but many have to live in bondage, end quote. To the left of Jane's mural is a space that reserved for a message from the United States. Here we find Bierbrauer's caricature of the Statue of Liberty, where in Libertas, the Roman goddess of liberty, conveys, according to the United States, a quote, symbol of enlightenment, which lights the way to freedom, showing us the path to liberty, liberty enlightening the world, end quote. These murals that are flanking Jane's at the East Side Gallery celebrate ideas of freedom that are born from the European and American Enlightenments, which had also produced the seemingly universal but now fractured pursuits of Western modernity. Jane's mural, situated as it is here, entangles his own universal yogic notions into the mix. Rather than beginning from Pina's notion that people are born free on the right here, Jane's mural instead expresses the notion drawn from a number of Indic traditions, which assumes that people are instead perpetually reborn into suffering and bondage. And rather than conveying Libertas's liberty enlightening the world, freedom from suffering only comes in Jane's model after a progressive journey through seven chakras, where we then find yoga enlightening the world. Judging from Jane, uh, Jane's inclusion here of Christ's hand on one side of the mural representing the West and the yogi's hand on the other representing India and the East, the yogi in Jane's seven stages of enlightenment that you see here achieves a form of universal yogic enlightenment that now unites the colonially, colonially constructed binary between East and West. But also consider how East and West take one further and perhaps more specific meaning in Jane's work here at the Berlin Wall. As the two seemingly opposed worlds of East and West Germany remained divided by a slab of concrete surrounded by danger, Jane brought yoga's popular unifying message to the second position 
in the East Side Gallery in 1989, even before other artists were able to begin their work. Jane thereby depicted yoga's universal path to enlightenment and unification through the structures and the representational freedoms that were mediated to him there, and that were definitely constituted by Germany and India's past and present. However, the fortune teller yogi's mural was also potentially prophetic insofar as it seemed to be constituting and reworlding a message of future German unity months in advance of the wall's fall. As well as you can see in this picture, yogis and yoginis apparently never ending pursuit of the seven stages of enlightenment, a tradition his current yoga students pictured here continue in Berlin today. Being born into the Jain tradition, and yet in a European country unfamiliar with it, Jain capitalized on the popularity of an internalized tantric hatha yoga to express his cultural identity rather than using the Jain tradition itself. Following anthropologist Anna Singh, Jain's yogic universal became an engaged universal at the Berlin Wall, where it continues to express his Indian culture's promise of freedom and enlightenment to the visiting public. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> that was really rich presentation. Uh, Dr. Miller, thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. So many important themes there. And what a, a visually stunning presentation as well. It was really nice to uh, walk through the beautiful artwork for what is an early morning for me or earlier in the day here. It's nice to see that first thing in the morning. It's so stimulating. So thank you for a beautiful uh, presentation. I'm sure there will be questions and comments about that. Um, please uh, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A uh, section, and we'll address those at the end of the first half of the conference during the Q&A section. Um, okay, so for our next panelist, uh, somebody who I'm a huge fan of, uh, Dr. Vina Howard. Uh, she is a professor of Asian religious traditions in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Fresno, where she holds the endowed chair in Jain and Hindu Dharma. She also serves as the director of the newly endowed MK John Gandhi Center in her piece in uh, Sarvodaya, and she has a number of amazing publications in those fields. Uh, some of her publications are amongst my favorite, uh, particularly her work on Gandhi's ascetic activism is excellent. I highly recommend it. And today she's uh, pres presenting on another fantastic topic of great passion of mine, that is the uh, teachings of Srimad Rajchandra. So everybody, please uh, welcome Dr. Veena. Howard. Hi, good morning, Jajanendra. It's so wonderful to be in the company of people like Kojan and Chris Miller and all these great friends and fans, and I'm a fan of all of you as well. The morning presentations have been just exquisite. And I mean, Chris Miller, I mean, you did such an amazing job there. So congratulations. Uh, let me share my screen. Hope you can see it. So I just want to preface my presentations, uh, like Kojan is early in the morning, earlier than, you know, East Coast people or the Europe people. Um, so I became interested in Srimad Rajchandra through Gandhi. Um, and then, of course, when I became closer and closer to Jain traditions and Jain philosophies, I um, wanted to do more research on his work, his impact, and, and also, um, studying him in his own right. You know, of course, Gandhi's relationship, I will never go away from my mind, but also seeing him a person and a historical individual, amazing individual who shows a different path, not really um, a complete renunciation, but he navigates both oh. renunciation and action. So uh, the recent studies, um, for example, Chris Chappell, um, Bohanic, you know, Kojan himself, explored the Jain practice of prayer, meditation, yoga, and ritual through various texts and traditions. Great book. I highly recommend both of those books to all of you. Uh, with regard to the topic of yoga, most scholars primarily focus on the contemplative practices encompassing discipline and meditation. These writings present an image of a practitioner of yoga and meditation as a world renouncer. You know, you give up desires and just completely um, detach yourself from the world. So what I find the life of Sri Madhra Chandra, um, let me put in the presenter mode, presents a unique model of 
a household householder renunciate, what I call it, Srimad Rajchandra conducted a lucrative business and lived a family life up to the end of his life. Navigating both pravarti, renunciation, and no, pravarti, worldly engagement, and devrati, renunciation. So in this short presentation, I will explore uh, select biographical writings on Srimad Chandra and Gandhi's own words that draw attention to the binary strands of his contemplative predilections and his life of a householder. More significantly, and this project is ongoing, I just have started, uh, so I'll be looking at more biographies as well. I will show how these biographies generally elevate his detachment from worldly affairs because of the Jain ideology of renunciation, notwithstanding Srimad Rajchandra's dexterously performing business and living a family life both at the same time. So I argue that Srimad Rajchandra presents a modern example of a karma yogi, one who performs detached action as defined in the Bhagavad Gita and also Samatva Yoga. Now I've been studying that as well recently. I will show that um, by synthesizing worldly action with spiritual pursuits that inspired Gandhi himself, that how Srimad Chandra serves as an example for all of us, for especially the lay followers, although bound by worldly actions, seek a viable path for liberation. So that's my summary of the uh, presentation. So who is Srimad Chandra? He is a child um, prodigy. He um, is a person of extraordinary powers, um, a poet, a philosopher, a renunciate, a spiritually accomplished being. And what else is Srimad Chandra? He's a householder. Now we're juxtaposing with the other side of Srimad Chandra's actions and personality. He's a father, he's a son, he's a businessman, a mentor. So on the right side, we see more as a pravarti, and on the left, we see some of them, nivrati. So um, a yogi in South Asian traditions, as most of us know, that a yogi of ima yogi's image is renunciation, a meditation, contemplation. John Cord draws on James Melanson's um, writings, who defines the term yogi in the South Asian traditions as someone, I quote, who has in some ways renounced the world and thereby engages in conduct that runs counter to the norms of the householder. So I just want to frame my uh, conversation, my presentation through this quote. And it's not just um, James Melanson. This is a very ancient divide in Indian philosophy uh, between pravarti and nivrati. As we see Louis Dumont, he says, at the outset, we can assume that there are two kinds of men in Hindu India, those who live in the world and those who have renounced it. And he really, you know, Hindu world, Indian world, pan-dharmic traditions, there were the bifurcation of the two um, systems. In the Mahabharata, Bhishma, great patriarch, louds the path of nivratti by actually living creature is destroyed. Yogins who see the other side of the ocean of life, life never performs acts. I mean, it's kind of ironic, right? I mean, he's the, you know, Mahabharata, he's a, also a man of action. He's Brahmachari, but he's a warrior. But toward the end of his life, he's giving this lesson to Pandavas and whoever wants to listen to his last lesson teachings, and he says that we should not perform action. So that is kind of frame that we see the yogi has to renounce in order to seek liberation. 
So pan-dharmic traditions, elevating the Vrati for liberation, uh, is from Patrick Oliver. He says, the household life is a dusty path full of hindrances. While the ascetic life is like the open sky, it is not easy for a man who lives at home to practice the holy life, Brahmacharya, in all its fullness, in all its purity, in all its bright perfection. Because the householder life is a mud, it is, we are very difficult for us to really experience that, that kind of bliss when we're living in the household life. So it's quite interesting that we um, bright perfection we can only achieve when we are in the renunciation, a stage of life. And then uh, Jacobi uh, notes in um, Sutta Kritanga Sutra, men, Sutta Kritanga, uh, he says, men who do not see light as it were domestic life are the beloved of the people. Those heroes free from bondage do not desire life. So it is that one has to renounce in order to really feel the bliss of liberation. But in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, we see, and Srimad Rachandra read the Bhagavad Gita and quoted the Bhagavad Gita, and he was, you know, both. He was, um, his mother was a Hindu and uh, Ashtama and the father was a Jain. So the Bhagavad Gita says, therefore, giving up attachment, perform actions as a matter of duty, because by working th without being attached to the fruits, one attains the Supreme. So there is a another layer of yoga that one can attain liberation without denouncing this world. By performing their prescribed duties, King Janak and other attain perfection. You should also perform your duties to set an example for the good of the world. So action can be done in a way that is liberating. It doesn't bind us. And the two ingredients are very important in such kind of actions, viragya and dharma, detachment and a sense of doing everything as a sense of duty. Whatever actions great persons perform, common people follow. Whatever standards they set, all, all the world pursues. That um, verse is very important. Um, to understand Gandhi and, and Srimad Rachandra both because Gandhi sees Srimad Rachandra doing that what he eventually does in his life which is um, performing actions without being attached to them. So my question is was Srimad Rachandra a karma yogi? Um, I looked up uh, through research, hardly maybe one or two places. Um, they have, you know, he's noted as a karma yogi, but a lot more attention is paid to his renunciation and he didn't want to really be in the world, but he had to be. So that kind of narrative that emerges. <clears throat> so the two main ingredients, Vairagya, without passion, without attachment, um, to be disinterested toward the objects of sensual and physical pleasures is detachment according to the Tvartha Sutra. And dharma is to duty and virtue. And it is the um, talks about righteousness, forbearance, modesty, straightforwardness, purity, truthfulness, restraint, austerity, renunciation, the 10 dharmas in the Tvartha Sutra. So the dharma is not simply doing your duty but doing your duty with all this framework of virtue, of uprightness, doing the, the right way, ethics, morality, then one is able to do dharma. Sometimes we just see, you just do your worldly duty. But I think it's very important to see those components of dharma when we are doing the duty. Renunciation does not mean here completely renouncing the world, renouncing the desires of the fruits of actions. So, um, Srimad Chandra was a householder, and the stories, the biographies that um, discuss uh, his worldly life, they always say he was not eager to get married in 
the, in the least, despite harboring a deep innate desire for renunciation, the twist of fate created by his preordained karmas carried him to the marriage altar. So it's um, like, of course, the karma always plays an important role in what we do, where we are. But I think where is the choice? Did he have the choice to not go to the marriage altar? Or was all karma? So it really is because we cannot see what is laid out for us. So, but the, here, the always the emphasis is made on that he didn't want to do it, but he did it because of his past karma. So that's very important to note. And then, then it says, harboring an intense desire for complete renunciation, Shrimadji's inward journey was soaring high. However, his parents did not grant him the permission to severe all worldly ties and drop the ascetic life. In a twist of fate, he tied the new pital, um, not with Jagat Bai in 19, 1888 in Marobi. So accepting the outcome of the past karma, he ventured into the jewelry business in Mumbai. A fine confluence of wisdom and morality, he left a lasting impression on anyone who met him. He spent nearly a decade as a householder. Nonetheless, dharma reflected in his every activities. Her found no other solace than the self. So if he's, if we see it that he did get married, he had children, right? I mean, he has kids, he has a fine, very lucrative business. He's very successful at it. But then the emphasis that his, um, his really is detached. And Gandhi um, quotes one of his poems in his um, writings, and that's on Varagya. He said, when, I shall, when shall I know that state supreme? When will the knots outer and inner snap? When shall I break the bonds of, that bind us fast? Tread the path trodden by the wise and the great. Withdrawing the mind from all interests, using the body solely for self-control, he desires nothing to serve any ulterior end of his own, seeing nothing in the body to bring on a trace of the darkness of ignorance. So this is a poem that Gandhi quotes of Srimadra Chandra in his writings on Varagya. So that is the how we live in the world is through Varagya and Dharma, as I mentioned earlier. So my emphasis also that he cared for a householder. He didn't want everyone to be, of course, our goal is liberation, renunciation is eventually our goal, but he was concerned about how we live life like a householder. So he gave his 12 best householder, less than 12 advice to householders in Smokshmala. And I recently got his whole collected works, um, in Hindi, so I'm going through it. Um, even while dwelling in his worldly householder life, the, the best Shavaka was Contacted best teachers hears their teaching carefully, is discriminative and modest, is successfully undergoing spiritual discipline, his order of a householder becomes praiseworthy. So worldly lives, the best Shravaka. So he is living like a Shravaka, even though he's living in this world. Such best householders perform Samika, I think I saw in the comment for someone, take a vow of equanimity, equanimous behavior, shamapanna to beg pardon before Sri Bhagavan Mahavir for any of his faults or falls, and kohvihar um, pratyakhyam, a vow not to take four types of food at night, to practice prostraint and follow injunctions of good behavior for the whole of his life and niyam, observe some vows for this specific period of time. So he goes very details about how a good householder uh, live and women should be treated like a good mother, their mother or sister. And then I'm not going to read everything. I'm just going to show you uh, that how much he is um, concerned about a householder's life and how he, you know, page after page, he's telling a householder how to live a good life that one can make progress. Uh, so again, he gives due respect to his parents, his wife, his sons, Munis, 
and pre preceptors. So that's what Srimad Rajendra is doing. He is caring for his mother, he's caring for the family, he's caring for, and he is living a very good life. Good life here is the life of spirituality. And then he is a very good father and he's a very good son. We don't know much about his um, children and I would like to know maybe it's available information. Um, and then he writes in the in his best householder that he gives religious discourses to his parents, keeps the house clean, uh, behaves intellectually and teaches his wife and children lessons of modesty and humility. I mean, there is a lot of information which I had not seen before until just a few weeks ago, thanks to Kojan for giving me this opportunity to study more. He welcomes the guest. So how do you become a good householder? By doing your duties completely with filled with spirituality, filled with those 10 um, elements of dharma. And then again, how do you live, you know, never send a beggar, a beggar. Uh, always give alms, um, keeps his capacity um, keeps his capacity, library of good religious works. I love that. Have a good library of works that you can study and think about. Um, and then he has a, another interesting idea about, um, he gives daily rules of behavior and respectfully behave with your parents and start your worldly actions very carefully so as to be free from hurting any living being and not forgetting soul's benefit. So do both at the same time, not simply one or the other. So again, give your meals to others, your the saints and the family, um, whoever guest comes to your, and discipline in life. Have a fixed time for meals and movements as well as for study of religious scriptures and reflecting on philosophical work. So it's very much into intellectual pursuit as well as spiritual pursuit and living a um, fulfilled. And I love that and sleep at time at, um, at the fixed time. I think Kojan will love that. He's very diligent about it. So I'm trying to. <laughs> uh, so he said, okay, go, you know, what to do. So it's just so fascinating for me how many, I learned so much personally, since we're talking about engaged Jainism from this individual. And in Gandhi's writings, this doesn't show up what I had to study. And especially in Hindi works, I have not looked at in Gujarati, but um, I met with um, Rakesh Bhaiji, um, in a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him, I said, do you think he's a karma yogi? Um, he said, yeah, you can say that. You know, so it was interesting to get the validation. So just quickly on Gandhi and Srimad um, So he says, what he was doing at the moment, whether eating or resting or lying in bed, he was invariably disinterested toward things of the world. I never saw him being tempted by objects of pleasure or luxury in the world. So again, he's practicing. He's a more model. He's a role model, a living role model for people. I watched his daily life respectfully and at close quarters. He accepted whatever he was served at meals. His dress was simple, a dhoti and shirt and angarka and a turban of mixed silk and cotton yarn. And I just began to imagine Srimad Rachand right there so vivid description. I do not remember that these garments used to be strikingly clean or carefully ironed. It was the same to him, whether he squatted on the ground or had a chair to sit on. In the shop, he generally squatted on the gadin. So he is a, in my um, opinion, uh, he's a uh, exemplary householder. It is generally believed that the spheres of practical affairs or business and spiritual pursuit of dharma are distinct form of incompatible with each other, pravarti and nivrati. That is madness to introduce dharma into business and we should succeed in neither if we made any such attempt. Well, if this belief is not false, there is no hope for us at all. There is not a single concern or sphere of practical affairs from where dharma can be kept out. 
Shri Madhrachand Bhai showed though his life, through his life that if a man is devoted to dharma, this devotion should be evident in every action of life. And that is my thesis statement. So it's, it's really is the karma yogi um, you see. Uh, Kochan, how much time do I have? A couple of minutes? Uh, time is about up. You're about one okay. minute. That's okay if you want to wrap it up. Take just a minute. So, so he um, disapproved the idea that I'm just going to um, skip that. So I've been reading a little bit on Samatva Yoga, the fundamental yoga of Jainism. So this is from um, Sagarmal Jain, um, who wonderful essay. Uh, called The Historical Development of Jain Yoga and Impacts of Other Yoga Systems on Jain Yoga. And he talks about Samika or Samatva Yoga as a principal concept underlying Jainism. It is the first and foremost of the six essential duties of both monks and householders. In order to explicate the nuance, meaning, and use of this word, we must first explore how it's translated and defined in various sources. The Prakrit term Samiya can be translated into English as a variety of ways, such as observance of equanimity, viewing all beings as oneself, conception of equality, harmonious state of one's behavior, integration of personality, as well as righteousness in the activities of mind, body, and speech. And that is Samiya Yoga. I'm asking whether it is Karma Yoga when it's practiced as a householder in the householder stage of life. So, Srimad Rajchandra had a choice to leave house anytime. That's my um, argument. But he remained household until the last moment, even though he increasingly became attached from worldly affairs and meditated. He, um, the last word of his was to his brother, please take care of the mother, our mother. He wanted to be a good son, fulfilled his duty of a father, husband, son, friend, and, and a guide, guided to become a good householder. Lots of letters he wrote to people, giving wisdom to people, giving guidance, giving knowledge. Did not take Salekhna vow despite his grave illness. He went through the whole idea and, and he gave in meditation, sitting up, very gracefully left his body. Exemplary to householders, how to remain in this world a karma yogi. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And we'll talk soon. Thank you. Yeah, wow. What a powerful presentation, Dr. Howard. Of course, I'm always so inspired to hear you talk, um, especially about this topic in particular. It's such a wonderful uh, subject. I too got interested in Srimad probably two decades or longer ago, uh, based on Gandhi's writings. And so it's so nice to see increase in scholarship in that direction. So thank you very much for sharing. Okay, so now we will be entering our uh, second panel. Uh, the previous panel, in case you're aware, was on the ethics and the lived tradition of Jain Yoga. Um, and now our next panel will be on the textual studies of Jain Yoga. And we're going to start off with Corinna Lahore. Okay, so Corinna Lahore, uh, she's got a master's degree and she's currently a PhD student of classical Indology and a contract lecturer for beginner Sanskrit and Origins of yoga, yoga at the University of Hamburg. She holds a bachelor's degree in languages and cultures of India and Tibet with a focus on classical Indology from the University of Hamburg. And she has an MA in the traditions of yoga and meditation from SOAS, the University of London. She also has an MA in Oriental languages and cultures uh, with a focus on Jainism from Gay University in Belgium. Her research primarily focuses on yoga and Jainism. She's actually a specialist in this topic, and of particular interest is her current work where she's preparing a critical uh, edition of the Yoga Pradipa, which is going to be excellent. I'm really, really eager to see her work unfolding in that there, in that, um, in that work. Okay, so please welcome Krina Lahore. Lahore, you're, uh, Krina, you can take the screen if you like. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Kojan, for the kind introduction and hello and good evening from Hamburg, Germany. It's a great pleasure to be here and follow up on all those wonderful presentations and be among such a wonderful range of uh, uh, Jane Study scholars. Uh, thank you for inviting me and um, having me here. So let me share my screen and hopefully it will work out as we practiced. 
Um, okay. So before we begin, I would like um, to make some remarks on how we can look at a text and what we need to keep in mind when dealing with the text. Uh, what is a text? <laughs> Uh, what is a text in the true sense of the meaning? Actually, we can look at a te text in three different ways. A text has three levels. The first level is the more idea of a text. For example, if I say it's all in Tattvata Sutra, you will not have a special book in mind, but you will know the idea of Tattvata Sutra. Like, for example, if a, a Christian uh, who hears it's in the Bible, he will not think about the book on his shelf, but he will think about the idea of the Bible. So many of the Jain scholars, when uh, uh, studying Tadvata Sutta, have probably used uh, the edition prepared by Tatya. So that would be the second level of a text, uh, an edition, a special edition, a special, um, yeah, a special, uh, let me see, maybe a, a range, but uh, edition would be a good word to put it. So that's the second level of a text. The third level of a text is the actual book or manuscript. And this is my third level, Tatya, that which is Tadvata Sutra copy. So basically, my presentation today is not on second millennium Jain Yoga texts, but on second millennium Jain Yoga manuscripts of one text, the Yoga Pradipa. Um, before I begin, I would like to quickly thank, uh, give thanks to uh, four wonderful organizations that I met during my stay in January and February when I was in India the Sri Hema Chandra Jnan Mandir in Patan, Sri Mahavira Jain Aradhana Kendra in Kuba, the LD Institute of Indology in Ahmedabad, and the Bori Institute in Pune, who have graciously opened their libraries for me, showed me their manuscripts and their treasures. And uh, I do not take that for granted. I'm very, very grateful that I had this opportunity to work with you guys. If somebody is here, <laughs> okay, I hope I'm not doing too many mistakes now. You showed me so many things, you taught me so much, and I hope I can... Yeah, I can show some of the uh, results that uh, resulted from this wonderful trip. Corinna, um, sorry to interrupt you. Um, your slides aren't advancing. Did you want to put it into slideshow mode? Is it not? It's just showing the the title slide intersecting. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's early enough. Okay, so that's the you you missed the thank you, right? These are the the uh, wonderful organizations that I uh, had the, um, had the uh, honor to stay with and work with. Okay, so what to expect today? So today I would like to focus on actually two uh, um, uh, peculiarities or characteristics in um, manuscripts. The one is uh, a multi-language uh, tool, so to say, called Tabo or Bhalava Boda. And the other one is uh, the characteristic of a multi-text manuscript in MTM. And I will use uh, the manuscripts that I uh, researched uh, uh, of, the man uh, of the Yoga Pradipa to give you some examples of those, uh, of those uh, characteristics. But before we do this, uh, let's quickly go through some ideas of Jain literacy and linguistic identity in Gujarat, where most of the manuscripts uh, um, were found. And I'm quoting here from John Court and also from Paul Dundas. Um, the text, uh, the the articles I used are in my bi um, uh, bibliography. Uh, John Court has said that to understand the Jains adequately, one must read what they read, and uh, this is something I found very very true because we all know and are aware of the high literacy levels within the Jain community, and this is not only at present but it has been like this also, also historically. And uh, Court also highlights that uh, the Jain tradition is an, um, has an 
interactive process between texts and practices through time. And he proposes that if we study Jainism, we should analyze the ideology through the texts and the practices through ob ob observation and the beliefs through documents and observable activities. And what I want to invite you today is take, um, I, I'm not going to feed you with any content of the Yoga Pradipa, but I would like you to imagine um, the work with the actual manuscripts. Like we work with our books today, how have people, Jains, actually treated the manuscripts? What was the reason for them to study them? How did they study them? And what were the outcomes and results? And I, I know most of us have been growing up with books. And uh, you all know there is books that we buy to put them on our shelves because they look nice, they have those nice pictures and they have cost a fortune, but you never read them. They are just there to, you know, to be beautiful. And there's other books you use to study. And if you have a look at my, you know, my Sanskrit grammar book, it's like really old. You see that it has been in use. I have marked the most important things. I have put little little stickers in there. So there's different ways that uh, that uh, books look, and you will see there's different ways that manuscripts look also. Okay, before we advance, uh, just uh, to make you aware of language as a cultural tool, we all know that the early use of Prakrit languages uh, was a way for uh, uh, establishing a Jain scriptural identity, a, a distinct identity uh, back in the uh, first century before the common era. Then we had a transition from Prakrit to Sanskrit to write the, mo the most important works in Sanskrit, and afterwards the rise of vernacular languages um, that were used, being used to uh, to write uh, important texts like uh, Old Gujarati in response to cultural and also linguistic needs for people to understand. And especially in the first century of the second millennium CE, we see a vernacularization uh, movement in Jain communities, and particularly, uh, particularly the shift to old Gujarati. And um, yeah. This is um, a good example for the dual aspects of regional literary language development and the rise of new literary vehicles among Jain authors and readers. And um, this uh, um, um, culminated into uh, an extensive literary work in Gujarati, especially poetry, by the 18th century, uh, which uh, demonstrates the strategic use of vernacular languages in order to reach a broader audience, to make uh, literature, art, but also knowledge uh, perceivable uh, to broader audiences. And in the same way, we see that the Yoga Pradipa, uh, it uses Sanskrit to engage with uh, broader philosophical and religious traditions, but it also um, shows, as we will see, an incorporation of old Gujarati translations in some manuscripts to make the Sanskrit of the Yoga Pradipa accessible to a wider audience. So let us start with the first uh, characteristic, uh, the so-called Bhalava Bodha. Bhalava Bodha is an expanded translation of an important doctrinal on and or narrative text from Sanskrit and Prakrit into old Gujarati. And it is designed to make a complex religious text or complex text in themselves accessible to lay people with minimal education or new monks or munis or young learners. So it's basically something that gives you a little bit more than a, uh, than, than a, uh, than an, um, a, a simple translation. Um, it is an adaptation that retells the story, that retells the verses, the shlokas, to enhance the comprehension and the relevance of the teachings. And it is aimed at illuminating a deeper religious meaning in a language understandable to the audience and, and thus enhancing their spiritual and doctrinal understanding. 
So when we come to the second section, Bhalava Bora and Tabo, we will see that the borders between those uh, those two genres, uh, they are not really close, but there is, uh, um, yeah, there, there's overlapping in some of uh, in, in some of their features. But I will show you some examples of my manuscripts that will hopefully help you to understand um, to understand or see what I mean by this. Here, for example. You see a Bhalava Boda um, manuscript, first page of the uh, Yoga Pradipa. This one um, is from about the 16th century of the Common Era. And for those of you who read it, you will see that you have uh, two sections seen by, uh, they are divided by those words in red. You have the shloka. And then you have the Arta following the Arta part is the uh, translation into old Gujarati. So each shloka is being followed uh, by an uh, ex, yeah, uh, by a translation and uh, with a little bit of explanation. So in this way, <laughs> the Balava Bodas uh, have a literary and educational significance because they serve as a bridge between traditional Jain literature and the contemporary followers of that time because they made it easier to learn the text and to engage with the religious teachings. So those Balava Bodas are being considered a form of an independent prose, can be narrative, but can be also doctrinal. And in this way, they really enrich the uh, Jain literary tradition. Let's see what the Tabos have in store for us and uh, um, have an example of for, for a Tabo. So the Tabos come up a little bit later and they become their own genre from the 16th century onward. They do have some predecessors, they uh, called Sanskrit stabaka, and then they turn into taba, uh, tabos uh, a little bit later. They, a tabo refers to a bilingual commentary that uh, consists of uh, uh, basically a word-by-word -word translation of the original text in Sanskrit or Prakrit into a vernacular language like Gujarati or Gujarati, or even Hindi in later times. And the Tabo um, has the, um, uh, uh, the function to both aid in understanding the original scriptures, but also to serve as a linguistic educational tool. So they are basically, uh, they are language classes, language courses. And you will see that the original text is typically written in a larger script, while the, uh, the translation, Gujarati or Hindi or, or uh, Old Gujarati, is laid out in smaller sections, and the use are often divided. Have a look at this one. Unfortunately, an undated manuscript, but you can see that uh, the, uh, the original shlokas are uh, printed or written in a bigger, in a bigger style, while you uh, can also see the translation. Uh, underneath in uh, in smaller letters. Okay, so what's the impact of the tabo? They were crucial for the monastic community, especially for those who do not have a primary education, Sanskrit or print, uh, Prakrit, and they play also a significant a significant role in the preservation and dissemination of the Jain doctrines, ensuring accessibility and continuity of the scriptural knowledge. So, and as you have seen, I, I, I guess you, you are of my opinion that they are really, really close to each other in definition. But if you see them both next to each other, here we have another Bhalava Buddha from, uh, from the 16th century uh, to the, uh, on the left. And a wonderful um, uh, manuscript um, here in the codex uh, format uh, with a tabu. Also, so originating, uh, no, uh, originating in the 17th century. Aren't they beautiful? <laughs> um, yeah, and I really like this idea that the Yoga Pradipa not only conveys uh, uh, doctrinal aspects and contents, but also serves as a, as a means of teaching, a teaching in the true sense of the meaning.
Okay, part two, the second characteristic I would like to elaborate on today is a so-called multi-text manuscript called MTM. And all of the following definitions are coming from Nalini Balbia, who has worked extensively on uh, those subjects. And I can really heartily recommend her two uh, articles uh, on Jane manuscripts, be they are eye-opening for people <laughs> uh, wanting to deal with the subject. So what is the definition of an MTM and what's the historical context? An MTM contains more than one text within a single codicological unit. So and this integration implies a deliberate design to combine texts that share thematic, doctrinal, or pedagogical linkages. So and um, MTMs are particularly notable in Jain manuscript culture because they offer insights into the Jain's adaptive textual practices and the educational strategies. Why was one text being grouped with another? Why do we have, what kind of collection of texts were made for what purpose? And uh, yeah, what was the bound that held them all together? This is something uh, I was really interested in and I was very curious to learn. So we imagine those MTMs, sometimes they were ordered. Somebody would pay a scribe to, to write books for them. What kinds of books would they choose for themselves um, to be in one um, MTM manuscript and why? So we already heard that uh, we have the educational tool as a reason. The MTM serves as such a tool, facilitating the learning process by providing commentaries and translations alongside root text, which helps in understanding complex doctrines and languages. And in this way, uh, the Balava Buddha and the Tabus also can be regarded as MTMs in the true sense of the meaning. Secondly, preservation and accessibility is, is an unimportant fact because combining texts enhances the preservation of lesser known works by binding them with more popular or critical texts. And it, of course, enhances the accessibility, allowing the broader audience to engage with various, with various texts simultaneously. And all of this is, of course, very significant in a religious and doctrinal way, because those texts and MTMs are often grouped based on doctrinal themes or religious practices, and therefore reflecting the Jain community's theological priorities and pedagogical approaches. Okay, here is an uh, undated manuscript from Patan. And um, unfortunately, you cannot see where one manuscript uh, goes, uh, ends, and another one begins because it actually really begins at the, the in the very first line. <laughs> but it's still very beautiful, and you can see on the very bottom of the page how uh, the Sri Hemachandra Jnan Mandir has. Um, um, edit the manuscripts that are being contained in this um, uh, in this MTM. We will have a look at this one later. So a little bit uh, follow up on that, learning from multi-text manuscripts, we uh, gain insights into the Jain doctrines because those MTMs provide a unique window into the doctrinal interconnections within Jainism because they show us how those various texts interact to elaborate on complex philosophical concepts. So we see cultural and linguistic adaptations with the aim to reach uh, diverse audiences uh, by utilizing multiple languages. And we also see an evolution of Jain literary practices because those MTMs reflect changes in Jain literary culture and manuscript production influenced by technological, religious, and social developments also. Now have a look at the uh, Yoga Pradipa manuscripts that I found. 
As an overview, I uh, found a collection of, it is only 25 manuscripts. I know I, so I said it was 26, but I had, to, <laughs> I found a double, uh, one, one that was double actually. So it's only 25 manuscripts that I was, was able to locate this time. And the collection spans from the 14th to the 20th century because it also contains three printed editions um, of the 20th century from 1911 and 1920. And there is also a, um, a, a translation into Gujarati from the 1960s. Karina, so all the mamas- Karina, we're running to the end of uh, time. We're about a minute over, just to let you know. Okay. Okay, so, and we have some, um, yeah, we have uh, manuscripts from six sources and uh, I want to highlight that seven manuscripts are multi-text featuring one to seven additional texts. And uh, of course, we have uh, some of the multi-texts uh, that uh, include other Jain yoga texts, Jain bhakti texts, and texts from non-Jain yoga traditions. This is where I found those manuscripts. Here's an overview of accompanying texts. And um, here we have uh, Jain other Jain works from the first and the second uh, millennium of the common era. And it's interesting to note that some are of um, uh, Shvetambar and some are of Digambar um, origin. Of uh, uh, Here's another one. Uh, here is a third one. And here is one of Bori, which I was found particularly interesting because the other text that is accompanying is a non-Jain text, presumably. I'm not 200% sure, but it's presumably uh, the Viveka Matanda and early Hatha Yoga text, uh, which I found um, really striking. Okay, here is another, um, the oldest manuscript with a stabaka, the forerunner of the tabu. And that is the oldest manuscript I found, uh, which uh, 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 probably presumably uh, stems from 1356 of our common era. To wrap it all up, um, key takeaways I've, I have already mentioned, uh, let me quickly sum it all up because, before time runs up. The Yuga Pradipa was a very popular text. You, it was popular, it was in use. It was not only used to convey doctrinal uh, content, but it was also used to enhance language knowledge. It was dealt with, it was worked with, and that for a time span of, uh, of uh, six centuries. And I think this is a really uh, amazing, an amazing thing. And I, I just wish for this text to become as popular as it has has been in the last uh, in the last uh, three centuries, and I will do my very best to to bring a wonderful critical edition to life in the next years. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, yeah, read the articles by Nalini by Mia, and uh, thank you very much for everything. <laughs> Wow, Corinna, that was an impressive presentation. Your love for language and manuscripts and texts is uh, infectious. I'm sure we all feel it deeply in our heart right now. It's so uh, beautiful, especially with your uh, inspiration with the Gujarati. Um, so thank you so much for a brilliant, brilliant presentation, uh, Corinna. Um, next, I would like to introduce uh, another scholar who is fluent in Gujarat, uh, Gujarati. Um, this is uh, Venu Mehta. She is an assistant professor in Jainism and Com in comparative spiritualities at Claremont School of Theology, where she's one of our colleagues uh, with Arihanta, with the staff at Arihanta. Uh, some of her present research focuses on the devotional practices, literature, and iconography of the Jain goddess Padmavati. Please welcome Dr. Venu Mehta. Thank you, Gojan Bhai. Uh, nothing makes me happy happier than uh, telling that I'm Gujarati. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for organizing this conference. I've been uh, enjoying and learning a lot from uh, diverse presentations and scholars. Uh, so thanks, Gojan Bhai, uh, 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 Chris, and uh, Parvinji. Um, okay, so I'll uh, share my screen. I don't have too many slides. I have a couple of uh, pictures. Uh, to show and let me do how to. Uh... So uh, we are going to deal with 10 million gold coins and 500 thieves. And we are going to talk about uh, Kapila Kevali. So this is very interesting. I came across, I met Kapila Kevali in Uttradhyana Sutra as I was going through all the uh, sutras and uh, canonical scriptures to look for where 
the yakshas and yakshis come for my uh, PhD dissertation. That was my doctor, uh, my supervisor, Dr. Narayan's instruction. Go for every uh, you know, script and look for yaksha and yakshis. And there where I came to know about uh, this, and I found the chapter from this uh, uh, Uttaradhan Sutra very interesting. And I'm thankful for, uh, uh, you know, this conference that I could really develop that as, as my uh, presentation. Again, I'm not a scholar in Jain Yoga, but I'll try to uh, start something in that. So uh, I'll keep one picture in front of you. So in this presentation, I read the eighth chapter ascribed to Sage Kapil or Kapila Kevali, which is titled Kapiliya are also called as uh, Kavilyam in Prakrit or Kapilyam Adhyayanam of the Uttrayadhan Sutra, uh, one of the first, I mean, the first of the four Mula Sutras of the Shvetandara Canon. Uh, the Sutra is divided into 36, cha 36 chapters and written in Ardhamagati Prakrit, while each chapter treats different aspects of Jain doctrine. Uh, this particular chapter and its intention explains uh, as, as, as Yakubi explains is to, to in, instruct a young monk in his principal duties to command an ascetic life by uh, percepts and examples and to warn him against the danger in his spiritual career. From the point of view of James, the sutra contains the words of Mahavira expecting the eighth chapter which is ascribed to Kapil Kevali or Kapila. Moreover, I use the vritti or commentary on the Uttradhyana Sutra name as Sukhbodha, which is uh, written in 14,000 verses by Devendra Gani, also known as Nemichandra Suri, in the year uh, 1123 AD. My attempt in this presentation is to explore the concept of Samadhi Yoga as it is depicted in the eighth chapter of the Sutra and probe into its ex expansion through the story of Kapila Kevali as told in the commentary by Simultaneously, I will also focus on the aesthetic, poetic, and narrative element used in the chapter, which is, uh, in my opinion, enhances the message on one hand and leaves us with a couple of reflective questions on the other. So what is Samadhi Yoga and how it relates uh, to various elements of Jain Tapas in this uh, particular chapter? The eighth chapter, Kavilyam or Kapilyam, uh, consists of 20 verses only. The intention developed therein is to instruct an ascetic to pursue tapas, a lifestyle which is dis with, with a disciplined body, mind, and senses. Altogether, the chapter instructs on pursuing a spiritual career by rejecting, indulging into greed and lust, and apparently warning against the danger of being born as asura or demon, or even caught in the cycle of rebirth as expected therein by falling to commit uh, by failing to commit a uh, discipline uh, austere life the concept of samadhi yoga evolves around this doctrinal injunction of tapas or discipline austere life uh, as it comes and to put it simple way samadhi yoga is a means to tapas but then how does kapila define samadhi yoga in the sutra and what entails samadhi yoga it, it, it is further developed in the commentary the term samadhi yoga uh, appears only in the verse 14th of the of the sutra text. And as Yakobi translate, it goes this way. Those who do not take their life under discipline, who cease from uh, meditation and ascetic practice, and who are desirous of pleasure, amusement, and good fare will be born as Asura. Yakobi also translates uh, Samadhi Yoga, and he grosses uh, in the footnote as meditation uh, and ascetic practices. Uh, samadhi as concentration of mind. Uh, the yogas are in the in this connection are the operations or the vyapara of mind, speech, and body conducive to it. While Yakubi's translation suffices the purpose of understanding of the verse in the translation, Devendra Gani's commentary work further expand the meaning of samadhi yoga. The paraphrased version of the commentary goes that way. How does an, an undisciplined one in this life who fall, who has fallen by not practicing the 12 kinds of tapas can gradually destroy the uncontrolled nature of the soul by Samadhi Yoga? And then comes the definition of Samadhi Yoga. Uh, and I'm translating what it is. Samadhi means a state of healthy mind and from which attains is yoga, 
such as auspicious or a sugar operation that is vyapara of mind, speech and body. Thus, by Samadhi Yoga, the uncontrolled nature of the soul can fall gradually. That is the commentarial work on the verse 14. Uh, this was the straightforward de definition of Samadhi Yoga. However, does the chapter reach, how does the chapter reach to the definition or declaration of what is called Samadhi Yoga? Can be understood by exploring the rest of the content of the chapter, uh, which really prepares one to understand why the Samadhi Yoga would come eventually. The chapter begin, begins with a question about how one avoids going to a lower birth or hell. And then, Kapil, uh, and then Kapil in the chapter gives the instruction uh, to an ascetic to, to do the following, not to practice or feel affection of any kind, remaining detached from any desire, taste for food, lust, adultery, specifically, specifically relationship with uh, tempting women, not to get caught into any bondage, to remain away from uh, killing animals, uh, so those who are into like animal advocacy would like this because it has a very elaborated description of it. not practicing uh, Lakshan Shastra, Swapna Shastra or Angavidya. And these are the Vedic or Indian branches of astrology, particularly ascribed to Hindu traditions. Uh, this is to say that Kapila in the chapter instruct ascetic to practice Samadhi Yoga uh, to remain abstain from all these activities which I described uh, above. Uh, which are undesirable for a mendicant to avoid rebirth as asura, and which the rebirth as asura keeps on coming. So, well, now uh, I, I told you that how do we come to the Samadhi Yoga? Now, how do we come to Samadhi Yoga? Does, did Kapil himself practice Samadhi Yoga? That is how he attained Kevalya Jnana. And who is Kapili and what is his story? So that's the that's the part that really develops into the commentarial work beautifully, and uh, I will read the central message in the chapter of Uttaradana Sutra uh, is to uh, you know uh, avoid the greed and and lust, which is best expressed in the seventeenth verse, and it goes this way: Jaha laho taha loho, laha laho pravadhi, pavadhi, meaning when when there is sense of possessing or gaining, there will be greed. Possessing brings greed. And how these are linked and how Samadhi Yoga is presented as prescribed mean uh, is expressed through the narrative of Kapila Kevli developed in the commentarial work. Having said that, I now move to the second chapter, which I told you about like, who is Kapila? How did he receive Keval Yajnana? So, um, my second, the second part of my presentation is uh, is is focusing on that. While we briefly meet Kapila in the main text, the Suk, uh, text Sukhabodha, the commentary by Devendra Gani constructs and tells us about the life story of Kapila Kevali in a very dramatic way, uh, using poetical style. And and the commentator author leaves us uh, with an experience of doctrinal message through poetic beauty. This chapter consists of uh, verses uh, ascribed to, as I told you, Sage Kapila and written in uh, Dhruva Kachanda. It's a kind of a poetic meter. Uh, his story is told in the commentary and I present the condensed and the summarized version of it. In the city of Kosambi, King Jita Shatru had a Brahmin priest named Kashyapa. When Kashyap died, the king appointed another priest and the Kashyap's uh, widow and her uh, son fell in poverty. To get the boy an, educa uh, an education, the, the widow sent him to the city of Shravasti, where lived Indradatta, a friend of Kashyap. Indradatta was willing enough to let the boy study with him, but he too was poor to lodge and feed him. However, he got a, mer uh, a merchant named uh, Shali Bhadra to take him. Their couple fell in love with a maid servant and neglected his studies. One day he found her in tears because she had no money to buy garlands, uh, you know, uh, garments, ornaments needed for a particular celebration. She asked Kapil to go to go for money to uh, to get the money uh, to uh, to get uh, money from a rich uh, merchant named Dan, who gave two pieces of gold every morning to the first person who greeted him. Kapila stayed awake all night and set out while it was dark for uh, uh, Dana's house. But in the darkness, the city police took him for a thief, arrested him, and in the morning brought him uh, before the king Prasanjit. 
The king saw at once that the boy was uh, no thief and asked for uh, his story. And the boy told promptly the king was pleased and offered Kapila a boon. And Kapila went outside in a groove to reflect. That's where the samadhi begins in. Um, although his first thought uh, had been uh, for two pieces of gold, he quickly saw that hundred would be better. Then he saw that a thousand, or as we speak in, in Indian language, a lakh or a hundred thousand, a crore, like 10 million. Just at that point, his good karma repent. And he recognizes that desire starting from very little quickly becomes limitless. He himself was neglecting his opportunity for study by running after a, a servant girl and uh, even a, and a mountain of gold would not satisfy him. Uh, he tore his own hair uh, because, uh, you know, his, his uh, process of becoming Kevil is defined as Swayama Buddha, who is self-enlightened. So he tore his own hair, becoming self-enlightened Swayam Buddha, and the gods provided him with a monk's garment. Then he preached to the king on the text, uh, on the text that is the stanza 17, which I uh, spoke in the very beginning. Uh, then uh, the more one gets, the more he wants. Desire grows with acquisitions like this. The masas would be enough, yet 10 million do not satisfy. Renouncing everything he set out on austerities, eventually obtaining omniscience. But now it's the interesting part comes in. He saw that in the forest, 18 yojans from Rajgraha, band of 500 robbers was ready for conversion. So he sensed that he knew that from his clairvoyant knowledge. He went there and they caught and bound him and took him uh, to their leader. The leader commanded him to dance. Uh, uh, so the leader commanded a Kevali to dance. The robbers clapped in their hands to mark the rhythm, and he began to dance. As he danced, he uh, he sang the verses of this chapter, and that's why it's in a Dhruva Chanda, and which each stanza, some of the robbers were con uh, robbers were converted. Until the last, uh, all five hundred had uh, seen the light and becoming and and become his disciple. Now that the Uttaradhyan Sutra becomes one of the earliest Jain texts introducing definition of Samadhi Yoga, and it also in a way presenting, you know, what exactly a Samadhi Yoga is, um, uh, also through narrative, also through doctrinal uh, aspect, we are left with a few questions that who is Kapil? And can a Kapil, an omniscient dance? While uh, Winterson in, in his uh, um, 1933 work, uh, History of India, in literature, uh, volume two, calls Uttaradhan Sutra a religious poem. He also knows that this Kapila does not appear to have any connection with Kapila of Sankhya system. And I also looked and searched a lot on that, and I could not find connection. Although we have two very, you know, Hindu traditions and yoga-centered name in this text, like Kashyap and Kapila, which looks like there is some relevance, but it's not yet found so. Besides uh, the discussion on Samadhi Yoga, the inquiry regarding Kapila, who becomes the Kevli as uh, Swayam Buddha, can be of our interest. The 17th century Digambara lay author Hemraj Pandey's Chorashi Bol Ki Bhasha, which uh, gives the tradition of polemic discussion between Shwetambara and Digambara, also mentioned the point of uh, Kevli's dancing, and which is uh, uh, described and uh, included as translation in, in Padmanabh Jaini's essay, Hemraj Pandes Jurashi Bol. Um, and the, in the line, the question, the point goes this way, that Kapila was a Kevli and yet he danced. So this is, I guess, a very interesting um, formation in which there is a doctrinal message, there is a very early uh, mention and reference uh, or introduction to yoga, specifically Samadhi Yoga, which really includes not only just mind, speech, thought, but also body, because he sits, and which is described in a uh, you know very poetic way, which is a very interesting story that will keep keep us reflecting and asking the question that why would a Kevali dance? So what could be the reason for that? And maybe I'll I'll, I'll maybe I'll continue with this uh, topic and do uh, some more research, and we'll have some uh, answers. I'll just show you this uh, picture. Um, uh, so this is from uh, a manuscript uh, Norman's edited, 
and it's before in this picture we have Kapila before the king Prasanjit and and after his enlightenment and his uh, preaching to the king. So he was there for gold coins, and now he's Kevali. You know the Im 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 like immediate realization. And in this, uh, the bottom the bottom picture, the bottom panel shows that Kapila is dancing, and uh, you know these five hundred things are being converted. And which each uh, uh, you know bunch of conversion, he he keeps on changing the verses, and but he keeps on dancing. So um, again, we have here uh, the story about like uh, now Kapila in front of Prasanjit, and then Kapila uh, plucking out his own hair and becoming Kavali, self enlightened Swayam Buddha. So I guess I mean this is very fascinating. Um, which has a mix of a lot of things. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you. All right, what a brilliant presentation of Anu Metta. Wow, a lot of really good stuff in there. Um, I particularly like the point about embodiment too. I think that would be a really good um, topic for questions and answers. So uh, hearing more about your thoughts on that, the, the relevance of embodiment uh, in that aspect. And also you alluded to the idea that he was was there for gold but got uh dancing something about the material world with proper attitude might be an indicator for higher spiritual ways or something like that very interesting stuff there i have a lot of thoughts i'd love to hear more about that um but alas it's not our q a session just yet um that will be coming up soon uh, but now we have to transition into yet another panel this will be our third panel of the day uh and this is a panel on the topic that yoga often gets reduced to and that is embodied yoga uh obviously the transnational modern yoga movement very much focuses on embodied yoga uh and actually embodiment has always been a theme uh in yoga traditions perhaps not with the uh, degree of emphasis that it has in modern yoga, uh, but certainly it's always been a theme. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear what our next panelists will have to say, uh, starting with uh, Samani Pratibha Pragya. Um, now, uh, Samani Pratibha Pragya received her PhD in Preksha Meditation, History and Methods from SOAS. Uh, at present, she is working as a visiting research fellow at SOAS with Dr. Flugel on Terrapant data pertaining to the Jane uh, Prosopography project, which I do not know what that is. I would love to hear more about that. She is a Samani in the Jane Terrapant lineage, and she's the spiritual head uh, of an authorized Preksha yoga and meditation uh, tradition as a teacher. Uh, please welcome Samani Pratibha Pragya. Hello, Omarham, Jai Jinendra, and yes, um, thank you, Kogan, for introducing in a way. Uh, finally, I'm a Samni, and uh, yes, the Kayut Sarg is the practice, which is the part of everyday life for monks, nuns, and Samni, and therefore I'm taking the Kayut Sarg in a way that ritualistic and non-ritualistic forms. So here non-ritualistic is the secular form which is open to all. And mainly I would like to introduce how the Kayut Sarg prominently important because this is the uh, first practice and the last practice as well. And this is documented uh, not only the Jain Agamas, but we, we can see a gradual development of Kayut Sarg. Here I would like to notice that um, Professor Lawman, he presented uh, the Avashaka literature. And there we can see that he said like, Avashika has many models, and one of them is might be before Mahavira himself, and the time of Mahavira, and after Mahavira. And I can add that, okay, the fourth, fifth model, that could be the recent and modern model, and modern model is non-ritualistic, and also it is a secular model. So this is uh, one thing, but... I would like to present this paper with the chronological framework. So early, like dating of the Agama is the Herculean task and even nobody can claim it is perfect. 
So I'm on the same boat. So early canonical, late canonical, and medieval and the modern period, because Zaina has specific <clears throat> Um, uh, interest to develop even commentaries on the Agma even today. So the textual resources for this paper is from Acharang Sutrikritang, Uttradhyan, Dasvekalik, the core text, and Avishik. And in the Avishika family, Avishik Niryukti, Mulachar, Avishik Churni, and so many more. And the medieval I'm talking a little bit from the Jnana of Subchandracharya, Hemchandracharya's Yoga Sastra, and the modern specifically, I'm taking from the writings of Acharya Mahapragya, and where he documented the Kayutsar as a core practice of the Preksha meditation. And side by side, interestingly, he translated it, relaxation with self-awareness, which is, again, um, a connecting modernity to the ancient practice, which is also a big question. And just, I would like to ponder on the etymology and uh, etymology of the Khaisa is Kai uh, and Utsarg. So kai is a semantic term and derived from the root chi. And here, chi means to gather together. So the whole body system, when you modern uh, system understand, then we have various system of the body and the old system works like an orchestra uh, and then the whole body is depicted. And utsarg means abandonment derived from the uh, root uh, shriz and prefix ut and kayutsarg. So this is the literal translation of the world. And kayutsarg is a popular practice and 21 tirthankras are uh, involved in this practice, every Tirthankar, but the 21 Tirthankara uh, attain liberation in Kausaga Mudra. And it is the first part of the Avashikas uh, among the six, and also an adjunct rite, uh, it is a part of daily lifestyle, Iriyapati Kayutsarg, Swadhyay Kayutsarg, Meditation Kayutsarg, Avashak Kayutsarg, Pratilekhana Kayutsarg, Sanlekhana Kayutsarg, Swadhyay Bhumi Kayutsarg, Mandalik Bhumi Kayutsarg, numerous Kayutsarg, and a huge list of atonement, which is also a ritualistic Kayutsarg. But Mahapragya's relaxation uh, I, I think uh, it is the first step of Preksha meditation. But when the Tirthankara attained the liberation and the Shailesi, very uh, specific term, Shail means like a mountain, firm like a mountain, unmovable like a mountain. So that practice is the last practice on the highest level of Suklabdhyan when the time uh, is only a, a, e, u, re, re, or very small time. And in that duration, the Salesi Avastha comes. So that is the paramount of Khayatsar. So early Kayutsarg, uh, if we see in the Acharang, Kayutsarg term is not appear. Only Kayam Vosajamani, an ascetic who has given up the body. Sutra Kritang also, Vosatakai, one who abandoned the body. So it is addressed to a monk. Vosatakai bhikkhutti vache. And in Sutra Kritang, one who abandons the body is called a mendicant. And similarly, Vosatakai uh, term is very popular in the early strata of the um, 
canonical literature. But when we come on the Uttaradhyan Sutra, which is also a Mula Sutra, and also popularly known that it is the last Dishna of Bhagavan Mahavir, as last sermon based on that. So why Kayotsar? The question is raised. And popularly, you know, Goema is everywhere. Nobody knows how many questions Goema raised, but the question is, so Kausagena Bhante Jivekim journey, what is the result of Kayotsarg? And the answer is by Kayotsarg, he gets rid of past and present expiratory rights, pious chitta, and thereby his mindset in ease like a Porter eased his burden and engaging praiseworthy contemplation and enjoyments of happiness. I adopted the translation of Jacobi, and here I feel that uh, it is yeah, very, very important to understand uh, the legacy of Kayut Sarg, how one can. Uh, feel that uh, legacy that through the Kayutsarg one attain the happiness, which is uh, very uh, common, but burden of the karma, eradicating of the karma, and also setting the pathway for the contemplation. It means this is the substratum of the meditation. And after that, one can meditate very well because the uh, meditative mind is ready through the Kayut Sarg. The Swekalik Sutra also presents a bhikkhu, one who does Kayut Sarg over and over again, is a mendicant, a bhikkhanam kau sagakari. So, thus, the treatment of Kayut Sarg is yani, each and every state. A bhikshu has to do kayut sarg, and this kayut sarg is, I think, a balancing activity of like pravritti means after activity, nibriti. So kayut sarg is a, uh, here in the beginning, we can see the early stage, it is mainly for the mendicant. It is a tool for the purification, eventually leads towards the liberation. Also, Kayutsarg is a concept of abandonment of body. Might be it is indicating towards the last final phase of the life and fasting unto death. And no detailed procedure is given at this stage. And we can see the Kayut Sag in Uttaradhyan, Dasve Kalik Sutra is more developed than Acharang Sutra. <clears throat> the late canonical, so the Avashak Kayut Sag, which is the part and repeatedly presented in Pratikraman, and here is the main uh, Prakrit part is available. So making it an additional effort, uh, one who want to come out from the um, sinful activity, doing atonement, doing purification, extracting evil from myself. I stand in the Kaisa in order to end sinful acts. With the exception of inhalation, exhalation, so his the procedure, if you stand in the Kaya might be some voluntary uh, act you can stop, but the involuntary act is not in the hand, like blinking of the inner eyes, blood circulation, sneezing, coughing, and so many more. So here I say that these are exceptions during the Kayot Sarg. And also, Kayot Sarg is prescribed uh, for the monks, nuns, and also a practice for the householders, those who are doing everyday pratikaman, daytime, four logas, nighttime, um, 50 logas, and in some tradition, four logas, and fortnight, uh, 12 logas, and four monthly, 20 logas, and yearly, 40 logas. So what is that? 
here in Kaisal, what a person does in the Logos. So here, no movement of the tongue, no movement of the body, just with breathing, because breath is counted, which is here, we can see the involvement in of the breath and the standing or sitting or lying, lying down position, but mostly in Pratikraman, in the standing pose uh, of the Kayotsarg is accepted. So here we see the atonement for every day, every night, every 15 days, which is popularly known Pakhi Pratikraman, Chomasi Pakhi Pratikraman, four monthly and yearly. So the rate of breath is increased. And very, very interesting that this meditation is the tool of purification. So Avashika has many connotation for the Kailsag. It is a, a use list and might I, I'm not going to read everything, but the abandonment, giving away, removing, sweeping, and so many meanings of the Utsarg. And similarly, I have not uh, put it uh, put here in the um, meaning of the body because puri meaning of the body. So I think it is a type of style during the niryuktikar or during the bhashikar. But the idea developed time to time. The later text divide kaitsar in two types. The exertion is chesta kaitsar abhibho means overcoming any natural calamity or any difficult situation. So these two types of kayutsarg are very important. Hmm. Two uh, category of kayutsarg, merely standing, uh, unmindful and unaware, that is dravya kayutsarg. And mindful state is bhav kayutsarg. So lokik and lokutar. Two types of khaisar, you see, if someone has to call a deity, someone needs some help, someone wants to protect, if there is bad omen, bad dream, bad thing, and at that time there is khaisar. So I think this is abhibhav khaisar. It is not only for purification, but the safety, security uh, of the congregation. And interestingly, this Abhibhav Kayut Sir is deeply rooted when someone in need, they can get different help for their life support. And there are numerous examples uh, for the Abhibhav Kayut Sir but I am very restricted to the time and topic, so I am not going in the detail of Abhibhav Kayotsar. The posture of Kayotsar is uh, Urdhva Kayotsar, it means standing, sitting, Nisanna Kayotsar, and laying, lying down is Nivanna Kayotsar. So the third one is the lowest, second is the middle category, and the standing is the highest category. And here you can see the mind boggling, the longest duration of Kayut Sarg. Him Chandracharya documented in the Swapagatika that Bahubali at uh, the, uh, the stage of Bahubali at Sravan Belgola, Karnatak, must we must visit is 57 feet high stage to exemplify the standing Kayosag over one year period. Historically, the longest duration of the Kayosag. So, which is, I think, uh, commonly not easy to practice, but it is. And Acharya Mahaprag is sitting in the sitting Kayosag, a child in the lying down pusher. So, you see, <laughs> The late canonical period, during that time, the substantial development of the phenomenon of the Kayutsar and complex and extensive list of the Kayutsar is attached to that time. And um, uh, 
a whole section of more than 100 slokas are dedicated in Avashik Niryukti and Kharsik practice prominently uh, monastic affair, but slowly, slowly moving towards the uh, common masses. And here we can see the practice of calling goddess and goddess potentially for the worldly wounds or sometime purification of dullness of body, intellect and development of the contemplative uh, mood. So all these are uh, the med medieval uh, development of the same practice. And the medieval period, uh, if we see the 8th to 16th century, and the Acharya Shubhachandra and Hemachandra, so here we can see the term Hemachandra used, Shithili Karan, the first included as a part of meditation. And here, no detailed description of the Sithili current. Mm, is it the same which is today relaxationism but it is there and the term and the clear evidence of the practice that it is mm, uh, different from the acharang and here indicate the complete bodily relaxation also and Kayut Sarg in the modern practice, so in 17th to 19th century, not much development has seen in ritualistic term. But here, the 20th century, it's a renaissance of this uh, yogic boom in the worldwide community and across the Jaina sect. And interesting uh, development in the meditative techniques and Mahapragya developed the Kayut Sarg, which is as a monastic practice also. Through his own autobiography, he says, I practice daily ritualistic practices, uh, morning, evening meditation, and after different shows of the life of a monastic, I used to do Kaisarg, but the transformation in the personality or uprooting some bad habit and making it um, uh, renew, uh, renew personality, that is not possible through the ritualistic way. Uh, ritualistic way could be a liberating tool for the soul, but a Mahaprabhu's representation of Kaya maintain original position uh, and also he opened the door at any any way if you can do in sitting, standing in three modes, but any mode if you want to do Kaya Sag, you you can do sometimes elderly people, some are ill people and many, many uh, research, more than 50 research carried out through Jain Vishwabharti University with the um, gadgets, with the um, development of the various brain waves and testing of the blood, the sugar, the uh, system of endocrine and various um, medicalization of the chaos can be seen through those uh, more than 50 theses and research articles. And all India Medical Institute also carried out some research through the Kayut Sarg uh, in the leading uh, professional uh, medical professionals and uh, the collaboration of the uh, meditative teachers. So that is also a landmark of the modernization of the ancient and century old tradition and uh, here I can say that Mahaprabhu developed his own model and that uh, we can try to see through the first stage he taken relaxation, shithili karan from toe to the top of the head. Second stage at the Kaisal move through the gross level to subtle and a practitioner penetrate deep inside and feel the pranic movement 
maintain the body and the prana here vital force and uh, this vital force can be experienced the third stage of the kaisa move from subtle to the subtler levels and here the oral colors the lesha can be seen and the um, uh, some can feel the difference between the gross body of the sharir and the fiery body taij sharir and uh, this uh, stage is also can be seen in the uh, more than popular development in the psychology the um, uh, states of the various states of the psychological uh, movement and here the altered state of the uh, one who are in the deep stages of the kaisa fourth stage is moving towards the subtle level and at that time one can experience the level of uh, karmic body so uh, the discrimination dating state means bheda vigyan uh, of that stage so this is i have lot more um, examples from acharya mahapragya's life and others uh, practitioner who are very deeply engaged with my Pragya's movement and uh, those who did and also my own personal experience of the altered state during the Khaitsag but time has its limit but where I can see that a new um, development of the Khaitsag at the various conscious level and the formative influence if we study in this whole package more denied package which is of course denied package by acharya mahapragya the scientific exploration so complete relaxation and here i can see um, many articles are available by other yogic tradition and here i would like to make a difference with the yoga nidra of muger bihar school savasana of the yogic tradition because here awareness is the key and uh, moving towards the um, development of this kayat sir acharya mahapragya himself accepted the dr herbert benson's relaxation response we have studied it and it influenced acharya mahapragya's um, making of the modern kayat sir and kayat sir is now presented in a effective practice for the combating stress and uh, um to be amazing in the corporate world in the schools in the colleges and fast learning track also meditation towards the meditation so it is uh, yeah moved towards a more secular practice and mahapragya given this practice uh, even one can use in the medicalization of the yoga and uh, many therapy aspect he presented in his book uh, so uh, i'm not going in much detail but he accept the benson's instruction stretch and relax samanji so, samanji we're about 4 minutes over if you could come to a, a stop and point that would be great thank you yes 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 i'm concluding so the notes on the direct impact on the endocrine system which is also raised some questions that is it possible yes the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems balance and many more uh, benefits he talked and this therapeutic use of um kaitsar and also the educational mode and the rubric of the the uh, science of living which is prominently a department at jain vishwabharat university preksha meditation yoga and science of living uh, so more than 1000 students passed out from this course and uh, they are working in different area so finally i would like to say sort of a logical point of view 
महाप्रज्ञेस एक्सप्लेनेशन ऑफ काय उत्सर्ग he defined kaisag as a self realization through the abandonment body abandonment of the body and emphasize on the experience of the separateness of the body and soul which is popularly bhed vigyan and uh, rationally he said it is an element of the jaini yoga purifying the self uh, eliminating the karma and also relaxation of the whole body is necessary uh, prerequisite for experimental realization and separateness of the body and soul and there is no two separate practice sometimes we say it's kayutsar is kayutsar because it is the ancient jain practices but we can see through our study that what was on this a single word from vosakta kai vosakta chakta dehe and now they traveled from the centuries and finally uh, assimilated so many things in kayatsarg and modernization of the kayatsarg so in conclusion i would like to say that it is a synthesis of the ancient and modern practices and successfully mahapragya synthesized the original concept of the kayasak with the innovative elements of the modernized science and uh, psychology and also he integrates both for the monastic and, and lay community and it is open to all Uh, in a secular practice uh, which is available to all so thank you having me and now i would like to conclude that this is a thread of jain yoga which traveled through centuries the air of time the color of time and the thoughts of time all are assimilated here in Thank you. Thank you so much, Simani Ji. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, there is so much. I think I have more questions on your talk than any other one so far. I must have written ten questions down here. Uh, brilliant. Uh, so everybody, please hold your questions till the Q and A section. Uh, for now, I think we're right running about eight minutes behind, so it's not too bad. Uh, but next, I would like to introduce. Introduce. We're really honored to have our next speaker. um cuz he's the seminal thinker in academic jain yoga studies um i think he's already been cited several times in this conference so far and he probably will be a few more times uh, certainly by myself as well um so i'd like to uh, introduce dr christopher key chapel uh he's a doshi professor in indic and comparative theology and is a and a uh, direct of the master of arts in yoga studies at loyola marymount university lmu Uh he has published more than 2000 books including some of my favorites uh Reconciling Yogas from Routledge in 2016 you can see how many times I flagged this one that's how much I use it and then another really important book uh the uh edited volume on yoga and jainism here from Routledge as well some of my favorite works and several others uh, uh of he has some of my favorite books have been written by Dr. Chapel so everybody please welcome Dr. For, Dr. Christopher Key Chapel So I invite you to enter the space of bodily symmetry. And this symmetry is about subject and object. It's about our right side, it's about our left side. It's about our feminine side, it's about our masculine side. It's about Shiva and Shakti, it's about those images of the Tirthankara which as you can see a little bit of my background in fact end up being androgynous and all of this conversation is premised on a theory ultimately of the sukshma sharira and this is where somani had brought us toward the end of her presentation the very many levels of body this is one description from the sankhya karika if we had more time we would dwell with and again uh the instructions in tibetan buddhism this relationship between our subtle body and our physical body 
inseparable. So I'm going to set us in a context of bodily perfection to begin with and invite you to just consider uh, this imagery of the Buddha. Recall 32 marks of perfection. The Buddha is described as with eyes pure, large, as broad as the blue lotus, with teeth white, even close, snowy as white jade. Virtues, bodily virtues, resemble the boundless great ocean. The Buddha body's radiance is like a golden mountain. It is clear, pure, peculiar, without equal or likeness. Similarly, we have this remarkable attention given to the body in Jain traditions as well. And in a Svetambara text, the Apapatika Sutra. The jinna is exceedingly tall. His body is perfectly proportioned. The arrangement of his bones is of a rare type, affording him the extraordinary strength required for him to endure all sorts of attacks. Supernatural, natural and man-made, and to practice the extreme austerities required to burn off his karma. And unlike us, his digestion is always perfect. He never suffers from gas or diarrhea. And like a bird, he can digest anything, even stones. Again, those teeth, and certainly not my teeth. He has perfect teeth. His shoulders, and certainly not my shoulders, his shoulders are broad. His chest, as we know from the statues, marked with the Srivatsa sign. He has a charming line of hair on his belly and his genitals are concealed, like those of a fine stallion, the foreskin. The bottoms of his feet are red like a lotus and soft like its leaves. Every limb is radiant with light. And this description continues, leaving no part of the body untouched. And then from the Yoga Shastra, from Hevachandra, one imagines a person sitting as this image of the Tirtankara in the Pryanka pose, crossing the legs, placing the hands over the navel. If one imagines the two knees are joined by a line from the right shoulder to the left knee, the left shoulder to the right knee, from the forehead to the hands, perfect symmetry. But what is this thing that we call the body? As we heard just now from somebody, we have this gross physical body, the alkarika. We also, however, have these, and these are not hierarchically arranged, we have a transformation body. We can change. We also, have a translocation body, an aharaka, through which we're able to put ourselves imaginally and emotionally in the company of the saints. We have a fiery body. Again, can be stirred up during coyote sarga. A body through which we are able to perform tapas. We are able to dislocate those difficult places within our karma body, our karmana. The sukshma sharira wherein dwell the vasanas and the samskaras. And as we heard earlier, in order for us to endure the taijas, in order to burn off those karmas, we have to be able to sit, we have to be able to stand. And it was said earlier that the Tritankaras had this remarkable firmness within their body, within their joints that allow long periods of sitting, long periods of standing, in order to stir up the tejas, in order to burn the samskaras out of the sukshma sharira 
And this firmness is some hanana. And this is related also in this conversation of body to the symmetry body. And we saw earlier this um, sort of introduction. What is this thing called symmetry? One side and the other. And we saw this, this beautiful symmetrical form, like a coyote sarga, but in Padma Asana. So what is this samstana? this symmetry that allows the release of the samskaras that manifest through the subtle body into the stula sharira. And the symmetry can be sama, chaturastra, can be in all four zones of the body, one side and the other, upper parts and lower parts. And it gets in places of distress where the upper part is a symmetrical, but the lower part is not. That below the navel is symmetrical, but the upper part is not. There can also be a hunchback where the hands, the feet, the head, the neck are symmetrical, but the breast and the belly are not, the kukja. We can also have a manifestation of the body that is miniaturized, vamana, dwarf-like. Or we can have someone who is born into a body that is radically asymmetrical or hunda. And I think if we, we do a little bit of an internal check, um, we know our bodies well enough. I remember going to the shoe store as a little boy and he put that foot measurement on one foot and on the other and said to my mother, oh, one foot is differently sized than the other. And we might want to compare ourselves to the bodies of the Buddha or the Jenna and say, oh, no, but not all is lost. And this is from the Svetambara Upadhyaya, Megavijaya. You can see his dates here. It's for physical prowess, men or women who are lame, dwarfish, or subjected to extreme illness, hunda, are not prevented thereby from attaining moksha. For there is no fixed rule concerning their cap incapability. Merely having deformed limbs is not determinative in this matter, because moksha is possible even for those who have the samstana, the asymmetry of a hunchback or a dwarf. And Christy Wiley quoted early, earlier, does remind us that according to Pabhanab Jaini and others, it is believed by both Svetambaras and the number is that the entirely unsymmetrical or deformed body is the result of extremely evil karmas in past lives. However, having a body of this kind is not considered to be an impediment to the release of karmas. And I have had the good fortune to sit some years ago with Pandit Dhiraj Lal Mehta, and he is quoted by Christy Wiley, who also met with him, is saying, people can do it. People can advance on the gunastanas regardless of their body type. And this is quoted from her dissertation. And I, I wanted to just give a few heartening examples across traditions. And this is Baba Sant Nagpal, who my wife and I had the good fortune to sit with in uh, the Chattapur temple, which at the time was the largest temple in India in 1994. And he had a severe case of polio and was at the time of his life considered um, a remarkable saint. And it was wonderful to take his darshan. And again, his bodily form compromised. So I wanted to lift up some contemporary figures that have brought this conversation, and I know that I'm at time, so this will go quickly, 
that brought this conversation um, a little bit full circle. And Dr. Motoyama uh, on the right says that the fascia within the body, which brings constraint, which contains a wateriness in that fascia that holds the memories of some scars and vasanas, can systematically, as we heard with Kayot Sarga, can systematically be released. And he inspired uh, Paul Grilly and his wife Susie to develop a form of yin yoga that, like that image of the a little boy in uh, Coyote Sarga lying down encourages people to be able to release those constrictions. Similarly, I wanted to share a little bit about a type of body work. And we know from Ayurveda that massage is very, very central to health practices in India. And Raul Ruel, rather, Kazanchian, had come to Los Angeles as a young person to study with Emily Conrad, who developed a body movement system called Continuum, and eventually became a teacher of ortho and practitioner of orthobionomy that physically works with the release of holdings that are due to difficulties and constrictors within that fascia, and similarly, for decades, uh, this physical yoga teacher in Santa Monica, and we're doing an event in her honor tomorrow, developed slow, long holds. And, and you could see a little bit of Coyote Sarga in this particular move, uh, sort of a dynamic Coyote Sarga. But again, the idea about the release of constricting energy. Uh, a lot of science, as so many had shared. The Yoga Sutra says, beauty of form, strength, adamantine stability. That's a goal within this very physical manifestation of yoga. And I want to end with a great American poet and commend you to read the whole thing. It's very long, and I only excerpted a little bit of it, but I sing the body electric, and I'm going to go all the way to the end. The circling rivers, the breath, and breathing it in and out, the beauty of the waist and thence of the hips and thence downward toward the knees, the thin red jellies within you or me, the bones and the marrow and the bones, the exquisite realization of health. Oh, I say, these are not the parts in the poems of the body only, but of the soul. Oh, I say now, these are the soul. So I wanted to give a little bit of literally a shout out to the inseparability of body and spirit across traditions. So thank you. Hey, wonderful presentation, Dr. Chapel. It's very inspiring. It made me want to actually move my body <laughs> after sitting here for a couple hours. So thank you for the reminder about the importance of embodiments um, and the release of constricting energy, as you so eloquently put it. So thank you very much uh, for those thoughts. Um, okay, so now we are at the uh, response to our morning uh uh, panels, and there sure was a lot there. Uh, so I'm sure our next guest will have much to say uh, about this. I would like to please invite our respondent. Uh, this is Tine Vikimens, and uh, she, Professor Vikimens holds the Acharya Mahapragna Chair for Jain Studies, which was established at Ghent University in 2022. Uh, she's a postdoctoral research fellow funded by Ghent University's Special Research Fund. And her research is noteworthy in that it combines ethnography with textual studies and or media analysis. Um, so yeah, welcome, uh, Dr. Vekemens. Thank you very much for being here and uh, look forward to hearing your reflections on uh, all of this. 
All right. Thank you very much, Kojin. Um, and thank you to all the organizers for um, and all the speakers for making this a very, very thought-provoking morning for you in the US, evening time for me here in Belgium. Um, you've set me quite a task, <laughs> but I will um, share some of my thoughts. I will also try to, um, for those who weren't present to, during the entire morning, I'll kind of give you an, a short overview of what's already been discussed. Um, I probably won't fill up the entire 20 minutes, but I'm sure you guys won't mind that much. Um, so when I got an email um, asking if I wanted to contribute to this event, uh, which looked absolutely wonderful from the beginning, um, honesty demanded that I say that my work has only really touched upon yoga rather than gone into it. Um, so not only do I not consider myself an academic yoga specialist, I'm not even a very accomplished practitioner of anything remotely resembling yoga. I've tried, it wasn't successful. However, I'm an educator and meaning I'm a teacher, but also always, always, always a student. And I always enjoy listening and discussing with my lovely fellow colleagues um, and friends who are here. So actually I'm thrilled to, for the job as a respondent is what I emailed to Kojin. Um, now I'm sure that when I was a student, uh, my professors here at Ghent University must have, must have read excerpts of Hemachandra with me. Um, however, the mind must be ready for deeper knowledge. And I was very much preoccupied and being 20 years old with the details of the grammar that I had to um, learn rather than looking into the meaning of the text. Later as part of my ethnographic research though, um, I did, well, I came into contact with yoga um, as I joined families and different organizations in the US and the UK in yoga sessions. Sunday morning yoga with the young James in London, online pandemic yoga during um, the lockdown, um, I particularly enjoyed elderly chair yoga with Navnat in London, um, as well as the animal-themed toddler's yoga class I got to join with the Jains in Antwerp. So my in with Jain yoga is very clearly um, the way more and more lay Jains engage with practices of yoga. And in my research, that is, touches very much on Western or Westernized yoga practices. Um, Jains add yoga to their cultural repertoire, sometimes overtly designating the practice as Jain, seeing it as an extension of, of dhyana, uh, talking about samaik, but also sometimes just a bodily practice um, aimed towards relaxation. So let me remind you of what we have learned already in the first three panels. Um, we started um, on ethics and lived tradition. Um, and so that was the first panel, but I kind of suspect that some of the papers that followed in later panels could also kind of be seen as part of that lived tradition thing, which I very much enjoyed. Um, Andrew Bridges started today um, reiterating some central points of Jain doctrine, which is always good at the start of an event such as this, um, and linking Jain yoga directly with ethics, um, positing that the drive to eliminate suffering is central to philosophy and Jain yoga then being a tool to um, advance towards liberation. Um, this clearly linked also to ahimsa, nonviolence. Um, what I particularly enjoyed about this philosophical talk on Jainism, ahimsa, and yoga was that ahimsa and yoga was presented not as an individual, to, not only as an individual tool towards liberation, but also as a kind of as something that has a collective um, impact on the planetary collectivity that we are part of. And I think that that move from personal um, advancement towards liberation um, on the one hand, and then the broader societal impact of this on the other, that theme kind of came back in a lot of the later papers as well. Um, and one of the, the great surprises, and I must say, I'm really very sorry, Christopher Miller, um, that, I, that it was such a surprise because I could probably have read your chapter at some point. <laughs> um, Christopher Jain Miller talked about a mural, a mural on the Berlin Wall. Uh, made by a an, an chain artist, Narendra Kumar, um, called The Seven Stages of Enlightenment. 
Um, so this kind of continued the link with ethics and spirituality, but in a bit of a different way. You have this context of the Berlin Wall, um, which is a very evocative canvas for anything, really. Um, it almost, it, it can't be unpolitical. This, this has to do with war and peace, with freedom or non-freedom, right? Um, but what is there and how this mural comes to be there has so much implications. Um, and this was a talk which brought together so many lines of thought and so many possible um, disciplines and perspectives that um, became relevant to it. So um, Narendra Kumar Jain was a yoga teacher, but also a member of the Indian and the Jain diaspora. It's also a modern artist meshed in a network of modern artists, Indian and other. So you clearly see this yogic message of enlightenment, but especially in the later rendition, it very clearly wants to connect East and West. Um, and as Chris very um, eloquently stated, this is not, this, this piece, this mural is not alone in this. So at the time it was made, the vital style that we see, you could see in other Indian modern um, artists' work, connecting tradition and modernity, national identity and the global. But what you actually then see on the mural is the tantric body, which has come back just now in the last two presentations, with the chakra system, um, as it was co-constructed to colonial scholars and um, Indian scholars in the 19th century. This is the central theme. Uh, which is a sensible choice, giving the, the, the context. It was quite well known in Germany. Um, and the, the artist, Jain, as an Indian national, was perhaps the only person who could have painted it, both topic-wise and canvas, meaning place-wise, where German nationals, other European nationals, would not have been allowed to paint where he was painting, making him... Uh, well, a, a very avant-garde artist in that sense, um, and a foreigner of all of the artistic and peace um, establishing um, initiatives that came after. Um, Vina Howard closed the first session, and funnily enough, I just had her article, um, The Nonviolence Conundrum, on my desk because I was working with it last week. Um, so, so it's nice to see her. <laughs> uh, let's see. She talked on Srimad Ratchandra um, and his integration of renunciation and action. And this really resonated with me because that is what, when I'm in the field talking to people in the UK and in Antwerp, but also to a lesser extent in the US, um, it, I, I only really got to know Srimad Ratchandra then. Um, for some reason, it, he passed me by completely during my, my studying years. Um, but it became clear to me that the, the especially different guru lineages, uh, traditions that have come to the fore after Srimad's death, um, really attract a lot of followers. And they, the people that they attract, that they inspire, are very, 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 are usually very, very into it. Talking to Darampuris and Raj Sabak followers, it's very clear that especially this idea of the householder renunciate, the yogi in the world, the renunciation, but also still the action is what attracts. It's a very, um, it's a very clever idea and it's, it's a, a very, how to say it, um, yeah, it's a very attractive idea to a lot of people where where um the the the, the obvious reading, the textbook reading in a lot of South Asian traditions, including Jainism, is that renunciation and the worldly do not mix. They do not entangle. Um, and this is another theme that we saw come back in a couple of the other presentations, is that in fact, maybe, and especially through this lens of yoga, but maybe also through other lenses that have to do in some way or form with Jainism, that is something to, to unpack and to start to nuance, because 
we can see it interacting in different ways and it's not always just clear opposites. Um, and it's this what draws a lot of Jains and even some non-Jains to these traditions based on Srimad's uh, lives and life and works. Um, so let's see. Um, then Vina asked um, in her talk, well, is was Srimad Rajchandra then a, a karma yogi? Yeah. Um, and is Jain yoga then karma yoga by definition or can it be, right? And then you had these two prerequisites of detachment um, and then dharma, which are also stated in, in the Gita. Um, and then I don't think, Vina, you didn't sort of give an answer, but you did truly make us, or at least me, think about what exactly that then entails for Srimad and for other practitioners, for other especially lay practitioners of um, Jainism and Jain Yoga. Then we were meant to switch to textual <laughs> studies, but very sneakily, uh, Corinna Meloir um, actually gave a bit of a sociological talk, <laughs> um, which I really much appreciate this combination of textual study, but also with a clear um, emphasis with, with room for like the context and for questions of what what does a text mean how how was it used why was it reproduced what, what can we try to learn of its audiences and its importance in the past as well as in the present so um Corina has um delved recently into a series of manuscripts on the yoga pradipa um now we learn we learned very little of the content of the text, but I'm sure uh, we we will learn more of this as your project advances, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, but taking our cue from John Court's article on academic models of Jainism, she wonders about the social and the cultural context of these manuscripts. How do Jains interact with the texts? What 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 does that mean? And then we learned about the practices of Balava Boda and the Tabos, which are expanded translations and then bilingual commentaries, showing that these texts were important and that they were used, at least at the time that they were reproduced. Um, the, the, the sense of making that kind of adaptations or, not, or adaptive translations translation is to contribute to linguistic learning, to contribute, to make it possible for less advanced lay people um, and, and sort of younger monks to get an idea of what is in a text. Um, so I found that really enlightening. Um, she went on saying that the presence of this text, the Yoga Pradipa, within uh, multi-text manuscripts can also really teach us a lot about in which sort of in which sphere we should place the text, but also the topic of Jain yoga in the intellectual history of that time in those communities. What are what is the yoga pradipa combined with? And then we we can see themes revealed pointing towards sort of specific yoga focused um yeah um selections, I call it, uh, with Jain, but also non-Jain yoga texts combined. We can also see combinations with uh, Jain Bhakti texts, which is interesting to see that apparently those kind of went together um, to an extent. Um, so I think that's a really enlightening way of approaching um, the, the social life of texts well in, in a few uh, um, centuries into history, um, and I applaud you for it. Um, as I've said before, I really look forward to seeing how this uh, goes further. Then with Venu Meta, we actually went into the content of a text, the Uttaradhyana Sutra, more specifically the eighth chapter, attributed to Kapila, which consists of advice and guidelines to, to young monks and instructions on tapas and austerity and how to actually get to those practices. And there we see the term samadhi yoga, um, which is interesting um, in itself. Samadhi yoga is presented as a means to come to practices of tapas. The text itself says very little on further details, but the commentary by Devien Ragani is used by uh, Venu to further our understanding of what this then is. 
um, the cultivation and control of the mind through contemplative and meditative practice is kind of the standard um, definition that I understand. Um, and the central message of that eighth chapter is to avoid greed and lust. But then interestingly, Venu asks, who, who was Kapila? And did he actually practice this Samadhi Yoga in his attainment of Keval Gyan? So we get to know this person and who through his own greed, his own non, uh, his own limitless greed realizes that there is no bounds to greed and there is no point to greed. So he becomes self-enlightened. Now in an, I think, unparalleled and unique way of conversion, he then gets to dance in front of a group of robbers who in, with every step he takes, which every dance move he, he makes, convert to Jainism and become his followers. Now, this sets the ball rolling for the next panel because that then raises the question, oh, way to take Samadhi Yoga. Does that then also have a bodily component? Is this part of that? Um, which was again lovely. I mean, these panels just roll into each other, which made my life today a little bit easier. Um, so the next scholar is probably a practitioner and scholar per excellence on this topic, Samaniji uh, Pratibha Pragya, delved into the um, quite specific practice, I used to think, of Kayut Sarga in its um, ritualistic and non ritualistic versions. Um, so what I loved, 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 loved about this presentation, and actually also um, by the fact, uh, by, by, by Chris Chappells, um, which came straight after and did the same thing, was that they took us from the Agamas to present day with a very large corpus of texts backing the um, argument of these papers, which I like a lot. Um, Samaniji asks from Agama to Mahapragya, what is this abandonment of the body? What is this Kaya Utsarga? Who practices it and what does this mean? Um, we know that, the, that at least 21 Tirthankars uh, have attained liberation in this position, but it's also a daily practice for the, um, for the Dominican community and Avashyaka. Um, but then it also grew into a recommended practice for lay followers. And with similar to um, a lot of modern and contemporary yoga practices, it also kind of at a point just became a bodily practice without much Jain um, entanglement. Um, let's see. And that is, of course, because of its centrality to Preksha meditation, which was developed by the Therapan, but very much popularized and presented in a way to speak to Jains and non-Jains alike. Um, so the practical implications of this Kayot Sarga, we see, um, can differ depending on who practices and at what level they practice. It contributes to the purification of the soul. Of the soul. It's an, a, a defining attribute of mendicancy. There's also a transitory practice to transition from sin to focus, and as such, to prepare the mind in an effective way for meditative or, or contemplative practices which come later. Um, and lastly, it's a technology for relaxation. It can be done just going through the motions, dravya, or with pro proper focus, bhava. It can be an exertion or an overcoming. What struck me is that in this diachronic reading of the changing and overlapping meanings, we hear an echo also of Andrew Bridges, I think first paper of the day, assertion that ahimsa and Jain yoga are a tool for both individual spiritual advancement and a practice which can have at least collective planetary, in Bridges' words, um, implications. Um, Jain yoga, as analyzed by way of Kayot Sarga, um, also shows this. It acquires ritualistic and non-ritualistic applications, particularly developed from the middle period in Hemachandra's um, Yoga Shastra, where, where for the first time Shitili Karana, or relaxation, is found in relation to Kayot Sarga. And it widens, it democratizes first to lay chains throughout time, 
in a ritual and non-ritual way, and then to non-Jains in, by necessity, a non-ritual way too. Um, in a further contemporary development, we see that this widening includes to an extent secularization and medicalization, um, which for both contemplative and bodily practices is quite a common turn, um, especially when um, these practices are brought into new contexts, let's say. Um, just now, we were all happy and honored to listen to Chris Chappell's presentations. I'm going to assume that's kind of fresh in your memory. Um, symmetry and karmic release, as a previous, um, just as the Samaniji's paper took us through a whole wide range of time and space, um, ending with an American poem. Um, which was a really lovely way to end. I wish you had, would have had more time, but I'll read it later. <laughs> um, um, and it interestingly took up this idea of the subtle body, of the karmic body, which was also already present in uh, the Samanichi's paper, um, where we see that both um, descriptions of the Buddha and of the Dirtankers, um tell of a perfect body, which is perfectly symmetrical, which um, is also an indication of the absence of any worldly influence or impurity. However, the body is much more complex, as we know from Tatvarta Sutra. Um, and perhaps reassuringly, we ended with the idea, also voiced by Padmanam Jaini, that um, not having a perfect body in the world is not an impediment for the advancement towards moksha. So my takeaway from this morning panels, and that's again a bow to the organizers, but because the sun is just going down here um, at the other side of my window. Jain yoga is a lot. <laughs> it's a tool of ethics. It can be a mural, so it requires art historians. It's a body of texts. Um, it can be karma yoga, allowing for an intermingling with action. Um, it not, all, not only has this historical body of texts as a foundation, but we've learned through multiple presentations that these texts were used then in the 16th and 17th century, and also now, perhaps in different ways by different audiences. But a lot of them retain a relevance and retain a use in um, Jain or non-Jain practice. Um, even the agamas that deal with practices of or related to yoga often give little background though, or they leave room for interpretation. Venu Metas dancing Kevalin brought in that bodily aspect of yoga without much sort of, you know, there, there was not a lot of further explanation in the text. But all we can do as scholars is sit here and note that this is happening and be a bit confused every so often. But what we see emerging through this morning's presentations, and I'm sure the afternoon will not be different, is how complex and continually developing Jain yoga is. Not only can more work be done on the textual traditions, both from a sociological and a philo philological method, uh, but historical anthropology and anthropology also have things to add. We need to also look at this as a developing practice. Um, as the texts change and develop through time and through commentaries, the practices that may be said to make up Jain yoga also change. Yeah. Dichotomies of mendicant and lay, renunciation and action, Jain and non-Jain, mental and body, um, are all present here and all in, in intermingling in strange and wonderful ways. Not all yoga, furthermore, um, done by Jains, is Jain yoga, um, which might be another interesting angle um, from a contemporary and eth ethnographic perspective. Or then again, is it? Is all, Jain yoga, all yoga done by Jain is per definition Jain yoga? I very much look forward to the continuation of this conversation. I really do. And I hope it will include as many perspective, as perspectives as we can find in this short half day, we've had cause for 
psychologists, we've had calls for art historians, we've had calls for textual scholars, for ethnographers, for practitioners, for so many. And I really think that this is one of the avenues where we can have a truly rich and very diverse um, conversation advancing Jain as well as yoga studies. So I think I'll leave it there. Again, thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, I really, for a non-specialist in, in Jain yoga, I had an enlightening morning, evening. <laughs> wow, what brilliant reflections, Dr. Vickermans. Thank you so much. Um, you really, uh, you really found a structure and a flow to that conference. You know, it felt it felt very harmonious to me as we were going through this all. But it was nice to have you really underscore how each different paper really unfolded into the other and how the themes so nicely seem to uh, fit with each other. Uh, I, I said to Chris in a message that it's like poetry listening to your analysis of this. <laughs> it really was quite nice. And I really appreciate your uh, that, that final thought that you left us with about Jane's doing yoga, you know, is all, is it by definition yoga that Jane's doing it or do Jane's do non-yoga? That's such a great... Um, way to end uh, with all of this very provocative. Thank you very, very much. Um, okay, so uh, right now we're about 13 minutes ahead of schedule. My inclination is to try to keep to the schedule as much as possible um, so that we're not too late for our start for the um, afternoon. So I believe we're going to um, do questions and answers now until 1140. Um, and I would like to, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I would like to start with some of the questions that have been put in the question and answer box uh, throughout the conference. And I'll go through those in order so that the people who ask their questions first will get their questions. Uh, questions addressed first. Okay. Um, so the first uh, question I have uh, from our dear friend and colleague, uh, Anand Vaidya. Uh, and this is a question that he um, asked towards uh, in, during, uh, in the context of Dr. Christopher Miller's uh, presentation. And uh, Dr. Vaidya asks, is there a difference between how chakras are defined in Vedanta and Tantra in various schools of Jainism? It's a good question. <laughs> Did you want me to respond to that or did you want somebody G? Yeah, I can start. And I know uh, Rohini Pragya, somebody also had a, a response to this. But one of the things I find fa fascinating as I was looking at this image on the Berlin Wall and what struck me was the seven chakra system, which is so often associated in the history of yoga in the field of yoga studies, which has kind of taken a very close look at this system. It's very much associated with these tantric texts medieval tantric texts and not with Jain texts. And so um, I don't find the kind of elaborate chakra systems in the Jain texts that I'm engaging with anyways. Not that I don't find Tantra in there, for example, in Hema Chandra, for example, um, or arguments even against Tantra. But um, the, the kind of complex system that I see Narendra Kumar Jain drawing from, to me, very clearly comes from the influences that are, are we could call non-Jain, but in a way he's making them his own to kind of highlight his own Indian culture with the, the kind of structures through which he can and the categories he has available to him that will be familiar to the German public. And so this is like kind of a question mark. And I presented a similar paper at the AAR. In my title, I put a question mark like, is this Jain yoga? What does this mean? Um, and so I don't want to say it is or it isn't, but I think it shows the complicated uh, situation that Tine pointed out, which is that um, Jains do yoga, but it's not necessarily Jain yoga. I mean, sometimes it is, right? Sometimes it is, very clearly is. But a lot of times Jains are practicing yoga today that are based on systems that were popularized in the crucible of colonialism um, and that, that have now become this kind of transnational democratized system that is familiar to most anyone around the world who's somewhat familiar with yoga. So that's my long answer to that. I don't know if... Uh, Somebody do you wanted to add anything to that? Because she did have some textual references. Yeah, Samani G or anybody else who might have something to say about the relationship between the Jain, Tantric, Vedantic systems of chakras and perhaps the nadis of the subtle body, etc. Okay. If there's yeah. nothing else. Yeah. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Can Yes, can if you, you could go on screen, that would I'm be audible, helpful. right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So many, so many Rohini Pragya is, the, is yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Oh. This is Rohini Pragya. Yeah. I just can you, can you turn your camera on? Yeah. Uh, is it okay if I don't turn it? 
<laughs> if you don't want to, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you, because I'm audible, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, I, I don't see in Jainism, like the seven chakras, the name of chakras mentioned, but as my paper will come up in the contemplative practices, I do have the references for Sandhi in Acharan Sutra. And I have given the references like in chapter five and chapter two uh, of Acharan Sutra in Jainism is talking about transcendental realization, the elements of transcendent, uh, the, the element conducive for transcendental realization. And in that case, they are using the term Sandhi. So I'll be developing that idea in, uh, in my paper. Good. Good. That's good to know. All right. So uh, hopefully... Yeah. Uh, I'd here. like to check in on this just a little bit. The Mahaprajna was very specific in delineating tendras distinct from chakras. And if we look at the Gyanarnava, uh, um, Somachandra, and it's then repeated in the Yoga Shastra of Hemachandra, there's always this dance between making correlations and beckonings to Hindu systems, but then doing it differently. So, for instance, in Gyanarnava, which is 9th, 10th century, rather than having earth, water, fire, air, space, an ascension of meditations on the elements that follow the subtle body upward in each of those associated with different chakras, the order is reversed so that it becomes earth, fire, air, water, and then space. And the dynamic and the procedure which is linked to meditative accomplishment of that tapasya, of the burning off of, of karmic residue and then cleansing it, uh, is distinctly Jain. And I actually asked Sanderson, so do any Hindu tantra texts follow that order? And he said no. Uh, and it was sort of an interesting moment at SOAS where he was um, trying to uh, say that, oh, no, the change, they just copied everything. But then I said, no, this is different. And then he did say, oh, yes, that is original. So I would say that there's always this a little bit of give and take. And I also wanted to bring out the, the lovely nature of what Venu shared which, uh, and if you noticed in, in my talk, I sort of said a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of Buddhism, a little bit of Tantra. But what Venu put together uh, was we have Kapala, and we know that the Buddha himself was born in Kapala Vastu. We have 500 converts, and we know that the Buddha himself brought 500 people into the state of Nirvana. We have the dance, and again, Kojin, I want to know, when you performed ballet back in the day, how many people went into states of ecstasy, right? And, you know, so much of this really is performative. And what is that? I mean, in the literature of the Sankhikarika, we have to do the dance in order to be free of the dance. And that that illusion uh, within Venu's story was just so jam-packed. And I think that we need to see both these confluences and these distinctions, and that every presentation really pointed in that direction. Thank you, Dr. Chapel. Really uh, filled in a lot of the blanks there, kind of brought uh, a good answer to that question, I think. Um, uh, I believe Dr. Howard uh, has to uh, leave soon. Actually, it turns out the next question is for Dr. Howard and her brilliant presentation on Srimad Raj Chandra. Um, this is from Pratish uh, Muti. Um, and the question is as follows. Uh, Srimad Raj Chandra was trying to practice renunciation as a sansari being. Uh, that is, I suppose, a being in samsara. What is the reason for him to actually want to become an actual monk, which he didn't get permission to become if he was living a life of renunciation already while engaging in daily worldly activities, such as being a family man and being a businessman? I suppose the question is, 
if he was already a renunciate as a householder, why did he want to become a, a, a mendicant? Uh, and it said that he didn't get permission to become. So uh, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, excellent question. So as we know, even though he was practicing renunciation in his worldly life, but it was difficult to, com to completely dedicate yourself when you are being a householder. So he felt that there was something because of business and the family and taking care of um, all that he had householders duties were distracting him a bit from the inner work, the meditation he was doing. So you you see that kind of, um, on the one hand, he could have left, I think. But according to these biographies, they say, no, he could not leave because of his karmic, um, he had to exhaust his karmas. So it's quite fascinating to see that where the choice comes and where does the karma come. So I asked um, one of the um, Samaniji at the, um, you know, at the, um, when I went to see Rakesh Bhaiji, um, and I said, what do you think about that? She said, you can have that view. There are many sidedness of the reality. You can, you can have that view. I said, is it really wrong? I'm going to get in trouble. He says, she says, no, no, no. You are looking from the, the one side and the, the Jain, uh, the renunciates and the practitioners are looking at the other side, but you are not doing anything wrong by bringing that side or, or elevating that side of karma yogi. So he didn't need to, uh, whether or not he needed to, but you see there's a struggle in him. So he will leave for months at a time, his business, his family life, and meditate. He'll go to retreats, and then he'll come back. Even Gandhi notes that, that he was, um, he will be dealing uh, uh, some kind of uh, diamond trade or some kind of precious gems. And somebody will try to haggle with him or say he had one prize. Imagine that in India having one prize, never, right? And he had just one prize. This is it, very honest. And if somebody questioned that, in Gandhi's words, his eyebrows will rise up and he will, you can show, he will show anger on his face. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, I guess he's not completely <laughs> above all the passions and anger and all that because he is in the world. So I think that is the whole idea. The King Janaka in Hindu uh, mythology or in the Ramayana, he detaches himself completely and he's Videha, right? He's called Videhi. And there are comparisons um, in the biographies uh, with Janaka and Shimadra Chandra. So why did he need to go? I think he didn't need to go, but the, the biographies make it that he was struggling in his mind. So there is a way to read uh, whatever we have sources on him. And I think that one of the most uh, articulate, um, the resource we have is Gandhi himself, who is seeing him, talking with him, corresponding. And then of course his letters, and they don't talk about as much about the path of karma yoga. He, he showed to live a life, but the term karma yoga does not appear. Yeah, great answer, uh, Dr. Howard. Thank you. I, I'm also a scholar on Srimad Raj Chandra. I'm writing a book on his life and his teachings right now. Um, I could uh, just add one little thing, too, to that. Uh, it was an excellent answer from Dr. Howard. But also you can see that in uh, Srimad's writings, he actually critiques the mendicant establishment. Um, in his opinion, a lot of the mendicants are not qualified to be mendicants because they haven't hit the appropriate gunasthana like fifth gunastana. And so in his mind, you would have to be at that very, very, very high level, which nobody was of Simak uh, uh, Drishti uh, before you could actually even become a mendicant. So he very forcefully critiqued the mendicant establishment. Um, so in that sense, it seems like it would be a little strange for him to actually become uh, a mendicant from the establishment that he uh, so uh, strongly critiqued. And it's also questionable whether he would have you know, received that, especially after his main disciple, Laluji, um, left the mendicant order to become Srimad's, uh, to become, he left his mendicant guru to become the disciple of a lay guru of, of Srimad Rajshan. So there's definitely a lot of complexity there in his relationship to the traditional monastic order. I tend to think of Srimad's movement is, um, and, and I, I think a lot of people wouldn't like that 
uh, term because they're explicitly non-sectarian. But I think one of the characteristics of that is sort of um, a very orthodox approach to Jain teachings. But at the same time, when it comes to this sort of point of mendicant authority, there's a bit of suspicion that creates a little bit of tension, I think, between the mainstream Jain mendicant community and uh, the Srimad movement. So uh, those are just some of my, 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 my impressions on that as well. Um, OK, so if I could uh, move on. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, for uh, so many, uh, please compare. Oh, so I suppose this is uh, um, some many. Uh, Pratibha Pragya. Okay, this question is, it doesn't say who it's from. Oh, yeah. Uh, Nehal Mansali. Okay, please compare and correlate Kayot Sarga to the four types of dhyana, Artha, Raudra, Dharma, Shukla. Of special interest to me is that Mahavira clearly delineated Kayot Sarga and dhyana. Um, so, is there um, something you can say about the uh, relationship, Samaniji, to um, the four types of uh, dhyana? Uh, Kujin. Yes. Sorry, I missed. Can you brief because uh, today I'm traveling. So, the, can you brief in like what was the question? Uh, um, the question is if there's a correlation between Kayot Sarga and the uh, traditional four types of dhyana, Artha, Artha, Raudra, Dharma, and Shukla. How does uh, Kayot Sarga relate to that? Look, uh, Artha and Rudra, these are two psychological states and I can say in the modern language, negative states of the mind. So, which are uh, unfortunately included in meditation as a way of, I think, concentration only. So, it's a kind of negative concentration. But as you know, in the 12th century, Hemchandra Acharya, he excluded from the list of meditation dharma and shukla. So dharma dhyan is mostly a part of swadhyay, sadhyaya meva jhanam, uh, means swadhyay, uh, swadhyay itself is meditation. So here uh, a state of contemplation and bhavana falling under it and also um, vachana, prichana, parivartana, all these are the asking the questions, answering the question, repeating the text, de even delivering the discourse one cannot do without concentration. Therefore, it is a part of meditation. And Dharma Dhyan, then we move to the Sukla Dhyan, which is again uh, leading towards the liberating state, but it it also coming very close to the four types of uh, Asamprajat Samadhi and uh, also the four meditation, four jhana of the Buddhist. So they have some commonality and also Patanjali Yoga Sutras Samadhi also have the some commonality with the Shukla Dhyan. But while we're talking, so Kayut Sark, uh, is a progressive state and finally uh, it it has connection with the um, the yoga, the three yoga, mani yoga, vachan yoga and ka yoga, the activity of mind, body and speech when came into the standstill situation and also come unto the very focused state and the purest state at the time kayutsarg is a part of shukla dhyana. So kayutsarg is a bodily state but that state is a kind of substratum to bear the Shukla Dhyana, it's as per my understanding. Very nice, very nice articulation. Thank you very much, Samaniji. Okay, um, we are at time right now uh, for lunch. Uh, we have a 30 minute break. Um, I would like to very much, uh, we could do this question and answer. And I'm sorry, not all the questions were uh, addressed, but I do want to keep on schedule uh, as much as possible. Um, so uh, we will now take a 30 minute lunch um, from uh, 1140 to 1210. And then we will begin our next very exciting panel on contemplative practices. Obviously a point of great passion for mine, given the uh, book that I just 
edited and published. <laughs> um, so a uh, 30 minute break, please. And I look forward to seeing you all at uh, 1210 if you can stay. Thank you all very much for a brilliant first half of the conference. That was so enjoyable. Thank you. All right, well, in the interest of keeping a tight schedule, um, I would like to uh, uh, reconvene our conference, Yoga and Jainism Conference, sponsored by our Hanta Institute. Um, I have uh, occasionally, periodically uh, dropped some links in the comments uh, about anybody who might be interested in um, an information session on our master's degree in engaged studies that we're holding in conjunction with Claremont School of Theology uh, about our vegan studies initiative, which is really an innovative cutting edge uh, initiative that's coming up. And then also um, more information in general. So there's three different links that I've been periodically dropping in the uh, comments if anybody would like to um, look closer at that. Um, but for now, I would like to... Um, Turn it over to my good friend, uh, Pragya Jain. Um, and Pragya Jain is a research scholar at Mohanlal Sukadia University in Udaipur, where she is pursuing her PhD on Dhyana, a Jain view with special reference to Shubha Chandra Charya's Nyanarva Nava. She holds two master's degrees. One in Jainology from Jain Vishwa Bharati Institute in London, and another in English literature from the University of Pune. She also has a master's in philosophy in asceticism and Oscar Wilde's short stories. That is quite a range of knowledge. Uh, she is currently working as a research associate at the International School of Jain Studies in Pune and is an assistant editor of the ISJS Transactions and Online Journal. I would also add that she's a brilliant uh, Prockert professor. I had the great honor of doing a three-month uh, Prockert program with her, and I got so much out of it. She's a brilliant, brilliant lecturer. Uh, so she's another person who I'm a huge fan of. So everybody, please uh, welcome Pragya Jain. Thank you so much for this warm welcome. Uh, Om Namah uh, And this is past midnight here in India. So happy Mahavirjanti to all of you. On that note, I'll just share my screen. Okay, so my title is Can AI Meditate? And I would like to explore it uh, into the theory and practice of Jainism, Dharma Dhyana, through Nishche and Vyabhar Nayas. Uh, the first thing that we think about um, AI or uh, artificial intelligence, the first thing that comes to our mind is ChatGPT4. And uh, uh, what it can do, it is just a chat box. We just talk to it. But... Um, a look at this image. Uh, it has a lot of balloons, and you can see a small strings to it. And if you ask it, what would happen if if the strings were cut? The balloons would fly away. Is its answer, and it's not very intelligent if you think. But if you ask it, uh, explain the plot of Cinderella in a sentence where each word has to begin with the next letter in the alphabet from A to Z without repeating any letters, then it would give the output which a human mind will not be able to answer in maybe a lot of time. So it is uh, expanding, but look at this image. Our user-friendly user AI, ChatGPT, Lunch Break AI, all these are getting outdated every day, or rather they are getting upgraded, upgraded day by day. We all know about, we are very much familiar with Siri, Alexa, driverless cars, but have you seen this lady, Iris? She is the first robot teacher in, in Indian school, and uh, this school in Kerala has hired three robots. Uh, to teach uh, its primary level children. So the world is really advancing. Where did it all begin? In 1950, Alan Turing presented, presented this test and he said that if there is one person in one room and in another room there is a person and a computer and the first person is talking to someone in the next room, he should not be able to distinguish between a person and the computer. And surprisingly, Google's uh, language model for uh, dialogue applications and OpenAI's ChatGPT4 have passed this test. 
Also, look at this advancement. This headline, AI chatbots think in English language, even when asked questions in other languages. So they have this drawback yet, but scientists are working on it. But look at the language that they use. Uh, AI may start thinking in other languages soon, otherwise it hallucinates incorrect answers. So the words thinking and hallucination, all these words are giving them a direction to consciousness and to awareness. So it leads us to machine consciousness, artificial consciousness, synthetic consciousness, and uh, uh, you can also call it digital consciousness. You all know about this qualia. It is a subjective quality or property as perceived or experienced by a person, like how red is red. It is very subjective. And they are, scientists are talking about artificial qualia, and they have a lot many things to propose. In short, some scientists are presenting a model that possibly gives rewards the capability of self-consciousness. So it's not just consciousness, they are also talking about self-consciousness. We do not see computers thinking on themselves yet, but you don't know what is in the future. Some scientists, not very long ago, they said that computer is just a slave. So a computer like a washing machine is just a slave operated by its components. But who doesn't know David Chalmers? And he says that conscious computer is possible because any system that implements certain computations is sentient. So the right kinds of computations are sufficient for possessing a conscious mind. Now, what is consciousness? Or oh, This is our cue to differentiate between humans or living beings and non-living things. Being the students of uh, philosophy and being the student of Jainism, we understand that there, uh, there are two different things, two different substances. There is one thing called matter, there is one thing called living being, and these two are different. They have different uh, attributes, characteristics, those those cannot be mingled, right? So uh, what is consciousness and what is meditation? According to the Tvartha Sutra and according to the Tvanushasana, meditation is not just, uh, okay, consciousness may be uh, being aware of something or knowing something, but meditation is not just knowing, it is knowing something continuously. So the definition that we have uh, by the Tvar Sutra is Ekagra Chinta Nirodho Dhyanam, where Ek means one, Agra means object, Chinta means thought, and Nirodh means to stop. So uh, when we stop our thoughts on one object for a long time, for how long, maybe for an intra hour, uh, that is Antar Mahurta, if we stop ourselves, um, then it is meditation. Now we can have any kind of thoughts that object can be anything it can be something that we like something that we dislike something that is uh, coming to our minds uh, consistently that we cannot uh, get rid of or something that we can get rid of something that we get uh, with efforts so uh, that object can be anything but if you have your thoughts stop on something for a long time that is meditation now in Jainism, uh, we just already discussed that there are four kinds of uh, meditation, Artha, Rodra, Dharma, and Shukla. So if you are feeling very, very sad, low, you are having a mournful meditation, or you are actually having uh, Artha Dhyana, or when you are ecstatic, you are feeling very happy, that is Rodra Dhyana. So we do not realize that when we are happy or when we are sad that we are doing any Dhyana, but it is according to Jainism. And when you are feeling very pious, you are doing analytic or pious meditation, Dharma Dhyana, and feeling pure is Shukla Dhyana. Interestingly, the first two cause transmigration and the last two allow liberation. Now, um, to have meditation, we need to have four elements in place. 
It's the meditator, the object, the process, and the result. So in Hindi, they are dhyata, dhyaya, dhyan, and dhyan ka phal. For pious meditation, the meditator should be self should have self restraint. The object should be the reality. The process should be the concentration, the dhyana, and the result should be samvar and nirjara. So if we do not have any of these in place, we are not having pious meditation. Now, these four elements are also kept in the eight limbs of meditation by the Tvanushasan. And the eight limbs are uh, the meditator, object, process, its outcome, and in the place, time, state, and the owner of meditation, according to the Gunasthana. These eight are actually the limbs called by, uh, limbs of meditation called by Muniram Singh in the Tvanushasana. I don't find them anywhere else, but it is there in one text at least. Now, there are two kinds of pious meditation, according to the same text. And the first one is principal, the second is secondary, obviously. The first one is mukhya, or we call it nishchaya, which is only possible for those who are situated in the seventh gunasthana. And the second one is secondary or upchar or vyavahara, which is possible for those who are situated in sixth, fifth or fourth gunasthana. So here we get into the two kinds of pious meditation, which are actually nishchay and vyavahara. Now this vyavahara conventional path, it actually favors liberation. Uh, this vyavahara is also of two kinds, according to Yoga Sar Prabhrita which is written by Yogin Dudev, and it says that if the conventional path is told by the Janas, it will favor liberation and it will refute the first two inauspicious dhyanas. But if this vyavhar or the conventional path is told by other than Janas, they will favor transmigration and they will refute two auspicious dhyanas. So according to Yogsar Prabhrita, if you uh, have a right conduct, for that, you need to win over the passions and senses, then study the self, and then attain liberation. It's a short, short, straightforward way to attain liberation. But according to uh, the Nishchayanaya or the absolute path, it has to be indistinctive and unconventional. It does not refute any other viewpoint. It relies on the self. And it's opposed, supports, obviously, two auspicious dhyanas. And according to it, right conduct is straightforward, study the self. That's all. So, um, why there are two different kinds of viewpoints? What is the necessity? So, the same text says that like a wise doctor diagnoses the patient and treats him accordingly, the acharyas explain the concept according to the requirements of the practitioners. Very simple thing that whichever uh, kind of diagnosis, that uh, whichever kind of meditation you need to indulge in, your teacher, your guru will tell you that you need to do this kind of meditation. That's very straightforward. But which meditation leads to liberation, conventional or absolute? If that is the question, again, the same text by Acharya Amidgati answers that the conduct causes liberation from the con conventional viewpoint, while meditating on the pure soul causes liberation from the absolute viewpoint. So this is the key thing here, that you need to have a balance of both the viewpoints of the absolute and conventional kinds of meditations. So they together cause liberation. So the million dollar concept here is they both go together. There is no chance of attaining liberation by only any one of the viewpoints. So let's see the balance in between the two. From absolute, uh, according to absolute pious meditation, you only need to concentrate on the soul. But from the conventional pious meditation, you need to concentrate on the elements, which is Pindasta Dhyana. You need to concentrate on letters, words, and mantras, which is Padasta Dhyana. 
you need to concentrate on the arihantas which is rupas tithyana and you need to concentrate on the siddhas which is rupati tithyana so these are uh, all there in the text which i am actually working with which is gyanarnava now which out of these is vital so concentration on the soul is more uh, important according to gyanarnava because it says that if you think that the soul is in the body these two words are important the soul and the body so if you think that the soul is in the body this thought takes you back to brood over the body but if you think that the soul is immaterial and knowledge bodied then it makes you find the difference between the two and causes liberation so gyananava uh, has this interesting uh, verse uh, when it talks about shuddhopyog so the corpus of gyananava actually has the balance because it talks about samyak darshana contemplations equanimity and shuddhopyoga from the absolute viewpoint and from the conventional viewpoint it, it talks about major vows control of mind practice of meditation and sansthana metaphysical forms that we just saw interestingly uh, pranayama uh, acharya shubhchandra in gyananav gives a whole chapter of, of more than 100 verses on pranayama and then he says then pranayama causes pain which is the source of artha dhyana and can vitiate a yogi and on shuddhop yoga he says that mind without thought is real and not the mind afflicted with thoughts therefore to attain the reality the mind must be freed of thoughts so uh, he is talking about a uh, conventional meditation most of the times that we think that gyananav is about vyavhara dharma dhyana but actually he is emphasizing on nishchay dharma dhyana as well in many of its verses yoga drishti samuchchay by hari bhatra also supports this or presents and says that in truth one does not approach great uplift within this realm of cross matter how can genuine form be grasped when the eye is clouded so your eyes your vision should not be clouded of thoughts or, or of any a uh, uh, wrong belief otherwise you will not be able to attain the real meditation now what happens in guided meditation camps look at this image uh we have many meditation camps here in india and uh, a very popular one in our circle uh, uh has this image has many images one of which is here you can see that there is Uh, a lotus a yellow colored lotus bright one it has a letter written in between and it has the same letter written in all of its leaves so it will ask you to uh, it will uh, the meditation camps will show you pictures and then will ask you to keep the image in mind and then they will tell you mantras and then they will ask you to repeat them for chanting more pictures more letters more uh, imagination you can see yourself situated on a big bright lotus or you can see there is fire burning inside and then all your karmas are burning in that fire or you can imagine that there is wind and it is blowing away all your karmas so these are there in gyanan never these all are there but these all are images which come towards very end of the text and um this brings me to think that uh thinking or looking at the images is not just what we are supposed to do as humans because we have consciousness and we can meditate because judia pearl she tries to find out how much machines learn so she came up with this ladder of causation and she says that a uh, uh, deep learning machine learning or artificial neural networks are at the lowest rung since they learn by associations 
and statistical correlations like most animals and babies. So if you look at the letter and at the bottom of the letter is a, a robot and an animal which can learn and understand and associate images uh, with thoughts and ideas only by looking at it. But uh, if we also look at images and uh, stop there, then we are still at this rung, but we need to go upwards for that. We need to uh, understand and we need to uh, have that um, nishchay dhyan or uh, absolute dhyan so that we can relate to it uh, with our soul or the self. Bhagaji, uh, uh, two minutes over, if you could find uh, a, a, a stopping point too, but go ahead. So guided meditation has... Uh, uh, all these things, we will just debunk it directly. Guided meditation plays soothing music, but actually sounds are pudgala. It makes you think of something that makes you happy, but things are pudgala. It asks you to take deep breaths, but pranayam is not apt on the path of liberation. It asks you to feel all parts of the body, but body is put color. And it allows your mind to wander off, but a wandering mind does not let you uh, give pay attention on the soul. So, uh, John, as uh, Mr. Bishop says, that no no matter how sophisticated the computation is, there remains an unbridgeable gap between the engineered problem-solving ability of the machine and the general problem-solving ability of man, which is the humanity gap, and that is why AI cannot meditate. I would request you to uh, read this paragraph with me. Um, by This is from the book, The Lotus and the Robot, uh, where Arthur Kosla says that Although the practice of zazen, sitting motionless on the wooden platform of the meditation hall plays the dominant part in monastic routine, zen and meditation somehow do not seem to fit together. It is the practice of a mystic technique without mystic content. If there is no God, no moral law, no doctrine, no teaching, what is there left to meditate about? Except repeating a rose is a rose is a rose as a means of self-hypnosis, Again, proving my point. So here I come to the end of my presentation. So if we have a solution, the most apt adaptation of the perspectives is to know your purpose and implement the correct meaning of the word in the said context. Otherwise, meanings will not get determined from either of the context. So if you are meditation, or meditating for liberation, keep your absolute and conventional pious meditation in check as both must aim to diminish and destroy passions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Pragya. That's a very uh, provocative and fascinating and quite timely uh, topic. It's on a lot of our attentions in all fields of the academy. What are the potential for uh, AI and sentience and meditation? Uh, can we expect AI to attain liberation. <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to next um, introduce our next speaker, uh, Samani Rohini Pragya. Um, and uh, Rohini Pragya Samani is an associate professor at the Department of Nonviolence and Peace Studies at, at Jane Vishwa Bharati Institute. She's been a lecturer at Acharya Kalu Kanya Mahavidyalai. Uh, professor of Jainology and Comparative Philosophy and Religion there since 2004. She's also been a visiting instructor in the Department of Religious Studies at Florida International University. And in addition to that, she is an initiate Jain Samani, which is like a, a nun, uh, for the last 22 years, and is a disciple of the Shvetambara Therapant Guru, His Holiness Acharya Sri Mahashamana Ji. Please welcome Samani Rohini Pragya. So my topic is Sandhi, translated as Jangchen, one of the translations, the Jain Kamankal Contemplative Practice and Transcendental Realization. Sandhi Viditta, I am Sandhi Iti Adakku. These are the few uh, partial versions of Acharan Sutra, the first book of Jain canonical literature, that threw some light on the notion of Sandhi. Jangchar is one of the translations of this term, Sandhi, 
It is known as the meeting point of bone, muscle, and sinews. These are our eight types and are said to be sensitive centers having abundance of vitality. In yogic literature, terms such as juncture, aperture, hole, wheel, lotus, plexus, etc. are used synonymously. Sandhi or the marma, that is translated as psychic centers, are the places in the body as the focal points of meditation. While focusing on sandhi, the mind shifts from the external stimuli received by sensory organs to various levels of internal awareness. The present paper is an endeavor to bring to light sandhi as an ancient Jain contemplative practice for transcendental realization. And I would suggest that terms such as intuition or insight are used in modern jargon for such realization. Before de dwelling into Jain concept, I would like to bring a Hindu mythology. According to Hindu mythology, Hiranyakashyap gained a boon from Brahma due to which he could not be killed during the day or night, inside or outside the house, neither in the sky, nor on land, neither in the heaven or in hell, by any weapon, nor by human, deities, demons, or animals. His terror became intense on this planet because of this boon, and for this, Narsimha, a hybrid form of human come blind, at the junction of day and night, at the threshold of the palace, which was neither inside nor outside, upon the lap and with the claws, finally was met to overcome the terror of Hiranyakasha. The element of Sandhi, that is juncture, here we notice in space, time, body, matter, together brings good by destruction of evil. Thus, mythologically, in pan-Indic tradition, sandhi, that is juncture or transition, implies something supernatural. If we look to the Acharan Sutra, the text, there are varied versions and six versions are available in regard to the notion of sandhi. Sandhi has been used as blemish, that is a, a, an ascetic who undertakes blemish because of some kind of carelessness. Sandhi is used as bone joint, and Sandhi at third place is used as contemplation or intention. And at the fourth version, Sandhi is used as transcendental awakening. And the, as a fifth version of Sandhi, it's, 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 Sandhi is, is explained as a one who has been realized, who is above all kind of parts. And finally, Sandhi has been also implied as a practitioner of practitioner of the path of three jewels. In this paper, the fourth aspect of Sandhi of the above stated six version indicates transcendental realization. One practicing renunciation in search of following absolute nonviolence overcome both violence and non-vigilance gets above the sensual pleasures and passions discover Sandhi, says the Acharam Sutra. Here, Sandhi implies the karmic aperture conducive to the awakening of super sensitive consciousness and B, an organ of the body, which is the plexus, a connecting link with the vigilant interaction. This discovery of Sandhi comes with continued vigilance. The instance of Algai, that is Shival, in the pond fits well for the uh, fits well that obstructs sky view. One inside such a pond Pond must constantly keep moving the hands to view sky as it quickly gets covered. And thus, Sandhi has been viewed as a blemish in first part of Acharam Sutra. So contemplation in Jainism teaches continued vigilance in external samiti and internal gupti activities. Further contemplation and renunciation are the three sides of the same point, and one without the other is in the text Acharan Sutra begins with the inquiry or the contemplative proposition as who am I? Renunciation of I and my consciousness with relations, body and possession constitutes overcoming external sangha. Further, when one breaks the karmic bond associated with passions through vigilance, one overcomes internal sangha. So here internal and external sangha are used in the form of blemish version. Breaking of external and internal sandhi allows perception of juncture conducive to the state of self-realization. Here I am now bringing the aspect of sandhi with transcendental awakening or transcendental realization. 
Well equipped with overcoming relational sanghi, one who perceives this is the present moment of the body, perceives the sensation of pleasure and pain emerging in the body without involving in it. In and through the body, one perceives the psychic center and become vigilant. In the state of perception of the present moment of the body, mind ceases. Intensified perception begins in and through the body. Stabilized mind allows to perceive with the eye of consciousness and discloses an entirely new world. The vigilant one reverses the searchlight of intelligence, mind and life force inward through a secret astral passage, the coiled way of Kundalini in the Kaikogis plexus, and upward through the sacral, the lumbar, the higher dorsal, cervical, and medullary plexus, and the spiritual eye between eyebrows, to reveal finally the presence of consciousness in the highest center, that is Brahmarandra or the Sahasra Chakra in the brain. The state of reflection, division, delusion, illusion, evolving with diverse state of mind vanishes. So, it, uh, so the emphasis on the perception part is uh, is emphasized to bring this kind of transcendental realization, where the perceiver perceives truth, enters into state of equanimity, unity, and the invisible com world comes to realization as consciousness directly meets reality. Transcendental realization does not happen through skills, reading, writing, listening. It happens only by exercising control over senses and mind. The notion of Atmanu Bhuti, Atmanu Bhav, Atma Darshan implies a self-realization. King Parareshi, to admit the notion of soul as expounded by Mahavir asked Kumar Shraman Kishi to show him his self on his palm like a gooseberry placed on a palm. The initial difficulty is in identifying the problem. Soul's invisibility, according to Jainism, is not a problem of senses and mind. Soul manifests at a state of pure consciousness or, is, or at a state of thoughtlessness where senses and mind are subordinated. Thinking and self-knowledge never goes together. A competent mind is not the goal. The goal lies beyond the mind. Transcendental realization happens beyond senses and mind. Thus, suddenly, as a transcendental awakening, dissolve all the form identity and reaches the essence state, which is consciousness. It brings the state of experience apart from thoughtful and mindful state. Now, I would like to bring the notion of Sanghi as transcendental unity. So, bringing a shift from awakening or awareness from realization towards the element of epistemology as available in gene sources. In the opinion of Malishya, the sensitive centers are the part of the body, are the parts of the body dominated by many soul points. Sandhi means plexus. For plexus, it is said that they consist of consciousness and are situated within sensitive centers. As the center of Jala, pond is known as Jalantra. The center of Vana, forest is known as Vanantra. The center of Parvat, the hill is known as Parvatantra. Similarly, the center of the physical body, due to the purity of soul points, is known as Antagat. Undivided self and direct knowledge are the two sides of the same point. Same point. True perception of Sandhi, that is the prime centers of manifestation of consciousness, that is Chakra in Hatha Yoga, the light of transcendental knowledge spreads out of the karmic aperture. In connection with clairvoyance, the word Sandhi has been used as, as a current, sorry for that. As a current, that is efficient cause. So now, uh, now to take a epistemic concern about Sandhi, and this epistemic concern is in a in a transcendental form. Sandhi has been used as a current, as an efficient cause. And here, Sandhi is explained as an organ of the body or or a part of the body through which the clairvoyant knows the object. Any part of the body which becomes current or the psychic center which gets awakened become the reason through which the rays of supersensory knowledge emit out. Transcendental realization turns body into efficient cause. Mind to become competent through such a sudden discovery or intuitive flashes of knowledge. Mind passes through three stages. That is the stages of avadharana, dharana, and dhyana. Of which the first is to pay attention, a process of just paying attention, bringing that alertness. The second step is of dharana in which there is a continued focus state 
And the third one is where, where one transcends the mental aspect and enters into a state of consciousness, where mind ceases and the meditative stages begin there. Mastering these three stages aims to break away from mental illusion and negligence. Nandi Sutra narrates the entire mind training aspect. It discusses four units of such training. First unit consists of Alpagrahi and Bahugrahi. The second of Ekavidagrahi, Bahuvidagrahi. The third with Shipragrahi and Chiragrahi. And fourth one consists of the Anishitagrahi and Nishitagrahi. Of these four units, the former consists of a narrow version, while the later consists of a wider version. In ancient Jain literature, such transcendental powers and mental competences are entitled as labdhis or yoga vibhutis being extraordinary. In Jain primary sources, such powers are explained as limitless and astounding. Sandhi becomes an instrumental cause of transcendental awakening that experiences soul body discrimination on, on one hand and at the same time manifests many other bodily and mental abilities. One such labdhi is known as Sambhinda Shrotoka labdhi. This is a kind of buddhi labdhi, a spiritual, sp supernatural intellectual power. It is attained through maximum annihilation, comes subsidence of auditory sense veiling, veiling, articulate knowledge veiling, and other karma associated with its transformation, which is responsible for the anatomical structure of the main organs, such as head, chest, abdomen, back, and the pairs of arms, thighs, and subordinate organs and fingers as well, and by the dint of which one give response to diverse types of sound. A human being equipped with Sambhina Shrotopalabdi is one who can take cognizance of all the five objects of sense organ through any one part of the body, can distinctly cognizance the diverse sounds produced simultaneously by the army of Chakravarti in universal sovereign, which is spread over the region of 12 regions, that is, which is spread in miles, can take cognizance of all the five objects of the sense organ through any one sense organ of the body, or can take the cognizance of all the five objects of the sense organ through principal or the secondary organs of the body, and can distinctly make the sound and can decipher diverse types of sound as well. The contemplative journey in Jainism begins with body, mind, and chitta. Body has the potential to become karna. Mind gets trained as shown in Nandi Sutra's uh, vrittis and becomes competent through various skills of concentration. And finally, chitta moves beyond mind and transforms the consciousness from avarana, vigna, mithya darshan, and saraga chitta. It transforms into anavarana chitta, nirvigna chitta, samyak darshan chitta, and vitarana chitta. The basic function of chitta is not thinking. It functions to experience, wish, feel truth that is uncovered, free of interruption, free of perversity and passion. And in this, uh, in this element of experiences, Jainism strongly admits the annihilation of karmas associated with, with those realizations. If we take a look at the modern psychology and the intuitive experiences of the knowledge that they taught, Immediate experiences in structuralist and gestaltist have different positions. Such experience is viewed in terms of insight and intuition as well. Insight has been explained as a means or an act of apprehending or sensing intuitively the inner nature of something. In standard parallels, it also means any self-awareness, self-knowledge or self-understanding. And it has been bifurcated in two sections as intellectual insight and emotional insight. Further, psychologist talks about situational insight as well. So along with intellectual and emotional insight, it talks of situational or environmentally stimulated insights. The important thing is in all these elements, insight could be defined as a novel, clear, compelling apprehension, apprehension of the truth of something occurring without Overt recourse to memories of past experiences. If we look, if, uh, if we look at understanding the function of intuition, it is nothing but it has two different connotations, which often, which often accompany this term. Intuition is a the process, the the one in which the process is unmediated and somehow mystical, and b 
It is understood as a response to subtle clues and relationships apprehended implicitly and unconsciously. Samaniji, of this, Samaniji, yeah, Samaniji. Yeah, Samaniji. 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 Come to a yeah. The former broadens on the unscientific and is not recommended, and the later hints on the several difficult but fascinating problems in the study of human behavior. This is how experiences, direct experiences, and transcendental experiences are being touched in psychology as well. I would like to conclude thus with the realization of the Sandhi, as explained in Jain canonical literature. Feeling and knowing elements magnify to coordinate with one's conduct. Sometimes this training, this happens with training, and other times it happens in tutoring. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Samaniji. That was uh, absolutely wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed some of those points there and the dialogues with some of the modern psychological theory and everything. Very, very insightful. Thank you. I'm sure there'll be great comments on that. Um, so our next uh, speaker is um, Eileen Godard. And Eileen Godard is a religious studies student at a uh, PhD student that is at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She completed her master's degree in religion at Rutgers University and her BA in philosophy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, Eileen is also the program director of the Winter Hinduism in India Study Abroad program at Rutgers University that takes place in India. Uh, everybody, please welcome Eileen Godard. Great, thank you so much. So thank you very much for having me today. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to present this paper, which connects to my dissertation, to my broader dissertation research that centers around the 16th century Gaudiya Vaishnava Krishna Bhakti tradition. So I'm particularly interested in the variant ways in which raga or desire is specifically utilized as a transformative component within bhakti, tantric, and ascetic traditions. And this paper gives me such a wonderful opportunity to begin exploring this within the Jain context. So with that said, this paper explores the paradoxical rejection and embrace of different topologies of desire or raga in Jain traditions. So Jain traditions broadly categorize some forms of raga as cognitive obstructions that are incompatible with liberation. And other forms of raga, I argue, as contemplative or yogic auxiliaries to liberation. So today I analyze such juxtaposition of different topologies of raga through consideration of the six avashikas, the daily obligations of Jain ascetics. So avashika literature dates to the pre-sectarian period, and the six avashikas are therefore both present in and often quite similarly described in both Shvetambara and Digambara sources. Discussion of the six avashikas takes place, for instance, in the Shvetambara Avashika Sutra, as well as in the Digambara Gambara Mulachara of Vatakera, and in Kunda Kunda's Niyamasada, etc. So general reference to the Avashikas can also be found in Tattvarta Sutra, a text that is authoritative both to Shvetambara and to Digambara Jains. So the, before we go further, the six Avashikas are, one, Samayaka, the cultivation of mental equanimity through contemplation, two, the Chaturvimshati Stava, a hymn of veneration to the 24 jinnas. Three, Vandana, the right of guru veneration. Four, Pratikramana, the right of contemplative introspection and repentance. Five, Pratyakyana, the right of vowing to not act improperly in the future. And six, Kayotsarga, body renouncing meditation. So although the emphasis of these six practices is often depicted as centering around the practice of Pratikramana in particular, these six practices also illustrate the role that desire or raga ideally plays in ascetic daily life. So as these six avashikas illustrate, an ascetic must contemplatively renounce certain types of desires that impede spiritual development while effectively cultivating others that enable spiritual progression. So the two avashikas that best highlight this juxtaposition of desires and which I will therefore predominantly focus my attention on today are the first and second Samayaka and Chaturvimshati Stava. So beginning first with Samayaka, the first avashika or daily obligation. This is a contemplative practice that aims towards producing an enduring state of mental equanimity that pervades the entirety of one's life beyond its ritualized avashika form. So according to the Avashika Sutra, during the ritualized portion of this practice, which typically occurs for 48 minutes, 
a person, for instance, recites the following. And let me switch to the slides. You can see, so you see on the left here, I perform, sir, the rite of equanimity. I abandon all bad activity for the course of my life, threefold by threefold in mind, body, and speech. I will not perform nor cause anybody to perform nor approve anybody performing any bad action. I repent of it. I censure, reject, and abandon myself. So Vatakara further expounds that an ascetic should stand motionless for the duration of this practice, during which time they should suppress all negative and or passionate mental states, and also cultivate a feeling of neutrality towards all living beings. Such ritualized renunciation of problematic cognitive attachment aims to assist practitioners in effectively transcending the karmic grip of egoistic desires that are associated with those thoughts and behaviors that practically obstruct a jiva from attaining liberation. So the attachments that a practitioner renounces in Samayaka illustrate the range of associated desires that are classified as being intrinsically problematic to a practitioner's effective spiritual development. So in terms of specifying exactly what this range of problematic desires and behaviors are, Kunda Kunda, for instance, writes that one must in particular transcend gladness, hasya, fondness or preference, rati, grief, shoka, dislike, arati, disgust, jagupsa, and fear, baya, in order to achieve enduring equanimity. So such depictions of samayaka illustrate that this practice is primarily geared towards effective cognitive elimination, not cultivation. And so now turning to the Chaturvimshati Sabha, the second of Ashika, which by contrast emphasizes the oppositional importance that is placed on specific types of cognitive cultivation. So this hymn emphasizes beneficial mental attachment and the efficacious desires that accompany them, culminating in liberation. So through the recitation of this hymn, an ascetic first venerates and then supplicates the jinnas. The hymn uses the third person imperative voice, the polite, may you give, may you bestow, etc., several times in order to specifically entreat the jinnas to bestow grace, liberation, wisdom, samadhi, and perfection on the practitioner who recites this hymn. So before providing further analysis, I'd like to actually look at this hymn as it is presented in the Avashika Sutra, one of the two key texts that are studied by Shvetambara ascetics prior to Diksha, full ascetic initiation. So I'd like to call your attention in particular to two sections of the hymn at the beginning and end that emphasize these specific components of veneration and supplication. So first, I will glorify the illuminators of the world, the creators of the Dharma Tirtha, the Jinnas, the Arhats, the 24, the enlightened ones. And then we get the list of praise Tarishaba and Ajita, etc. So after the list of names, if you move to the bottom bold section, Thus I have praised the 24, who have discarded dirt and impurity, in whom old age and death have disappeared, the excellent jinnas. May they, the Tirtankaras, be graceful to me. May they, the supreme siddhas of the world, who have been glorified, venerated, and praised, give liberation and supreme wisdom, and the best, highest samadhi. May the perfected ones, purer than the moons, more radiant than the suns, more profound than the ocean, give me perfection. So as scholars, including John Court, and quite recently, Anil Mundra have noted, such hymns present a theological paradox. The jinnas are understood to be entirely desireless and dispassionate. They are vitadaga, meaning without desire. The jinnas therefore remain in a perpetual state of neutrality or samayaka, equanimity, that entails their ongoing eternal non-action. The jinnas therefore remain non-responsive towards practitioners because any positive devotional response that a jinnah might offer to one jiva but not to another would demonstrate preference or fondness, rati, one of the previously mentioned forms of attachment. So, and yet, practitioners nevertheless do actively supplicate the jinnas as is demonstrated in the chapter of Vimshati Stava. So it should be noted that the recitation of this hymn has over time been incorporated into the more robust ritual practice known as Chaitya Vandana, or image veneration. So this expanded and highly embodied practice is performed by both ascetic and lay Shvetambara Murti Pujika Jains towards the temple images or murtis of the jinnas. 
So in addition to also incorporating Patikramana and Kayotsarga, Chaitya Vandana is also modeled on the third Avashaka, Vandana Guru Veneration. So relevantly, Chaitya Vandana also emphasizes practitioners venerating and supplicating the jinnas with a sincere devotional attitude and entreating them, for instance, to, quote, be forever beneficent to us. So a practitioner might also recite the obstacle remover hymn as a part of Chaitya Vandana. This hymn both glorifies Parshvanata and requests that he grant a practitioner, quote, wisdom in birth after birth. So both Court and Mundra have written compelling articles on Jain Bhakti that demonstrate how devotion in Jain tradition both complicates and also reformulates the traditional Indic category of bhakti, which is most generally conceptualized as a relationship between a devotee and a specific form of the divine that is most commonly characterized as being in some fashion reciprocal. So for instance, typically a devotee glorifies the divine and or expresses their sincere love to the divine. And then that deity is often believed to respond in some fashion. So this can take different flavors, but there's some reciprocation. So any potential devotional re relationship between a practitioner and a jinnah, however, must necessarily be to some degree one-sided in light of the previously mentioned vitaraga status of the jinnas and the fact that they do not, in the conventional bhakti sense, actively reciprocate a practitioner's devotion. So both Court and Mundra's discussion of Jain bhakti emphasizes that within the Jain context, devotion primarily serves a very important purificatory function in that a sincere devotional attitude is believed to actively purify a jiva of their existent karma. And this idea of purification can also be seen in the Namukara mantra. And here we're looking at Dr. Miller's translation. So here we see that it is after the act of bowing to or praising these five specific classes of higher beings, arhats, siddhas, acharyas, upadhyayas, and sadhus, that all evil, meaning all karma, is effectively destroyed. So both Court and Mundra's work agrees with the point that Jain Bhakti does not center the relationship between a jiva and a jinna as much as it centers the reflexive purificatory function of devotion, which rids a jiva of existing karma and also prevents new karma from accruing. So my argument today intends to take such points just one step further, highlighting that specific typologies of raga or would actually underlie such cultivation and expression of devotion, veneration, and supplication, and which in fact constitute a necessary ingredient to and typology of contemplative praxis. So as previously discussed, a practitioner both cultivates and expresses their desires for one grace, two liberation, three supreme wisdom, four the highest samadhi, and five perfection through the recitation of the hymn that we looked at, the chapter of Imshati Stava. Such desires importantly aim towards those beings and objects that are situated beyond the realm of mundane existence. Desires towards transcendental objects constitute those specific desires that bear this purificatory power and should therefore be actively and contemplatively cultivated. So such transcendent ragas are practically nurtured during one's daily recitation and repetition of such hymns as the chapter of Imshati Stava. The tandem cultivation and expression of such desires are what then form a practitioner's devotional disposition in juxtaposition to those eliminatory contemplative practices, such as samayaka, that aim to cognitively remove the problematic typologies of raga and their associated mental and physical actions, the types that we see on the right. So further evidence of the role of such transcendental typologies of raga can be found in the Mulachara of Vatakera in this particular excerpt that I've chosen today, which I'll read in entirety. So he writes, previous karma is destroyed by bhakti to the excellent jinnas, and vidyas and mantras are successful through the grace of the acharya. Raga for the arhats, in whom raga has disappeared, and who are without fault. Raga for the dharma, and for the shruta, and raga for the acharyas and shamanas, and the very learned, who are endowed with correct conduct. This is the praiseworthy raga for all who have ragas. 
for those whose aims are successful through bhakti directed towards jinna. That bhakti, even though full of raga, is nevertheless not a worldly desire or nidana. So I've highlighted here the section that I'd like um, you to, I'd like us to focus on. And so such verses and passages, one, effectively acknowledge raga as being a foundational aspect of contemplative practice, and two, separate raga into the two categories of worldly nidana and transcendent, meaning those desires that aim beyond the world. Bhakti, construed here as devotional desire for the jinnas, is specifically named as being the ultimate liberatory typology of desire that, as the first line above shows, both actively destroys karma and also enables other forms of praxis, such as mantra recitation, to actually be effective. So such a passage affirms that while nidana or worldly ragas must be eliminated, a practitioner should actively cultivate transcendental forms of raga. Furthermore, such a practice of cultivating such ragas is in fact integral to one's ongoing contemplative life and also spiritual progression. So moving towards the conclusion of my presentation, I want to close by drawing a quick comparison and noting the way in which such utilization of raga in Jain tradition mirrors the Advaita Vedanta concept of mamuksha, the desire for liberation, as is expounded by the 8th century Chank Shankara Acharya. So in his Upadesha Sahasri, or A Thousand Teachings, for instance, Shankara specifically mentions mamuksha, the desire for liberation, as being a necessary component of one's praxis. Sadhana, according to Shankara, enables liberation by progressively purifying a practitioner, mentally and physically, to the highest possible degree. So as illustration, Shankara writes that the enlightened mental state that immediately precedes liberation can only occur within a mind that has become, quote, pure like a mirror through the performance of four things. One, yama, ethical extension, abstentions, two, niyamas, observances, three, yagya, sacrifices, and four, tapas, austerities. So for Shankara, the progressive removal of ignorance and the simultaneous progressive cultivation of correct perception of the highest truth, in this case for Shankara Brahman, um, through jnana or knowledge, that's going to be the central process of sadhana. So I want to highlight that although Shankara, much like the Jain traditions that I've surveyed today, emphasizes the central importance of austerity and renunciation, Shankara also um, employs the category of transcendent raga, here called mamuksha, as a unique typology of subtle mental cultivation that is, one, necessary, two, purificatory, and three, is ultimately liberatory. So we have now seen some evidence across Jain and quite briefly Vedantic sources that raga can and does play an integral contemplative role in the progression of sadhana towards liberation. So, however, according to both Jain and the brief foray into Vedantic traditions, at the preeminent point of liberation, all ragas, even the transcendental typology, must themselves be wholly transcended in order for a jiva to finally be freed from all typologies of attachment and be liberated. So, as a concluding quote, I'd like to reference the way in which Jain philosopher Hari Suri analogizes the jinnas to a fire that remains neutral and yet provides the warmth of liberation to worshippers. And um, so this is an excerpt from a much longer section of several pairs of couplets, but I'll read this excerpt in its entirety. So he writes, even as fire does not become angry or lustful or call out people or call out when people are afflicted with cold, still those who betake themselves to the fire enjoy what they seek. In the same way, people who betake themselves with devotion to the Tirtankaras, who have power over things in the three worlds, attain safety, having forsaken the frigidity of existence. That is to say, that even if the jinnas do not bestow grace due to being devoid of lust and so on, devotees who make a wish oriented towards those inconceivable wish-fulfilling jewels still consequently acquire the desired fruit by purifying their inner sense. So this quote emphasizes the way in which the fire of devotion, or devotional desire specifically, is what effectively and reflexively to oneself purifies that one who contemplatively cultivates it, 
without any need for potential reciprocation. So I will conclude my remarks there for today, but I do certainly hope that future research will allow me to probe this topic um, even further. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Hey, wow, thank you for such a compelling and well-researched um, uh, presentation, Eileen. That was, that was absolutely brilliant. And it's also very nice that it is a perfect sort of segue piece to our next section. So that was the contemplative practices section, and now we're segueing into the comparative uh, Jane Yoga Studies section. But obviously, Eileen had a great deal of uh, comparative um, material there as well, too. In particular, uh, Gaudiya Vaishnav, uh, Adi Shankara, Jane, all on this point of Raga that really seems to problematize uh, Shramana norms. So that's that's really nice, um, Eileen. And actually, your piece does a nice segue to my own bio, because I'm presenting next. I'll read my own bio. Um, I'm an assistant professor in Sanskrit and Jane studies at Arihanta Institute. Uh, and I'm a visiting uh, assistant professor at Claremont School of Theology, where we collaborate between Arihanta uh, with uh, graduate programs in Jane studies. Um, I should also mention that I have a monograph coming out within the next month or two about uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava of psychology of emotions, which deals with Ragatmika and Raganuga Bhakti that uh, Eileen was very much alluding to. Um, and I'm also uh, doing uh, writing a book right now on Srimad Raj Chandra's Bhakti Marg as well, too, where I see a lot of that same sort of language uh, happening in, in that work. Uh, but in addition to that, I'm working on another book with Parvin Jain that we're co-authoring on uh, Jain Mantra and um, Jain Mantra and Th Jain Theory of Language. Uh, based on the teachings of Charis Sushil Kumar. And then, of course, I have another book coming out uh, on engaged Jane studies. A lot of people here, Christopher Miller and I are co-authoring it. We have a lot of people here who are uh, on that. And then also, the last thing I would say is this contemplative volume that we have right here. We dealt quite a bit with um, many of the authors discussed Jane Bhakti quite a bit in there as well, too. So um, that's a nice resource that sort of dovetails with some of the things that um, Eileen was speaking about. Okay, so without any further delay, I'm also uh, not very good at timekeeping and presenting at the same time. So if in 20 minutes uh, I'm still talking, if somebody wants to give me a gentle nudge, I would appreciate that. Um, but if not, I will keep an eye on my clock. It's right above my desk. I can see it. Um, I got okay. Cogent. All right. Thank you very much. I believe that was uh, Dr. Long who just chimed in, right? Okay. Thank you. Everybody can see my screen. Okay, so um, we are now in the interfaith uh, Jain yoga portion of this conference, and um, I'm trying something quite ambitious. I'm comparing yoga systems between uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutra, Hardy Bhadra, and Hema Chandra. And actually, two texts would be too easy. I'm going to try to do that with four different texts. And then I'm going to frame it all for my next act um, in terms of interfaith dialogue. Um, which is a, a point of interest to me because I'm very interested in this uh, point about Jain intellectual ahimsa um, and the potential for Jain, uh, Jain philosophy in general to create uh, goodwill, interfaith goodwill. You know, we, I do eco-theology and such as well. But this point about nonviolent communication and interfaith dialogue is something that I keep coming back to, which is really prevalent in the uh, Jain yoga text. So the way that I've been framing this is, uh, you know, there's four or five different steps to interfaith peace building. And you can think about the analogy as how you talk to people you disagree with, right? You don't just tell them they're wrong, there's no value to their perspective, right? You, I mean, if you want to be polite, you, you say, you try to find as much value as their pers in their perspective as you can, right? That creates goodwill. Um, and when you're present, when you're, when, before you uh, respond to their argument, you want to make sure you understand it. So before you tell somebody they're wrong, maybe you should say, hey, if I understand you correctly, this is what you believe. And only after they say, yes, that's true, that is what I believe, only then would you respond. And in your response, you shouldn't compromise your own beliefs. You should be able to note points where you disagree. But once you value their uh, position and you show that you understand it, it shouldn't really create uh, conflict. And another thing that goes a long way is humility, right? You know, I feel like I disagree with you. But I'm going to admit that I don't know everything. I have a limited perspective on reality. So for whatever my disagreement is worth, this is what I, I, I believe in contrast to yours. Okay. So these are just various different uh, ways that we can talk in interfaith peace building. And I find multiple different Jane texts illustrate examples of this. 
uh, affording the maximum valuation to dialogical partners by sharing uh, heuristic frameworks. There's very similar structures between Jain yoga texts and Buddhist and Hindu yoga texts. There's sh uh, shared uh, terminology. That's a way of saying that we value you know, a lot of what this perspective has to offer, so much so that we will use a similar framework, right? Um, and then also the Jain yoga texts are quick to show where they disagree and they don't compromise their fundamental positions. They always come back to like the basic teachings of the Tadvartha Sutra, you know, Gunastanas, you know, Jain non-negotiables. And then also this is a little bit more complicated. And I'm sorry, I'm writing a book on Jain yoga and pragmatism and interfaith dialogues. This is the topic of my book, uh, another book. Uh, sorry, it's been a busy year. <laughs> um, and this is the idea that, you know, there's layers, layers of epistemology where your knowledge becomes more and more reliable. And this operates in a pragmatic sort of gradation. And that you, where you're at right now, um, uh, the more, the more, the more you progress spiritually, the more you're going to be able to understand. So that helps you um, acknowledge your own limitations. Okay. So let's talk about the history of yoga is spiritual in the Jain Dharma tradition. I'm still surprised nobody's mentioned this in the talk in the lecture so far, probably because it's very commonly known. But obviously the term yoga did, was not always a good word in um, the Jain tradition. In the early sources, uh, the Jain used the term yoga. Yoga just means union. So, you know, the Tadvartha Sutra, for example, means the union of the soul with karma, which is not necessarily a good thing, right? Um, but the yoga movement itself in early India is really part of the Shramana movement the more movement away from ascetic and renouncing desire and that sort of thing. So those elements of the Shramana yoga sort of movement have always been there in the Jain tradition, even though they didn't use the term yoga in the early texts to refer to it, right? And since Jain Dharma is a quintessential Shramana tradition, then its practices can very easily be referred to as yoga because other traditions were doing that as well, too. And we can see the characteristic emphasis on tapas, dhyana, vratas, kyotsarga. You know, uh, we saw some wonderful presentations and discussions on kyotsarga and how it, you know, very similar to other yoga embodied traditions as well. Okay, so um, the term yoga does start to get used in the spiritual sense as like spiritual discipline or something like that and uh, multiple different works. Um, the two that I'm going to focus on are Hari Bhajra and Hamachandra here, and uh, pretty much uh, three of those four, three of those texts that are listed there, but that will all unfold. Okay, so the interfaith element of this is to um, talk about uh, yoga in dialogue with the uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutra. Now this, if you mention, remember from my uh, first slide, this is part of valuing the, uh, the shared structures between the uh, the Hindu Yoga Sutra and the uh, structures that come in Jain texts, that sort of shared structure pro uh, provides a basis to be able to value your dialogical partner who you with whom you disagree, i.e. Hindu Yoga and Jain Yoga. And one of those points, there's a lot of different structures that we can look at, but the one that I'm really going to focus in today, it's also nice that this is a point that came up uh, with some of the other lectures, this Pravrati Nirvirti uh, uh, dialectic. And a lot of times when people talk about that, they mean like poverty is like the dharma that you do in the world. The nivrti is the things that you renounce and you don't do, right? And it tends to have like sort of a very external connotation. But that's actually not really as much the case in the yoga texts. It tends to imply something much more um, psychological. And if you think about what this is, this also goes with the grade eight itself that we've seen in multiple presentations. So the way this basically works with the yoga meditation is you poverty, you engage with one uh, meditative object that's somewhat external, right? And in the process, you concentrate the mind and that allows you to nivrti, to withdraw from that level of exteriority to a deeper level interiority where you then engage the mind retract, engage the mind, retract, and eventually you realize your swarupa, your, uh, your chitti that is your, your consciousness, right? Your, your conscious soul in essence, okay? And so we see this in the, um, uh, the Yoga Sutra, this dialect and this process being described between poverty engagement, never to withdraw into increasing levels of of interiority. Uh, so the one poverty element we see very explicitly in Yoga Sutra 135. And then the very fact that yoga is defined as nirodha, as like a cessation, that's a sort of 
property or neverty par excellence there. Okay. And then we have uh, multiple different uh, places here when we're defining how we uh, nirgoda, how we stop the churning of our mind. Uh, vritti I look at is a sort of centrif centrifugal orientation of the consciousness that uh, resides within the soul. That's what vritti is, right? Because it, it comes from vr, right? To uh, vr, it's the um, to turn, right? So centrifugal force of pulling your consciousness externally, right? And the way we uh, stop that, the way we nirodha that, is by a dialectical process of abhyasa and vairagya. Abhyasa is practice, vairagya is um, renunciation. But if you notice there, it's uh, engagement and withdrawal, right? Abhyasa is engagement, vairagya is withdrawal, okay? So that's how that, that dialectic between engagement and withdrawal is right there at the heart of how we achieve Nirodha as per um, Yoga Sutra um, 112, okay? And then we also see a similar dialectic here in Yoga uh, 3 nine. So there's multiple different places where we see that in the Yoga Sutra. Um, and then we also see this gradated self. So that was the property Nirodha dialectic. This gradated self is the Sampragnata Yoga um, that is famous in the um, Yoga Sutra. Uh, Vitartika, Vicharda, Ananda, Asmita. It's four layers of self with each engagement. Vitartika, Sa, Vitartika, Nerd, Vitartika, withdrawal. Sa, Vicharda, Nerd, Vicharda, withdrawal. Ananda, withdrawal. Asmita, withdrawal. And now you're in Svarupam, uh, which is your uh, Chitti Shakti of the Purusha. Okay, so this is the gradated self. Each one of them involves an engagement with each respective layer and then a withdrawal for each respective layer until you uh, realize the Chitti Shakti. Okay, so this is just Yoga 101 in the Yoga, Sitch, um, the yoga Sutra. Now, um, we have this similar idea of a gradated self, and I'm going to point to multiple different examples of this. Um, and uh, the Yoga Sutra, for example, have the external Bahiratma, the internal Antaratma, and then the transcendent materiality Paramatma, which is going to be um, your conscious essence, which also will exhibit this nivrti poverty dialectic, okay? Um, I don't want to go into this too much, but we see this sort of um, negative de definition of yoga in the Tattvartha Sutra, where yoga is basically your karma, your union between your karma and your soul. But we still see this sort of seminal nivrti uh, poverty dialectic happening in the Tattvartha Sutra. So conceptually, it's got a very similar process uh, to the Yoga Sutra in terms of this engagement, withdrawal, engagement, withdrawal. And actually, we see Nivrati is um, being, uh, or excuse me, Nirvoda, the same term that's used in the Yoga Sutra, one, two, uh, is being the process of stopping your karma. So this is not too dissimilar to Yoga Sutra, one, two, this idea of uh, Nirvoda as being a Nivrati element. And then we also have this um, similar thing, uh, Ekagra, Ekagra, or in uh, Yoga Sutra, it's Ekagrata uh, Parinama, Nirodha Parinama, these are the different sort of transformations that you go um, through. Ekagrata in Yoga Sutra is engaging with a meditative object and then withdrawing. So uh, engaging with the meditative object, that's conceptually poverty, and then the withdrawing will be your nivrti. So again, we see this, uh, this dialectic happening in the uh, Tattvartha sutra as well too so there's a lot of different conceptual um ideas there's this also the sort of gradation of the self that we see with the gunastanas as well and so the question here is uh in the tattvartha sutra karma is, is yoga but that seems to shift into karma yoga in the later um jain yoga texts All right, so let's look at uh, Yoga Bindu and see if we can find some of these uh, similarities. Uh, the shared heuristic structure, which becomes a way of maximum valuation between contrasting uh, dialectical schools who disagree, okay? Yoga schools, all right? So we have an eightfold yoga, obviously, in um, Yoga Sutra, Yama Niyama Asana, Pranayama Pratyaharada, Dardana Dhyana Samadhi. There's an eightfold system in the yoga bindu it's kind of similar you know to the, just in the fact that there's eight but they're a little bit different um but there's also in the yoga bindu uh, actual direct citations of some of these same terms that we see in patanjali's yoga sutra some pragnata samadhi the vitartika vicharda ananda smita and then the asam pragnata samadhi which scholars understand differently i think that i'm a little bit different than other people i don't equate it with nirbija uh, samadhi i think some, um, some pragnata uh, represents the near the charda and the um, near 
sort of the Tartika aspects, but that's a different story. It's there in the Yoga Bindu. And then also Dharma Mega Samadhi that we see in Yoga Sutra is very clearly in Yoga Bindu as well. So again, shared lexicon, shared structures is a way of valuing your dialectical partner, right? Um, but then also the Yoga Bindu is very traditional. It's a continuation of all these same aspects that we think of as Tattvartha Sutra 101, Gunasthanas, Three Jewels, all of that sort of stuff is very much there in the Yoga Bindu. Um, so therefore, the Yoga Bindu is valuing the other traditions by employing similar terms in heuristic uh, um, frameworks. And it also uh, underscores the di disagreements as well, too, and has this sort of epistemological gradation. All right. So this is uh, another point that another place that there's a similar uh, structure would be in the Bhavanas. But I'm going to let uh, Alba Rodriguez talk more about that today. She's doing some really, really excellent work on um, the Bhavanas. But just to sort of um, articulate them, the way they're listed in um, and the Yoga Sutra is Maitri Karuna Mudita Upekshana Sukha Dukha Punya Punya Vishayana Bhavanantas Chitta Sa Prasadhanam, right? The Chittasya, excuse me, Chittasya Prasadhanam happens from uh, Maitri, loving kindness, Maitri Karuna, compassion. Mudita is uh, um, a joy, right? Joy for the well being of others. And then Upeksha is uh, equanimity, like Samayita or sam Samatva. Okay? Now, if you know. Is each one of these involves some degree of engagement and uh, poverty, but the fourth one is nivrti, the equ equanimity, the withdrawal altogether. Maitri, love and kindness with others, that's an engagement. Karduna, compassion with others. Uh, Pramoda in the Jain system, right, is uh, happiness for others. Mudita for Patanjali. And then Upeksha, or in the Jain tradition, it's Madhyasta, but they're conceptually the same, is not going to be your nivrti proper. So you still have that sort of Poverty, neverty, dialectic, and the bhavanas uh, there as well. Okay, um, and then the threefold uh, yoga, we can really see the um, poverty elements of the charity thin, thin who's um, who's who's you know uh, one of the uh, the third step of the threefold yoga, where you're very much engaged in various different things rather than uh, withdrawing as much. Okay, now the real place I think where you see this property neverty dialectic is with uh, Hari Bhaja's fivefold yoga in the Yoga Bindu. Okay, and uh, we can see the Adhyatma Yoga, Bhavana Yoga, Dhyana Yoga is having this strong property element, and then the neverty element, Samatha Yoga, you know, the, the Upeksha, similar to Upeksha or Madhyasta, and Samkshaya Vritti Yoga, which is like Yoga Chitta Vritti Niroda. So it's very similar there to uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra as well. And I have different uh, notes on all of these different um, elements and all five of these, but I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, but yeah, I've, I've indicated places within Adhyatma uh, where we see this uh, poverty nirvati dialectic and where we see the Bhavana and Dhyana Yoga as well too. And then how it increasingly starts to get more nirvati as it goes through the other um, levels. Okay, so... I think that concludes my section on Hari Bhadra, but I'm just pointing out that this shared conceptual framework provides a nice basis for interfaith dialogue because it's a way of valuing your dialogical partner, being the partner between Jain yogas and Hindu yoga systems. Okay, so um, Yoga Durdhasti Samuchaya is our next text, and uh, it also has yoga systems of yoga that very much have this poverty nirvati dialectic as well. Okay, so there's a um, a pre yoga system, right? So it's, I call it the threefold or four fold, fourfold yoga. Um, I think I mentioned here that a lot of this, uh, a lot of Chris, Christopher Chapel's work really underscores some of this stuff too. So I highly recommend that. Um, but this uh, pre yoga, this kula or the pravrta chakra yoga very much has the word poverty almost. It's a little different than that. Um, but it really has a sort of engagement with the yamas, uh, engagement with virtuous idea, um, behaviors. So it's got that idea. And then the Itcha, Shastra Yoga, and Samarthya Yoga stages um, will also have that same dialectic. Uh, and those correspond to the Gunasthanas, okay? Um, so then we have a eightfold yoga system and the uh, Yoga Dirthi Samuchaya. Um, and these are all right here as well. And then I highly recommend uh, Christopher Chapel's book, Reconciling Yogas, uh, on this point as well, too. He discusses and talks about all of these yoga drishtis, right? These yoga viewpoints. All right. 
Um, so this eightfold system is very much got this element of poverty mark. We see the word poverty explicitly happening in various different places. Uh, it's part of the engagement with mistruth, asat poverty, vyagata, right? Um, vyagata, I imagine, is from the root han, right, to uh, destroy. And then engaging with the foundations of truth, sat poverty, pada. So we can see this uh, sort of engagement element uh, with this eightfold yoga here as well, too. Um, and then also one is actively engaging in becoming one's soul, right? Uh, so that's the engaged element there. Uh, you're beyond the transcendental um, abode. Is you're, so, so this is really an interesting point that I think is uh, underscored in the Yoga Dishti Samuchaya, which is very different than the Yoga Sutra, and it's a little bit different than the Yoga Shastra and the Yoga Bindu, is that we really seem to have this poverty element being at the highest level of, of spiritual awareness. Because we think of, you know, Kevala um, Jnana as being poverty property. You've completely withdrawn from everything. But the Yoga Bindu does have this sort of engagement, this poverty element that is going on there. And, um, you know, we can speculate why this is, but, um, you know, with the Jain tradition, the soul is part of the Nama. The soul is, uh, is, 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 it's not, it's not um, still and stagnant. It's in a process, right? It's a process theology in that sense. Uh, uh, what um, Padma Rajaya calls a disjunctive dialective rather than a conjunctive dialectic. But it is a, still a process that's going on in the, um, in the soul itself. So we can see that there would be poverty there. Okay. So a lot of interfaith uh, themes in Yoga Dushi Samuchaya. It actually, the whole purpose of the text here, I've got uh, Chapel's work down here. Um, the whole purpose of the text is to dialogue Hindu, Buddhists, and uh, Jains together in a way that finds this sort of shared structures. And Chapel lists a few places where, you know, uh, Hari Bajo's tone is very nice. He's always referring to good actions in a way that's applicable to practitioners of any tradition. When he talks about Shastras, he's not necessarily specific to Jain Shastras, but seems to be open, right, to multiple different schools. And then the text itself is really just drawing this parallel between Ved Vedantins and Buddhists. Uh, and this, of course, is what I consider to be a, a, um, affording the maximum valuation to Buddhists and Hindus. Um, when you're talking about interfaith dialogue and peace building within the Hindu context, usually uh, Rig Veda 164.46 is cited. By my translation, sages have multiple designations for that reality, which is singular. But we have a very parallel statement in the Yoga Dursi Samuchaya, right? That part of the Nirvana is known as Sadashiva. Pardam Brahman, um, Siddhatma, and Tathata. These are Buddhist and Hindu designations, right? Known by those designations, they are just one because they're properly designated by these terms. So you can really see this sort of interfaith uh, spirit here in the Yoga Dirdashti um, Samuchaya. And then there's the idea that all religious traditions have truth within them. They have valid perspectives on the truth is very much in there. There's a caution not to be too arrogant when you're disagreeing with somebody to reject them um, uh, prematurely because our own viewpoints are going to be problematic. That's the epistemological humility uh, that... Um, I was saying, and actually, uh, he points out the sages from all traditions are humble. You know, they're not hostile to other traditions. And so we should follow the examples of Buddhist, Hindu, Jain sages who are humble when they're dealing with disagreement. Um, and so that's where the goodwill uh, comes from as well. And then there's this problematic nature of logic, and you can't really, really know. So he really is saying that truth is one, different traditions see it in different ways, and we should value that. But however, he's not without his polemics. He denounces those who are not within shramana norms, who are mis too worldly and too attached to worldly uh, desire. Standard shramana critique of Vedic ritual and, uh, you know, other critiques of Tantra, Buddhist idea of impermanence, critiques Hindu monism. All of these, you know, he's very quick to find the problem. And that would go with um, um, not compromising one's non-negotiables there and three. But Hari Bhadra uh, Suri is a textbook case of somebody who really, really knows his uh, philosophical opponents very well, which he demonstrates in other texts as well. So uh, Yoga Shastra of um, Hamachandra, I'm not gonna go through this too quick because I believe I'm probably coming close to the end of time. Um, but we have a, a, a sort of corollary to the Ashtanga system of Patanjali, um, where if we were going to like an Ashtanga one, the Yamas, we would see this discussion of that in um, the first part, uh, these, tech, these sutras. The Yamas are not explicitly mentioned. He tends to talk about other, um, like a Vashika type um, 
uh, restrictions instead of the niyamas. And then he had some very early description of a lot of uh, actual physical yoga poses for Patanjali's asana. Now, uh, like we've seen previously uh, with uh, Pragya Jain's, uh, there's a critique of pranayama, like it teaches you how to do it and then says, be careful to do it because you focus too much on your body, which sounded exactly like Pragya Jain's uh, critique as well, too. And then, hey, the, yeah, we're out of time? Uh, yeah, see if we can wrap it up. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so anyway, we see a lot of those same uh, sort of things. Uh, similar things to the last couple of Shtangas uh, seems to be playing on that. And so that's really uh, how that all goes. Um, so anyway, there's contrast with the Yoga Sutra. There's particular Jain elements to it. And uh, there's also a layer of selfhood that I've also noted there too. So uh, that should probably do it. Um, so anyway, the, the the moral of the story is that this is a really good way to uh, look at Jain interfaith dialogue, where yoga itself is a form of interfaith engagement. And one that in, lends itself to interfaith goodwill and peace building, particularly with the way um, Hamachandra and um, uh, Haribhadra are, are presented presenting it. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you, Steve Vos, for uh, stopping me in time before I talk for the rest of the conference. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, now I'm putting on my moderator hat <laughs> and I will introduce our next speaker. All right. So uh, actually, I mentioned her in uh, my talk. Uh, this is Alba Rodriguez, and she's going to present on the Bhavanas, which you know I did. I showed this uh, shared framework between yoga schools. Uh, Alba Rodriguez is a PhD student in the Department for the Study of Religion at the University of California, Riverside. She completed a master's degree in yoga studies at LMU in California, and her research focuses on South Asian philosophical and religious traditions with a main focus on Jain ethical and meditational practices. Everybody, please welcome Alba Rodriguez. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So hi, everybody. First of all, I have to say I'm very happy to be here with all of you today and to see uh, advisors, mentors, colleagues, and friends here. Thanks for the organizers to put all of us together. And yeah, I look forward to hearing your thoughts at the end and your questions because I still, I'm still i still working on this project. So let me share my screen and we get started. Um, so most of my presentation comes from a chapter that I wrote for the book in Engage Jainism uh, that Dr. Miller and Dr. Bohanek are editing, as you already uh, mentioned before. It is, in fact, a summary of that chapter. Um, but first of all, what do I mean by the four bhavanas? Well, Dr. Bohanek already introduced them to us, but I will briefly um, repeat the main ideas. So these four bhavanas refer to the cultivation of uh, bhavana, of benevolence, maitri, sympathetic joy, pramoda, compassion, karunya, and equanimity, madhyasya. As I will show today, these four practices seem to have had a relevant place in Jain religiosity. We do not find the term for bhavanas per se in the Tarvarta Sutra or earlier Jain texts, as far as I know, but some later Jain authors do refer to them as the four bhavanas. And that is why I am, I am using this as a title today. As part of Jain praxis, these four bhavanas or cultivations seem to have been used by Jains to lead a life of minimal harm. And as many of you might know, they have similar counterparts in other South Asian religions. For example, many Buddhist scholastic texts discuss an almost identical practice, often referred to as the Brahma Viharas. That is the that's why I put this image here. And love for Maitri, the Buddhists often translated as um, this love and kindness. That is the one you see in the in the image: compassion, equanimity, and joy. And there are also references to these four practices in uh, Brahmanical literature. However, scholarship of these practices in the Jain context is very limited. So my chapter explores how the bhavanas are explained in different Jain te textual sources and how they developed in engagement with Buddhist and Brahmanical intellectual environments. 
the chapter includes different interpretations to, of these practices from some of the great philosophers of Jainism, such as Umasvati, Haribata Suri, Hemachandra, and Yasho Vijaya. There, is, there are different ways in which Jains have used the word bhavana throughout history. And in my chapter at the beginning, I do talk a little bit about this. But today, for the sake of time, I will discuss directly some of these texts that include a particular set of of four bhavanas. So I'll start with the Tarvata Sutra. And although they are not called the four bhavanas per se, the four cultivations of benevolence, sympathetic joy, compassion, and equanimity are included in chapter five, which discusses the five vows or Mahabratas. Umasvati writes, benevolence towards all living beings, sympathetic joy at the side of the virtues, Compassion for the afflicted and equanimity towards the unvirtuous are to be trained. The bhavanas are presented as practices for strengthening both the vows of the Jain mendicants and also the vows of Jain householders, and are complementary to other religious observances that are actually mentioned in the same chapter. The location of the four bhavanas in the Tarvata Sutra suggests that these are not independent practices, but instead, they are included in a broad Jain ethical and soteriological framework that gives priority to the vows with the main goal of minimizing harm or himsa. Then uh, I'm going to move on on history. And some uh, other later Jain texts, um, Jain texts written between the centuries indicated in this table. Let me share, share it and I show the table. This will be easier. As Dr. Chabot has explained in detail in his scholarship, and also Dr. Bohane has shared some of the insights of some of these texts just before me. So this, some of these texts are marked by tremendous innovations in Jain philosophical thought. In fact, with all these centuries, it's, I'm aware it's a very broad uh, period of time. So Jain authors reconstructed Jain yoga through comparative um, Yoga through comparative studies with other yoga systems. And as also Dr. Bohane has clarified just before me, uh, most of these authors, they did not use the word yoga to refer to action that causes the influx of karma as understood in, the, in earlier Jain canonical sources. Instead, the authors that we find here, they often use the term yoga to refer in general to religious practices with the main goal of produ producing auspicious karma, punya, or eliminating negative karma, papa. So next, I will consider the bhavanas in three, three Jain yoga texts, the Yoga Bindu, the Yoga Shastra, and the Duatrim, Shak Duatrim Shika. In my chapter, I also include the Yoga Testi Samuchaya, but today I only have 20 minutes, so I decided to leave this one out. And... Um, I have chosen this text as an example because they were all written by Shvetambara authors who appear to be building upon one another's work, but they are also simultaneously engaging with thought found in other known Jain traditions of the times. Of course, there are other authors that also discuss the bhavanas, such as the Digambara Mendic and Shubhachandra from 11th century. And furthermore, non-scholarly Jain writings on this topic are uh, they abound there are so many particularly regarding benevolence and compassion because i limit myself here to only a few Shvetambara yoga texts i am very aware that much more research remains to be done to offer a full genealogy of the four bhavanas that is why i really welcome your feedback and your questions for this chapter and for future work so let's have a look to the first of these texts that i chosen uh, the Yoga Bindu was written in the 6th century by the Jain scholar Harivadra Vyahanka and discusses yoga practices found in different religious traditions, such as worship, ethical training, and meditation. Harivadra presents a fivefold yoga consisting of these four, five parts that Dr. Cohen just um, briefly explained as well. So I'm going to move forward. And the four bhavanas appear at the beginning of the last section of the Yoga Bindu, which offers a recapitulation of different modalities of yoga explained in earlier parts of the text. 
such as uh, mantra recitation or deity worship. And Harry Butter says, one should develop friendliness, my three, toward those who possess goodness, sympathetic joy, pramoda, for those who have superior qualities, compassion, karunya, for those afflicted with pain, and equanimity, madhyastya, towards those who are without knowledge. The distinguished person of this sermon is born. In his detailed analysis uh, by, uh, sorry, in his detailed analysis of other important texts by Hari Bhadra, Dr. Mundra shows that instead of seeking to minimize differences between traditions, Hari Bhadra is mostly concerned with finding reasons to assess those differences, articulating Jain identity in dialogue with other traditions. Here we see how Haribhadra embraces what we can now call the four panning Indic bhavanas while standing firmly in his Jain view. And now that I'm mentioning Dr. Mundra, thank you so much to Dr. Mundra and Dr. Chappell because I'm doing this work in collaboration and guidance with them. So moving on to the next text, I will uh, go to the second one, to the Yoga Shastra that also, also Dr. Bohanek um, just talked about this text to us just now. So in this one, you many of you might be familiar with it. As you all know, the Yoga Shastra is a 12th century Sanskrit text written by Hemachandra, and it's often considered the most comprehensive text for lay Svetambara genes. It also includes different practices under the label of yoga. The four bhavanas are included too, but they are not called bhavanas per se, Hemachandra defines each of them briefly in this way. So he says, in order to reconnect the broken virtuous meditation, one should practice friendliness, friendliness, sorry, maitri, appreci appreciation, pramoda, compassion, and tolerance. So as you, and then he says, these four are like elixirs of life for him. But as you might notice here, this translation is not mine. This is by Quanstrom. So he's using the words, it's slightly different for Pramoda, Quanstron is using appreciation, and for Madhyastya, I'm using equanimity, Quanstron is using tolerance. I think this might be a little bit problematic. But anyway, I wanted to leave this translation because just to remind all of us that study Sanskrit of the complexities of the language. And then he, he goes on, Hemachandra, and starts, he gives a brief definition of, of Maitri. He says, May no one commit evil, may no one suffer, may the entire world be liberated. Such a sentiment is called friendliness. And then he continues with Pramoda. Appreciation is, or Pramoda, is predilection for the virtues of those whose defects have been removed and who sees removed and who sees reality as it is. Then he continues with compassion. The will to remove the conditions of those who are in a miserable condition, tormented, excessively terrified and begging to their life is called compassion. Karunya. And last one, equanimity, he says, that which remains unconditionally neutral towards cruel acts, towards those who blaspheme against the genus and the teachers, and towards those who praise themselves, that is called madhyasya. When a man of great intellect meditates on the self by means of these four practices, even if the continuity of pure meditation is broken, it is reconnected. So as we can see in the Yoga Shastra, the, these four bhavanas are presented as a kind of a way to reconnect or, or uh, to reconnect with higher uh, meditative states. These verses are included in a section of chapter four that discusses the importance of equanimity in meditation preceded by a, a section of, on the difficulties of attaining enlightenment and followed by a section of, on yogic postures. And again, as some of you might be familiar with the context of Yoga Shastra, but le let me just remind briefly that Hema Chandra wrote this text, as well as other texts, for the Shaiva King Kumarapala after his conversion to Jainism. Dandas has explained that the text's main goal was to show the king how to live as a Jain. Nonetheless, the Yoga Shastra still contains influences from the three Trika Shaiva and the Nath traditions. Court points out that the main goal of this attitude was to 
ensure the king's attention to the Jains in a court dominated by the Shaivas. Hemachandra's decision to include the four Bhavanas alongside other Jain teachings in his long treatise indicates his continuous engagement in Jain practices with the Tantric and Shaiva religious sensibilities of his time. He does not elaborate much on them, as I've shown you, but the next author that I'm going to consider does offer more details. So we now turn to Yashuvijaya, again, a few more centuries on time, often regarded as the last great Jain intellectual from the early modern period. Yashuvijaya's thought was very influen influenced by the previous Jain philosophers, especially the Harivadras and Hemachandra. And of course, he was in a new socio-historical religious terrain. He reinterpreted many of the Haribadra's ideas, particularly on yoga. And one of Yashavijaya's texts that includes the four bhavanas is uh, this one, the Dwatram Shaka Shika. This is a text that I've been studying for a while, and as its title indicates, it includes 32 chapters, and each of the chapters includes 32 uh, shlokas. And in this text, the bhavanas are discussed at the beginning of the chapter uh, 11 in verses from 2 to 6. This is just the cover page of the edition that I'm using. And Yashavijaya gives definitions of each bhavana and differentiates four subtypes of each. And I have not seen this subdivision in any other text. So this really caught my attention, and then I decided to write the paper. So let's have a look to these verses. And he says, benevolence, my tree, is considered to be a kindly mental disposition. It is to be practiced gradually towards four kinds of people. One's teachers, one's fellow monks, one's students, and everyone. Then he continues with compassion. Compassion is the desire to to remove suffering. It arises in four different manners. From ignorance, from seeing the suffering of others, from, from the higher wish to overcome the sufferings of samsara, and from one's own nature, with regard to both who are happy and those who are not. This text also has an outro commentary where Yashavijaya expands on some of these ideas. In regard to the verse on compassion that I just read, he says in his auto commentary that the first type of compassion, I can't leave it in the screen, that the first type of compassion arises from ignorance, which means that, for example, one might have the desire to give something that is not wholesome to someone who is unsuitable. And on his lenses, this is kind of not correct. Then the second kind of compassion, according to him, would arise, for example, from seeing someone who is suffering, such as a very poor person, and giving them food, clothes, bed, bedding, or other worldly things. Then the third kind of compassion is the desire to liberate from the suffering of worldly life, even those who are happy and those who are dear to us. And finally, the last type of compassion arises from one's own nature, svabhava, and is directed towards all beings when one understands that everybody suffers to some extent. And then, after compassion, Yashuvijaya continues with uh, the second one, sympathetic joy. He says, sympathetic joy brings contentment. It, it arises in four different circumstances, towards unwholesome worldly pleasures, towards that with true cause, like eating healthy food. He gives this example in the commentary. Towards wholesome beings still bound in sam to samsara, and towards the happiness of all beings. And he continues, last one with Upeksha. Well, this is the one. And about equanimity, he says, due to compassion, considering future consequences, he's uh, referring to karma here, from non attachment and from reflection on reality, one practices equanimity towards the unwholesome, the untimely, the pleasant, and the worthless, respectively, towards everyone. In the auto commentary, Yashubijaya gives interesting details. For example, he mentions that although equanimity is to be kept always, as you can see here at the end, he says, respectively towards everyone. One should not remain indifferent in front of the suffering of others. 
Following these verses, Yashavi Jaya mentions the consequences of practicing the four bhavanas. And he says, from this, there is destruction of sin, strength, good conduct, and eternal knowledge. Similarly, this is indeed the nectar derived from direct experience. The rest of the chapter discusses the process and the results of meditation. Notice that Yashavijaya, in the verses that I show, en engages with Buddhist terminology. So he uses the words Maitri, but then instead of Pramoda that we saw in the Jain text, Yashavijaya uses Mudita, and Mudita is often used in Buddhist texts. Uh, Albaji, Alba, um, uh, you're about three minutes over, so if you could start coming to a... Oh, okay, okay, I'm, I'm finished. Um, then uh, he uses Karuna and he uh, Yashavijaya uses Upeksha instead of uh, Madhyastya, the same as the Buddhist. So in my book chapter, I also discuss briefly the four Pavanas in the Buddhist tradition that uh, they are called Brahma Vihara, the four immeasurables or these different terms you have here. And also in some Brahmanical lit literature, such as Patanjali or Sutra, and also in some of the Upanishads. But I have to limit myself here because of the con constraints. So in conclusion, in the Jain text explored in this chapter, the four bhavanas serve the main purpose of eliminating karma. Compassion and equanimity have received the most attention in scholarship. Equanimity lies at the basis of all Jain meditative practices and religious life. And compassion is considered one of the four main signs of Samya Darshan. Although further studies are necessary to construct a more precise genealogy of these bhavanas and to describe how they are embodied in contemporary times, this preliminary exploration demonstrates how central figures in Jain intellectual history were engaging, at least intellectually, with shared forms of religious praxis in their social historical context. They were trading in ethical values and corresponding techniques that were common to other religious traditions, while nevertheless retaining a commitment to their own distinct liberation. So, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Alba Rodriguez. That was an excellent talk. I'm glad that we have a little dialogue between our two talks. <laughs> okay, for our next uh, talk, I want to say that Dr. Jeffrey Long is a lion in terms of the comparative studies between Hinduism and Jain studies, but he's a very gentle lion. So lion in stature and maybe lion in heart as well, too. Um, it's really a privilege to have uh, Dr. Um, Long here with us today. He's been a, a mentor of mine for a long time. I really appreciate his scholarship. Uh, Dr. Long is a Carl W. Ziegler Professor of Religion, Philosophy, and Asian Studies at Eliz Elizabethan uh, College, where he has taught since receiving his doctoral degree from the University of Chicago Divinity School in the year 2000. He's the author of several books, including the highly acclaimed Jainism, Introducting uh, an introduction in Hinduism in America. Uh, that's another book. Um, sorry, it sounded like the same book. One book is Jainism and Introduction. The second book is Hinduism in America. Excuse me. He also edits the Lexington book series, uh, Explorations in Indic Traditions, Ethical, Philosophical, and Theological. I have an upcoming book in that series as well. Uh, everybody, please welcome uh, the venerable Dr. Jeffrey Long. Thank you for the very kind, very sweet introduction, Coach, and I, I, I appreciate it. Whether I deserve it or not, I don't know, but I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I really like how you've organized the papers because there really is a flow and a conversation. In fact, uh, I was really enjoying Alba's presentation just now, and I noticed that we even use the same photograph of a statue of Yashovidya in our uh, presentation. You're going to see that picture again. Uh, so this, uh, in some ways, picks up where uh, Alba was uh, uh, left off. And there, there are connections with, with uh, your presentation as well, Kojin, because of the interest in interfaith dialogue, which is really uh, quite fundamental to a lot of my work. And uh, with uh, Eileen Goddard's paper uh, earlier uh, as well, because I'm talking about Yashovidya's work in comparison or in conversation with that of a uh, representative of the contemporary Vedanta tradition, uh, Swami Vivekananda. Uh, so I'll start sharing my screen, if that's okay. There's my screen. All right. Uh, let's see. Get my slideshow going. So hopefully you're all now seeing um, my um, 
you know, title page here. Uh, Gen Yoga and Interval Vedanta, a conversation between Yashravijya and Swami Vivekananda. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, I, I know our time is limited. So uh, this is really a very much a, a, a very broad overview of what I'm hoping is going to turn into a much more in-depth project of uh, drawing together uh, some of the themes from uh, these two wonderful minds uh, that I've had the privilege to, to study through the years, uh, through their work. Uh, Yasho Vijayaji from the Jain tradition, Swami Vivekananda from the Vedanta tradition. So what I'm, what I'm hoping to lay out is uh, how some elements of Jain Yoga, as articulated by Mahopadhyaya Yasho Vijaya, uh, and the integral yoga of Swami Vivekananda, how some of these elements can be brought together. Uh, some points of overlap as well as divergence between them will be explored. They're coming from two distinct traditions. Um, but as Kojin was pointing out in his discussion, these are traditions which also share a lot in terms of a foundation of ideas, practices, terminology, and so on. Uh, so we're going to look at those overlaps and those differences and uh, maybe try to think of ways in which these uh, way, forms of practice could inform one another. And I think that sort of comes organically out of the discussion. Uh, the two figures are really not all that terribly far removed in time, uh, relatively speaking, uh, because Yashovidya comes near the end of what we uh, often categorize as the pre-modern phase uh, in Indian philosophy, and Swami Vivekananda is right there in the heart of the uh, emergence of the modern uh, phase. So, Looking first at Mahobhadhyaya Yashovidya, uh, he lived from 1624 to 1688, seems to be the current consensus. A uh, member of the Shvetambara Tapagacha, a very prominent uh, subdivision uh, among the ascetics of the Shvetambara tradition. Uh, after becoming a Jain Muni, uh, he had uh, their famous stories of him traveling to Benares, actually disguised as a Brahmin, uh, to study Navyanyaya. Uh, which he mastered. Uh, he was a brilliant logician uh, and an author of numerous Jain philosophical texts and commentaries, uh, including the Jnanasara, which is the text I've studied most closely, uh, which focuses on ethics and yogic practice. Then we're bringing Yashovidyaji into conversation with Swami Vivekananda, uh, who lived from 1863 to 1902, uh, a founding member of the Ramakrishna order, uh, known most widely as the Swami who brought the philosophy of Vedanta to the West, establishing the first Vedanta Society in New York in 1894. I've had the privilege of speaking there a number of times. It's not the same building, uh, but it's the same institution. It's been in three different buildings since 1894. Uh, it's currently one block from the famous Dakota building where John Lennon lived. So um, yeah, that's where you can locate the Vedanta Society of New York. Um, based on earlier Hindu sources, uh, such as the Bhagavad Gita and the teaching of his own guru, Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda uh, basically theorized, he didn't invent it, but he theorized the concept of the four yogas. And what seems to be his innovation uh, is uh, the idea of four yogas as independent paths to moksha, to liberation. Uh, the concept of the, these yogas, of course, uh, is ancient, but typically what one finds in most Hindu literature is advocacy of one of these with the others seen as preparatory disciplines or purificatory disciplines leading up to the one true yoga. And Vivekananda differs from that. Uh, he says, uh, no, you can just take any of these paths and get there. Uh, so this is really uh, uh, his innovation um, that, that he brings to uh, Hindu philosophy. So turning back to the Jain tradition and to Mahopadhyaya Yashovidya, um, he defines yoga in the following way. This is my translation. Uh, he says, as yoga refers to all practices that are desirable because they're associated with liberation, right? Because their association with liberation makes them desirable, makes them good, commendable practices. Then he divides the practices of yoga into two categories. Um, these two categories actually bear the same names as two of Swami Vivekananda's four yogas, and there are interesting overlaps and connections, but they're not identical. Uh, the uh, categories of yoga are uh, made up of, uh, they, they, they're constituted by five practices. So this is kind of a schematic uh, of uh, the Ganasara's depiction of yoga. So there is, the first category is karma yoga, that is for 
uh, Yashua Vidya Ji, that is yoga that involves the body. So this involves two of the five main elements of yoga, sthana, that is posture. This seems very close to the asana concept of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. And then there is urna, that is the chanting or recitation of prayers or mantras, and specifically the chanting of them aloud, right? You're using the mouth, right? You're using the body to do this. Then there is jnana yoga, which is rooted in knowledge. This is a more, one could say, inwardly focused set of practices. Uh, and they, they pick up where uh, the karma yoga section leaves off. So we ended with urna, the chanting or recitation of prayers and mantras. But then there's on the jnana yoga side, there's artha. There's understanding what these things mean, uh, not simply chanting them mindlessly, but with an awareness of their meaning meaning and a focus on their meaning. Then there is what he calls alambana. This is the visualization of one's deity. Now, the concept of deity, devata, ishta devata, is interesting here. This, of course, connects with uh, earlier presentations as well. I'm thinking about Ingarder's presentation especially. Uh, deity here is, is not talking about a god that is uh, the, the creator of the world. That's absent from the Jain tradition. Uh, and it's, it's really not talking about bhakti in the kind of reciprocal sense that we find in the Hindu tradition, uh, the deities visualized here are the Tirthankaras, right? They're the, the jinnas. And so one visualizes and focuses upon uh, an image, a mental image of one of these enlightened beings. And then there is analambana, which is concentration on the spiritual qualities of that deity. So not simply visualizing them in a physical sense, but concentrating on their own internal qualities, like their wisdom, their compassion, their equanimity, and so on. So you basically see a gradual progression. If we start with sthana or posture and end up with analambana, we're sort of moving more and more inward. Uh, we're using that metaphor of outward and inward. I'm not sure what else to use, uh, but very much focused on the body in terms of sthana. And then something that is not only an, an inward form of concentration, but concentration on what are themselves internal qualities, the qualities of wisdom and compassion. So this is a sort of progression uh, that one sees in these five forms of yoga that uh, Yashua Vijaya describes. So who's eligible to practice yoga, right? This question always looms in uh, Indic traditions, right? Adhikara, right? Who, who can practice? Uh, this is not something that necessarily comes up in the sort of modern democratic West. It's like, well, anybody can practice, right? But no, these practices are seen as something for which one requires some eligibility. Uh, and uh, according to Yashavidya, his eligibility criteria are actually quite broad. He says, if we look at anyone who is detached, right? Anyone who has the characteristic of Bhairagya, uh, then one will find these types of yoga being manifested. You'll find the people who are practicing detachment are doing these five things. In those whom in yoga is not manifested, this is also significant, uh, Yashavidya says it exists in a seed, a bija, uh, a potential state. So what this essentially means is that we can pretty much divide the world into yogis and potential yogis, right? There are people who are yogis and there are people who are not yet yogis. Does this mean then that everyone can potentially attain liberation, right? If yoga is something that is associated with liberation, then if we all have the potential to practice it, does this mean we all have the potential to attain liberation? Now, this is an interesting question in the Jain tradition because there is the category of abhavya, beings who might not attain liberation. And so uh, Yashavijya spends some time reflecting on this. Uh, according to Jain teaching, there are some beings called abhavya who may never attain liberation. They, they don't have bhavya. They don't have the capacity uh, to practice yoga and take the requisite steps to attain liberation. Yoshavidya suggests that all beings have the potential to attain liberation, but not all will necessarily actualize or realize this potential. And so he's basically saying it's up to the beings, right? It's, it's up to us. Do we actualize that potential or do we not? Uh, in another text, uh, the Adhyatma, uh, Adhyatmata Pariksha, uh, he states that, that we should 
in general, assume that beings are going to attain liberation, especially if they inquire as to their possibility of doing so. This is one of the anecdote that uh, P.S. Jaini uh, told um, about um, uh, someone who was listening to a discourse by Yasho Vijaya, uh, and he was talking about the Abhavya concept. And this person, uh, you know, asked, uh, how do I know if I'm going to make it or not, right? How do I know if I'm going to achieve liberation? Maybe I'm one of these Abhavya people. And Yasho Vijaya very kindly says, if you are concerned enough about that to ask that question, then you're not Abhavya. You're going to get liberation. And so uh, to, to be Abhavya, you have to really be completely disinterested from uh, disinterested in and averse to any kind of spiritual practice. My interpretation, at least of Yeshovijya, and, and I want to delve more deeply to confirm whether this is really the case, my sense that he's leaving the door open to the possibility that all beings might attain liberation. But there's always a possibility because we have some measure of freedom, uh, we, we make choices, that there could be beings who just never choose to actualize and activate their potential for liberation. So saying, yes, according to Jain teaching, such beings, uh, such, such a possibility is there. But he seems very much to be on, on, the, on the side of, of wanting to see liberation as something that the maximum number of beings might might reach. And this is an interesting point of connection between him and our next figure with whom I'm bringing him into conversation. According to Swami Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda says the ultimate goal of all mankind, he uses very male language here. It's the 1890s, so I think we can give him a pass. I think if he was speaking today, he would he would talk about human beings. Uh, but the ultimate goal of all mankind, he says, the aim and end of all religions is but one reunion with God or and the emphasis here is mine uh, that I've added to this quote. What amounts to the same with the divinity, which is every man's true nature? So uh, I think what Swami Vivekananda is saying here is something that. Um, many Jains would be quite comfortable with. And uh, again, from Eileen Goddard's presentation, uh, she was drawing a, a connection with uh, the Advaita Vedanta tradition as articulated by Shankara, that when people speak theistically of the personal God, that is a way of visualizing that is a sort of way to what is really the inherent divinity, the, the self, the Paramatman uh, that is within. And so this was Swami Vivekananda's way of thinking, certainly. Uh, so when he uses God language, he really is sort of using a, a language for something that is seen as, as internal. Uh, he says, while the aim is one, the method of attaining may vary with the different temperaments of, of people. Both the goal and the methods employed for it are, are for reaching it are called yoga. So this is his definition of yoga. Uh, so the goal of uh, attaining this ultimate realization, this ultimate reunion with our true self uh, and the means for attaining it. So a word derived from the same Sanskrit root as the English yoke, meaning to join, to join us to our reality, God, right? So this is his definition of yoga. He says there are four basic types of yoga. There is karma yoga, which for Swami Vivekananda has a very particular meaning. It involves selfless service to suffering beings. And this, the, the, the ultimate aim of this is to help us give up our egotism, give up our sense of ego through service. Then there's bhakti yoga, the path of devotion, loving devotion and surrender to a personal form of divinity, to one's ishta devata. This is akin to one's deity in the jnana yoga practice, which is outlined by Yashovijya. Then there is jnana yoga, uh, which according to Swami Vivekananda is very much in the Advaita mold, involves differentiating the unreal from the real, the path of neti neti, I am not this, I am not that, where one realizes one is not the body, the mind, or the ego. And then finally, Raja Yoga, uh, which uh, really is, is what I was originally planning for my presentation, but I realized there's just not time, is a sort of a deep dive into how the Gyanasara and the Raja Yoga involve many elements which correlate with one another. Um, but Raja Yoga involves calming the waves of the mind, much as taught in the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, who can practice yoga. According to Swami Vivekananda, we are, in fact, all doing so. Uh, we are all, all on the path, whether we know it or not. He says the yogas can be discerned to be at the basis of all, all the world's major religions. Uh, I have a paper on this called Religions as Yogas, which sort of uh, explicates what he means by this. 
All the yogas function to diminish the ego, thus allowing one's true divine nature to emerge. And Swami Vivekananda variously refers to this as self-realization or God-realization or just realization. Who can attain liberation? Everyone. All beings will eventually attain realization and therefore liberation. As a result of the fact that everyone's on the path, he says one's attitude toward various religions, schools of thought, and spiritual paths should be one of openness and acceptance. And uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 when uh, Alba was talking about uh, the, the translation of one term as tolerance, uh, I, I saw a connection there because uh, Swami Vivekananda does not like the term tolerance. He actually says it is a form of violence because when we tolerate, we're not actually very happy about what our neighbor is doing. Uh, or believing, uh, but we're letting it happen, meaning we're not killing them, I suppose. I mean, this is what Swami Vivekananda basically says. Uh, I'm fond of putting it this way to my students. I said, if you if you went back to your dorm today and, and your roommate said, I tolerate you, uh, would that make you feel good? And uh, probably not, right? Um, a contemporary scholar uh, in the Ramakrishna tradition uh, of Swami Vivekananda's teaching calls this stance of his toward the various religions uh, his Vedantic cosmopolitanism. And you have the idea that there many paths should flourish and you know let them be, let them coexist. So how do we bring these two figures into conversation? They have some clear differences, but also some clear affinities. Both Yashavidyaji and Swami Vivekananda see divinity as something dwelling within us which can be externalized for the purpose of yogic practice as one's cho chosen deity. So the real divinity is the jiva, according to Jain teaching. It's the Atman, uh, according to Swami Vivekananda, this form of Vedanta. Uh, but in both cases, you can, you can visualize that highest reality. In the case of the of Yashavidya and the Jain tradition, this would be as a Tirtankara, as a Jinnah. Uh, for Swami Vivekananda, it would be whatever... Uh, whatever great teacher or figure uh, or deity inspires you. Uh, both see liberation as stemming from the full realization and manifestation of our inner divinity. That is essentially what liberation is. While they structure the yogic path differently, there are correspondences that can be discerned between the elements of their respective systems. A distinction between the physical or external practice, posture, recitation, and so on, and internal practice, visualization, contemplation of the meaning of recitations, and so on. When you uh, delve into the four yogas, you'll find that similar sets of practices explicated of as what you see in the Anasara. Swami Vivekananda affirms universal liberation, Sarva Muktivada, uh, while Yashovijyaji, in keeping with the Jain, and tradition affirms the possibility that some beings may not experience liberation, but he doesn't dwell at length upon this, and he affirms the universal possibility of liberation. I think this is a significant choice on his part, right? Uh, he does not, in his writings, we don't find the Jain equivalent of a hellfire and damnation sermon that, uh, you know, uh, get your life together or you're not going to get liberation ever. Uh, no, he's not saying that. He's saying, well, liberation, let's assume we're going to get liberation. If we're interested in liberation, that seed is there. And uh, uh, just don't worry about the other people, uh, particularly. Um, both affirm the importance of openness and dialogue across worldviews. Um, this is one of the virtues which, uh, in fact, is listed in the Ganasara, uh, Sarva Nayashraya, having a foundation in all perspectives. Uh, this is something that Yashovijaya uh, emphasizes, that one should look at all forms of knowledge with a stance of equanimity. That is, uh, give all of them a chance and use logic and apply uh, rational uh, you know, skills to determining what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, but not to dismiss anything out of hand before investigating it. This is similar to Swami Vivekananda's cosmopolitanism as well. Uh, he, he does not talk about uh, accepting every tradition in its every respect, right? Uh, this, is, this is a common um, misinterpretation that arises, sometimes because he, sound, he does sound like that in some of his uh, um, lectures. Uh, but the idea that uh, it, it, it's fundamentally a good thing that there are these many perspectives, many views, and that we can learn from all of them. And both of them demonstrated this in their lives through their study of the various traditions 
uh, that they encountered and the incorporation of their knowledge of many traditions into their philosophical works. You can see this with Yashavidya. Of course, he did his deep dive into Navyanyaya, uh, wrote texts on Navyanyaya and employed the Navyanyaya methods in his, his explication of Jain thought. Uh, he also uh, cites texts from outside the Jain tradition, like the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, he uses terminology like Parabrahman and Paramatman when he's talking about the Jiva. So he's he's was quite open to non-Jain traditions and, and to affirming things that he found in them that he agreed with. Swami Vivekananda similarly quotes Christianity, he quotes Buddhism, he draws from a wide array of sources. Um, why are these two figures interesting and why do we want to bring them together? I think they're great role models in today's polarized world. Uh, these are the kinds of minds I think we need more of, uh, you know, broad minded, um, critical, and yet at the same time, uh, open to exploring everything and, uh, not, uh, prejudicially setting any tradition aside um, prior to the investigation. So uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. I think I might have gone a little over time, but uh, thank you for your patience. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Longji. That was brilliant presentation as always. And here's to having good role models uh, within uh, different diverse religious traditions. I think that was a really nice note to end on. Uh, if only more people um, demonstrated those types of virtues. Okay, so we are now uh, transitioning into our very last panel, which is a panel of one. Uh, and uh, this panel will be um, dealing with issues of methodological concerns. Uh, after we've talked a lot about contemplative practices um, and uh, comparative yoga. Uh, so we're going to hear about some methodological concerns um, from Tilo uh, Dietij. Um, I'm going to apologize now uh, for everybody's name who I've watched throughout the conference. I'm so sorry. I know you all very well through emails and online, but I don't really hear everybody's name a lot. So I've known Tilo for several years now, and I don't think I've ever heard his last name pronounced, so please forgive me. Uh, so Tilo uh, Dietich is next. He currently works at the Center for Religious Studies uh, in Germany a university I'm not going to try to say, where he is finalizing his doctoral dissertation and he teaches Sanskrit and Hindi. Important. Uh, he obtained a master's in fine arts from the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Ghent and uh, a master's in Indian languages and cultures also from Ghent. And he's worked as a PhD researcher and lecturer at Ghent University from 2012 until 2018. Um, okay, and everybody, please welcome Tilo Dietic. Uh, then, first of all, thanks so much. It's been a wonderful day. A, bit, uh, a little bit out of time and space, but it's been a very richly filled day. Um, so, thank you very much for bringing us all together. From, from the very beginning, um, I understood that that what I had to offer was a uh, was just two cents of, of of reflections. And meanwhile, perhaps I could say two times two cents. Uh, what I what I described in in the abstract uh, in my proposal had to do with certain ideas about the development of the field of Jain studies since its inception in the West, um, and the role, uh, the appreciation that's been admitted to um, to Jain ritual and devotion. So that's mostly what I described there. Meanwhile, I added to that some reflections on. On what it means to study Jainism, to study contemporary Jainism, or what the characteristics are of contemporary Jainism is, how this is set apart from pre-modern Jainism, and so both both sets of reflections uh, are things that I um, think are important to keep in mind when we describe both contemporary and, and pre-modern Jainism. I'll tell you what what I'm what I'm thinking of. I thought of first taking you back of just a few weeks here to a conference that a few of us attended that everybody knows very well, the Jaina Studies Workshop uh, at SOAS in London, where in this year's edition, uh, just a month ago, um, there was an intermezzo between the academic proceedings. Um, since two years there, there, there's been more of a, as far as I'm concerned, really welcomed uh, contributions, whether in the margins of the conference or um, of, uh, of the Jain communities of London and the UK. And this year, as part of uh, the program they put together, there was a a performance of Preksha Dhyan staged. So we had a 10 minute um, performance display um, of Preksha Dhyan, which at the moment, at that moment for me, struck me as, as rather um, remarkable. 
introspective practices and stages or two things which in, in my very specific culture conditioned minds stand apart. Meanwhile, I have to say I was reading a chapter by Joseph Altman in which he talks about the poor form the uh, the poor the performativity of, of, of yoga, in which he talks about um, Indian yoga shivers courses, where apparently there also was like an audience to the people who were pre- um, 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 practicing yoga. So in that sense, everything has a prehistory already. Why I find it it's somehow a useful introduction to what I want to say is um, the field of Jaina studies or Jaina yoga studies, if we want to call it that, or the field of yoga studies more broadly, definitely is a burgeoning field in the past decades already. And the field of um, contemporary Jaina yoga is similarly burgeoning. And I think we could think that, well, we, we have more attention to yoga. The, the main reason why we have more attention to Jaina yoga probably is because the field of Jaina studies has been widening. So, uh, um, um, dramatically sounds uh, different than what I intend to say, but has been uh, exponentially increasing in the, in the past years only. Um, so we can we can we have the man force or the the the, um, uh, the force to 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 delve upon different aspects of Jainism. But I think the the scholarly attention to Jainism and let's say the, the and to yoga and the Jains' attention to yoga stem from similar sources, namely from from yoga. Well, we could say that it's a practice that that clicks well, that fits well, that sells well in the contemporary world, or actually what I come to and what scholars have argued before, yoga is a, is a product of transnational global um, market economy and consumer markets, uh, etc. So in that sense, um, perhaps the scholarly attention and the chain's attention to yoga both stem from the same source, namely from the fact that yoga is something that works well for contemporary people, perhaps to say it um, in a more neutral way. Our own Samani Pratibha Pragyaji, in a recent chapter, um, very helpfully um, give us an overview of no less than 10 different um, Jain yoga traditions, contemporary yoga traditions, all developed in the past 50 years and um, all, all claiming to have certain uh, pre-modern roots. Uh, but uh, literally last quarter of the 20th, first quarter of the 21st century. And this represents um, an overview of the different Jain denominations, both uh, the Gambar uh, and Shvetambara represented Murti Pujak, a non-icon worshipping Tapagaj, Kartargaj. So um, it's a booming field uh, of Jaina Yoga. The only reason why I uh, have the, the two last ones, the Digambara ones in orange here, is because I've been studying the Digambara tradition on very different aspects in a more somewhat more distant past. So one thing I could have imagined doing uh, for this paper, or which I could imagine uh, doing later on is looking at some of these uh, manuals for Digambara meditation as as you encounter them frequently in bookshops and in temples. Um, reality intervened there. But what I can do is I can take you to just two of the uh, fieldwork sites that I encountered. And again, I was, I was on historical uh, research. So these are just things that in the margins of my fieldwork I observed. But here we are in Hastinapur. In Jambudvip, uh, the Jambudvip complex, so the home of uh, Acharya Gyan Mati Matiji Ganani. Um, and here, what you're looking at, if you can read the entrance board, it says Dhyan Mandir. So here we have an architectural innovation, a completely new structure, uh, this stupa like mount um, meant um, for meditative yoga uh, practices. Um, I don't have documentation from the inside. I have some some memories and, and like um, one iconographic element that that came out more. I remember uh, was certain mandalas, so like tantric elements, which also have their place in traditional temples, but they came more to the fore. The place was not very heavily visited, uh, to say the least, at that time. The reason why, I mean, I, and I was for a bit painting my brain in on on perhaps more. Of these like new infrastructure, new yoga meditation infrastructure that I saw in the in the many places that I visited, but I couldn't come up with many, perhaps because it wasn't my focus. Um, I missed them, but perhaps the reason why just one of the two that I could think of appears in this place is is just because Hastinapur is a place of uh, architectural innovation in general too, with these um, walkable cosmological models. Which themselves relate to this um, this practice of scientization of Jainism of of um, Jains trying to find um, uh, the connection between Jain uh, cosmology and scientific cosmology. So maybe that kind of um, helps to explain why this apparently still very rare 
new um, yoga and meditation infrastructure uh, appear, does appear uh, in this site. The the second site is even more useful for the the arguments I want to make. It's a temple um, perhaps everybody here knows, and that makes it more meaningful that here we also encounter a small um, meditation room. Um, the Lal Kila, uh, right opposite to the Lal Mandir in, in Delhi. So I'm staying with the with the Digambar temples, which which the Digambar tradition, which I know best. Uh, directly opposite to the Red Fort in Delhi, um, and it's I would call it kind of like a, a flagship um, Digambara temple, uh, in the sense that it's one that that the Digambars are often particularly proud of, that they would like represent as a good example or. Um, the first reason for that is its location directly in front of, of, of the Red Fort, which somewhat ironically given um, contemporary Hindu nationalist government is still very much a symbol of of, uh, of the central government. So, the, and I, I do understand that historically there was um, another layer of uh, a bazaar between the Red Fort and the Red Temple. So it, it didn't stand as directly opposite to the, to the Red Fort as it does nowadays, but the proximity itself, especially as it appears now, um, is is a reason I suppose for uh, for the Digambers deeming it an important temple because it stands so close to 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 the temporal to the secular government, um, which we see in other towns also. Um, what other elements we find here on the first the the traditional temple, and I'll come back to the reason why I call that uh, a Jain Darbar, a Jain court here, is on the first floor. But there's three other elements which I would argue all have a similar function in the sense that um, Jainism's focus on Ahimsa is rightly well, deservedly well known, but it's not that we find something like an animal hospital, a bird hospital everywhere, and here it's very much there. Bookshops are perhaps um, more widespread, but it's very prominent um, on Chandani Chok, and that um, reminds me to, to, to mention, I suppose it's a place we've all been and it looks very peaceful here, but we know that it's a, um, a terrible place place in terms of traffic noise and pollution um so it's a very no the temple inside is very noisy also but so the, the bookshop is right there at chandani chok and then as a third element uh, i remember it somehow being behind the office rooms on the ground floor um at that time um, a few years back during my field work uh, a little meditation room had been installed uh, on the ground floor so under the traditional temple and that i remember uh, being visited it was made um somehow artificially they they tried to like mimic uh, a cave structure so the idea was really for a meditation cave inside this temple which is still stands as a, as a symbol for political power so close to the Lal Kila. um and then in the middle of the of Shah Jahan's and and still in a, in a very busy part of the city so i would say that these these three elements the bird hospital the bookshop and the meditation cave perhaps similarly can be seen as actual aspects of Jainism, but perhaps aspects that the Jains, that contemporary Jains nowadays would like um, promote more than they practice or that they very much choose to highlight here, even though, um, and even though the traditional temple, the Jain Darbar, and I'll, turn, I'll turn to that now, is for Jains um, across, let's say, Western and Central India, which just because that's the reason which I know best, but for Jains in general, the the at least for multi Pujak Jains and the Digambaras, the, the majority being temple going, for them, the traditional temple setting is still what the majority of people would be practicing, and maybe for a small minority, um, con these contemporary yoga practices can can come on top of that, but perhaps epistemologically speaking epistemically and rhetorically in their self-representation towards the outside world this uh, Jain, uh yoga practices might um well be blown up a little bit more than they are actually practiced the difference between um the the iconographic the architectural uh, difference between yoga practices and traditional temple practices is very um uh, pregnant with meaning for the the underlying uh, images of self and of power um, and of um, salvific practices also, I would say. So here we are, meanwhile, uh, inside uh, the Lal Kila, the Red Mandir. I mean, it, in one sense, it's a very typical Mughal-style Digambar temple. On the other hand, it is, a, and that's, of course, another reason why they're right, Digambars are, are rightly proud of it. It's a very exquisite and, and uh, highly uh, gilded temple. Um, uh, and I mean, looking at the visuals, we are spared from the traffic noise outside, but I mean, iconographically, 
uh, art historically it's an amazing temple of course um here we are meanwhile uh, in a temple in gwalior and now i want to take you to that aspect of um a traditional jain temple as a court um what we have here this kind of a vedi this kind of an altar where the jina sits on what is, I would say, a bit ambiguously at the same time, it's obvious, of course, the Samavasarana. So the, Jin, the Jina is preaching here. And when we go to the temple, we imagine ourselves uh, to be attending uh, the lecturing of the of the enlightened Jina. But at the same time, the, the whole architecture here reminds us very much of a, of a in this case, also a Mughal era uh, um, court setting. So there, there's a there's an, an ambiguity, there's a metaphoric play there. And of course, here we are in the field of the well-known uh, field of the Jina represented as a king. So we visit the king, we visit the liberated Tirtankara, but we're also kind of like the the, the both the architectural, the iconographic um, elements play with um, royal elements. And I mean these these kinds of elements that we know very well, the the royal um parasols which are still very typically appended above the gambara murtis and um, the the whisk bearers that are uh, in various iconographic ways um here in the pillars of this svedi to the left and the right so these are all very royal um symptoms uh, symbols so what i find interesting in that is that the the underlying model of jain practice here of jain devotional and ritual practice is um let's say a very uneven uh, model of power in the sense that the jina is the king and we are the devotee we are uh, subordinate to the king so our ritual practice the relationship is one very much of the subordinate and that's one element um and i'm running ahead a bit of the way i structured it here but that element um, is one of the things that is very different between um contemporary yoga practices and traditional pre-modern and still very much uh, continued uh, ritual settings in which um, under the influence of, of uh, democratic values, individualism, we now um, seek to discover the eternal soul and the eternal, the, the ultimate reality by using our own bodies and our own minds. So that, I would say, and I'm sure just not me, is, is a very um, characteristic element of contemporary yoga, contemporary Jain and non-Jain yoga, which is very different from uh, pre-modern um, yogas. And while I'm saying this, um, I do refer back to something that Professor Long said, in which he was actually like somehow bringing, making a different argument and bringing Yashu Vijaya and, and Vivekananda and, and similarly saying that um, the individual, the, the psychosomatic uh, um, entity in Yashu Vijaya, perhaps already I, I understood, uh, was seen as it is on a very, very widespread basis nowadays, as the actual meaning, um, the, the actual mean, medium through which we, we reach liberation, which is very different again from that, that temple going model in which we use the murti of the king, who is very different from us as the focus of our also meditative contemplative practices. Apart from that, here I'm I can refer to Andrea Jane's book in, in which she very clearly shows in the way in which yoga is not just influenced, not just conditioned by transnational market economies, but is itself uh, structurally a product um, by those by those global um, socioeconomic structures. Um, there's other elements like the medicalization, um, the, 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 again, the scientificization, which, which underlays um, the discourses and the legitimizations of contemporary yogas. The last two elements that I have here that when Jaina Yoga nowadays also speaks about Priksha Dhyana and other traditions about the enhancement of the self. Um, and I think in uh, uh, Chris Chappell's um, lecture this morning, we also heard elements like the Walt Whitman thing, which spoke about um, bodily beauty. Well, these kinds of things are actually, um, as much as I appreciate it poetically, these are, and again, I think I'm not the first one to argue that, but these are the exact opposite of what pre-modern Jain discourses would say about a, a very dismissive attitude towards the body. Uh, and we've heard that being said elsewhere today about pranayama being something that makes you focus too much on the body, whereas the body is something that should be disregarded altogether. Um, so these are these are like a few differences between pre-modern yoga and contemporary yoga that I think we should not forget about when we study either of both. 
which are fundamental characteristics of contemporary yoga. The second element I thought of uh, and that I thought of first had to do with ritual and devotion in the and the development of the field of Jaina studies in the sense that we come from 19th century Indology where you had statements like Jacobi's here and, and examples like this can, very famous example here, but examples like this can be multiplied where worship, ritual, devotion were very much disregarded uh, by these scholars who were interested in doctrines, in philosophical contents, and that by itself has to do with the development of, of the field of religious studies from a theological background. So the idea was that we can isolate the essence of religious traditions in their doctrines. So it's a very abstract, decontextualized practice. In the last decades, we've of course developed much more and I'm a, I'm a great supporter of these kinds of uh, um, research focuses where, where you understand that it's, it's actually the embodied practices, whether they are original devotional narrative, uh, it's ascetic, um, that it is through these means that Jains become the Jains they are, um, that people do not go to a, a class of philosophy, they go to a temple and they listen to a story and they perform a ritual and they sing a song, and that this is the way that, if you want to call them that, abstract doctrines are actually imbibed and embodied. They are uh, in a certain social, architectural, uh, material context. That's where people learn about their traditions. So this is a development that the, the field of Jaina studies has made in, let's say again, the past 50 years or a bit more also. And that, and that's the, the, the basic point that, uh, that I had in mind first. And I think I'll, I can stop here also. When we now should we now develop an overly stress on Jaina yoga, we might once again lose the, the lose track or uh, uh, lose track of the importance of ritual and devotion and other embodied practices by focusing only on yoga. And that relates to the second element. Yoga is something that, calling it that again, that sells very well, that fits really well the, the contemporary episteme. So in, in that sense, we might be tempted uh, to focus on that. But at the very least, I think we have to keep in mind that Yoga, ritual, devotion, narrative practices are all part of an integrated set of practices, an integrated worldview, and our categories, of course, cut it to pieces in ways that perhaps um, we should heed ourselves of forgetting that these are all very closely related practices. Um, well, I mean, Kojan, is it possible that I'm stopping ahead of time here? But that's basically what I had in mind. Uh, you're sorry, muted, though. sorry, no, I said you're about right. I had you scheduled to 2.40, but we had a five-minute late start. So you're about exactly right, 2.45. Uh, if you want to conclude, sure. if you have anything else, you're free to share that, too. Well, yeah, that's true. I had an, uh, an encore. I, I just wasn't sure about how it relates to, I mean, how it relates to everything else I said. It's just, it's a very different thing, so I can add it. Um, the, the Vipassana teacher, Satya Narayana Gwenka, uh, in his discourses to the 10 day courses of, of Buddhist Theravada uh, meditation that are taught all over the world, in his evening courses, often refers to the Jains and he refers to them in uh, several times in two ways. He says that when I started teaching in India, so many uh, Jains and Jain monks came to my courses and I always wondered who these, 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 uh, these Jain monks were. And then he also says, um, when we started organizing temp, uh, courses in India, then we used to organize them first at rented locations like mosques and schools and Jain temples. So then I wondered who the, um, wh what those Jain temples were. And until a few years back already, I think I encountered, and I don't know the further context, but I encountered this photo of, of, of him probably concluding here, of course, Gwenka is right in the middle there, with students at Ladnun in 1974, a year before uh, Acharya Mahapragya launched his Preksha Dhyan. So we're looking at, at very close historical connections here between Jain and non-Jain yoga. But what I actually find more in, most interesting about this, more than just who borrowed what from who, is the fact that in the case of a Jain, we have Atman, Anatman, the soul and awareness of the soul as like the, the first condition of, of, of entering the Jaina path, or understanding that there is nothing which is uh, eternal and never changing, as in the case of Buddhist Vipassana meditations, you have the exact opposite doctrinal uh, uh, basic statements, but they both have introspective practices which to a larger degree are the same and i'm thinking of was it rohini pragyaji's lecture in which there was like elements maybe somebody else elements of like 
observing the live stream within and i'm like okay this is what in vipassana you observe the bodily sensations but in one case they are interpreted as proof of the constant change of nature and in the other one it's something that leads you towards the eternal soul so it's not related to the rest of the talk but i found it interesting how very similar um physical practices can be used to uh, support supposedly doctrinal um, stances which are diametrically opposed so that was the encore kojan <laughs> thank you brilliant i'm really glad we got that encore too because it really evokes a lot of questions um about the critiques that we have for the modern um, mindfulness movement is decontextualizing and how that uh, becomes its own sort of form of intellectual colonialism. And um, I think that that conversation really needs to happen in uh, modern transnational Jain yoga uh, as well too. So thank you for bringing those uh, wonderful caveats and cautions uh, as well. I'm really glad that we ended uh, the conference with, with your presentation. And uh, I'm sure Steve Vos is sitting over there with so much to say. I mean, I can see him. His brain is just working a thousand miles an hour. Um, and so I'm really pleased that we have Steve Vos here to respond um, to the second half of panels. Uh, just as an introduction, uh, Stephen Vos is a historian of Jain communities in Western India, and he has a PhD in South Asian studies from the University of Pennsylvania. He holds the uh, Bhagwan Suparchva Natha Professorship in Jain Studies at the University of Colorado, Denver, where he is an assistant professor in the Department of History. Um, and he's our respondent again to the second half of paper of today's papers. Uh, so everybody, please welcome uh, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Bose. Yeah, thank you so much, Kojin. Um, wow. Yeah, what a fantastic group of papers. And uh, I, I was sort of like frantically jotting down notes uh, throughout all of them here. And uh, I will say, uh, um, by way of commentary and sort of riffing on what Tillo just uh, nicely said, whenever I hear the phrase Jane Yoga, I usually run screaming. Um, having been involved with Jane's since the late 90s, I have to say that Jane Yoga is a, a rather new direction of uh, sort of studies of Jainism. And so I really appreciated the chance to sit down and, and listen to the papers and, and think about the ways that, um, yeah, this term is being used and deployed, some of the themes that are coming up, some of the really great ways that we're kind of getting back into philological and philosophical scholarship in ways that I actually do find are, are actually informed pretty well by the last um, sort of 20 or 30 years of scholarship that has been largely anthropological. Um, and I really just have to say that Tillo did did a fantastic job um, of sort of summing up a lot of the ways that I have have felt and and thought about like what we think about Jane Yoga and whether or not we're sort of putting too much emphasis on it these days. But um, yeah. So for me, some of the big themes that came up um, in almost all of the papers were kind of a series of dialectics or dualisms. Um, of course, going back to sort of that the very first paper from uh, Pragyad, um, right? Artificial intelligence versus perhaps real intelligence. Uh, but yeah, just now I've been sort of dealing with the the idea of uh, chat GPT sort of taking over my students, you know, brilliance in their assignments. And uh, yeah, all sorts of new ways where we're trying to quiz artificial intelligence things to see if they're going to come up with answers that only a human would come up with, or if they're going to come up with sort of more chat GPT-ish artificial intelligence responses to those things, uh, which makes me think that Blade Runner has indeed just become ne necessary. So thank you for that, uh, Philip K. Dick. Um, all right, but more dualisms, more... Um, things come up, right? So the idea of sort of body and soul, right? We have often, I think, railed in the last 20 or 30 years in the field of religious studies about the great disservice that uh, modern, especially Victorian era scholars did to sort of fetishize the distinction between sort of the external and the internal, the body and the mind, um, right? Sort of the things that really are markers of modern philosophy. Um, and that this is one of the things that when we sort of turn to Jainism, right, we're not going to find sort of that progressive idea of, right, right not 
sort of having these kinds of dialectics or dualisms, right? That the body and the soul rather than the body and the mind are often like the fundamental distinction. And that's right. Jain yoga is sort of a yoga in its goal, right? That the idea is to delink the body and the soul. Um, and then that way, right, we see some more of these kinds of distinctions coming up here. And that the, the idea of uh, that came up in Eileen Goddard's paper of sort of raga to the vitaraga. Um, I really appreciated that and sort of thinking through how bhakti is so much a part of sort of the fundamentals, if you will, of the Jaina Vashikas, the, the sort of the process of what you actually do as a Jain. Right, which I think in this the sort of broader view of this course, we would sort of tend to categorize as Jain yoga, but is actually not a term that in the very moments that we expect to find it, right, we don't find the term yoga. Um, and what we find are other vocabularies and sort of keeping those other vocabularies in frame, right, as we think about what kinds of things count as, as sort of yoga, what kinds of things count as sort of the path of Jainism. We're also coming up with another kind of uh, kind of attention, a dialectic, one that John Court has, of course, identified for us, which is the moksha marg and sort of the path of well-being or sort of the nature of well-being, which is not a sort of separate path in Jainism, but rather an idea that, right, moksha, if we only focus on the sort of the quest for moksha, right, we're going to miss an awful lot about what it means to be Jain. And we're going to make a few assumptions, probably, right, sort of bringing our own kind of Victorian baggage in with us about whether or not devotion counts. Um, so much so that the very framing of the question of, is there even a, a devotional form of Jainism was sort of something that we had to entertain as I think we transitioned into, I'd say, this new era of Jain studies, beginning with Padmanabh Jaini. Um, and that's so much of what John's work was trying to do is to sort of yeah, get us out of those other kind of modernist frames of thinking, um, perhaps do something, I don't know, postmodern, alternately modern or whatever, but things that got us to focus on what those relationships, what those tensions actually mean to each other in a Jain context. And it was in that that I really appreciated Kojin's paper um, that was looking at the pravritti near nivritti uh, distinctions as styles of yoga, um, if you will. Um, and yeah, thinking through those sort of like engagements or sort of active forms, and then the others that are perhaps more sort of, uh, yeah, trying to sort of distance the self from the things that it otherwise is linked with. Um, and so some of the questions that came up for me as I was listening to all of these papers is uh, yoga, right, sort of becomes a convenient term for a twofold devotional and ascetic path, right? The, the distinctions that I often think about are bhakti and tapas, right? And, you know, the things that I tend to think about when it comes to that relationship is, right, do we have sort of one or the other as legitimate paths to being Jain? Right. Tapas, right, seems to be the purview of ascetics. Um, and right there, like if sort of the idealized vision of the ascetic is this figure who sort of divorces him or herself from reality or sort of the, the world of obligations, such as family and marriage and property and title and claims and all of that, um, to go try to write a yoga oneself by means of some sort of disciplinary path, a yoga. Right. And yet, right, what we find in the midst of that is a, a great deal of bhakti, right? Chaitya Vandan, Guru Vandan, right? All of that that's sort of built into how does one cultivate oneself, right? This sort of this virtue ethic kind of path of ascetic work. On the other hand, when we look at lay communities, we find all sorts of glorifications of acts of tapas, right? Right now, we're just in the middle of the Ayambil Oli. So, right, there's all sorts of Jane lay women all over the place who have been eating, you know, sort of fermented gruel and, or non-fermented gruel um, and sort of a squad of foods, right, all week long. And a few men, too, I suppose, uh, while they engage in pratikraman and sort of the communitarian acts of performative uh, tapas that also do the very work that we think of in sort of the Dur Durkheimian phase of the idea of sort of the, the reinforcement of communal values that are kind of built into the performance in a communal space um, of yoga, right, of tapas, that has built into it, right, very much a bhakti kind of notion, right? Like how does one understand 
um, the relationship of bhakti and tapas, both as an ascetic practice and as lay practice, right? Is it merely sort of like, well, the people who have raga, right, ought to do the right kinds of raga, uh, which is one of the things that came up for me. It's like, yeah, so we have this sort of like path progression, a notion that you're sort of stepping your way through these things. Um, and that sort of the ultimately, right, to get to vitaraga, you have to sort of like cultivate the right kind of raga. Okay, well enough. Um, and that's sort of a historical question that we can sort of dig into, like, is the body of Jain literature on this question of Raga something that we can sort of think of as sort of stepped or as right sort of alternate paths? Or is this actually something that's like not a distinction, really? I don't know. Um, as a historian, I really do want us to kind of dig into the moments in which all of these texts are produced, right? Who are they having conversations with? What is going on sort of in their respective moments? And I appreciated the paper that um, looked into Hamachandra Albla's paper. I was thinking about the context in which Hamachandra is speaking to Kumarpal, right? As a Shaiva king who has perhaps recently converted to Jesus or sort of finding himself more and more under the performative sway of doing things that ought to look Jain, like at the very least. Um, and sort of thinking about a textual world in which that literary production about the relationship between Kumarpal and Hemachandra becomes so central to the ways of thinking about sovereignty, of thinking about the proper role of uh, monastics in sort of political spaces of the court. Um, especially when most of that stuff was actually written well after that relationship was sort of in the books of history, right? So most of the relationship of Kumarpal and Hemachandra was actually written during the period of time of the Sultanate um, sort of annexation and sort of rule in Western India, which, you know, we can talk about at another time. So thinking about historically, like getting into figures like Yashuvijay and Vivekananda, um, in Jeff Long's paper, Yashuvijay really sort of, right, he sort of lives well within the entire period of Aurangzeb's reign in the sort of the last of the great four Mughals, um, in a period in which Jain community was sort of alternately both bankrolling, as if you've uh, seen Su uh, Sudev Shait's recent book, Bankrolling Empire, highly recommend it, right? Jains are on one hand bankrolling um, the Mughal Empire, right? And to the tune of sort of massive investments and in jewelry and, and all of these sort of fantastic transfers of wealth going into the Mughal court via other parts of the world. And Jains were the brokers of that. Right. And at the same time, a sort of a new intellectual movement that's going on in which you have Arabic and Persian translations of Yoga Vashista um, and sort of other investments in um, sort of the yoga tradition going on from a courtly project in which Jains were absolutely participating in those things, right? And sort of Audrey Trusky's work in the Mughal period and Jains in the Mughal courts, right? Sort of give us uh, that realm of sort of the intellectual perspective of you know, sort of how do Sanskrit and Persian at worlds speak to one another. So I really like to encourage um, both Alba and Jeff to sort of think about Yashu Vijay as sort of own historical context as such and sort of what it is that he's talking about when he talks about whether that's tolerance or something else. Um, yeah, and similarly, Vivekananda is, is also thinking about a sort of a decolonial moment of sort of trying to at least epistem epistemically decolonize, if you will, um, certain ways of thinking about the traditions that, that he's sort of trying to sort of bring together, right? And as we think about something like the Yoga Sutra Patanjali, there, there's often a lot of conversation about what kind of things is he doing to bring a number of different forms of yoga together together and synthesize them, try to work out sort of what is yoga. I think it with Vivekananda, we're seeing a new, another kind of moment, one that is both informed by sort of European philological ideas about how to approach text, how to think through um, sort of the historicity of the notion of multiple yogas, right? And one in which he, right, Vivekananda is this good sort of a nationalist project in mind, right? He's trying to create a, a kind of Indian citizen or an Indian sensibility um, that is trying to do something right, somewhat differently. And so, right, their ideas as sort of ecumenical or cosmopolitan thinkers is informed by those moments and, and sort of thinking about what each of them is doing in their in their moment, I think, would also be valuable to help us parse sort of what cosmopolitan looks like to each of them. Um, yeah. 
and yeah, and to sort of get back to Tillo's paper, I think one of the great questions that I had for him was sort of the the idea of a disregard for ritual being recapitulated through the idea of Jaina yoga or that Jainism is a yoga. Um, and I really appreciated that perspective. Of course, yeah, uh, being sort of well-trained by anthropologists myself, um, I find a lot of the conversations that I've had with donors over the years is, right, the things that your grandmother taught you how to do to be Jane are actually really valuable. And the more that we fetishize text and the more we sort of think about sort of these deeply individualistic things without recognizing them as sort of part of the neoliberal capitalist global world order, um, that India itself is also trying to deploy in specific ways um, in its own sort of new nationalist moment, right? All of these things, I think, ask us to really be careful about how we sort of use terms and phrases like Jain yoga or think of Jainism as a yoga, perhaps to the detriment of recognizing the what is still actually like the, the real religious life of, I would say, 99% of Jains. So... Yeah, I really appreciated the chance to hear and, and think through with all these papers. And now you just get a chance to sort of, yeah, get, get what's uh, the screeching tires that came out of uh, all of this reflection now. So thank you so much, Kojin, for inviting me to be part of this. And I hope this elicits a, a good conversation for the next session. Oh, I'm sure I'm sure it will. Yeah, these are a very good important, important points. Uh, really keeping in mind the historical moment in which these texts are uh, written before we draw broad inferences about interfaith dialogue, contemplative practices, and that. And then also the caution of not falling back into the endologist sort of fetishization of texts, contemplative practices, the reinforced Protestant assumptions and Protestant needs about the inner light or your own direct connection to God, uh, the sort of suspicious of religious authorities and temples and rituals. Um, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation with Protestant Buddhism, um, you know, approach to that. And I think a similar analogy can be made there. And then also how our current moment of global capitalism is now being shaped by our discourse uh, around yoga and Jain yoga. It's very, very important. Again, I liken that to the, uh, uh, critiques against the, against the mindfulness movement, and at what point are we decontextualizing so much that we're actually committing intellectual colonialism ourselves by redefining a tradition that doesn't match its own self-identity, and then with the hegemony and the power and privilege of being the academy, uh, our redefinition of a tradition will then displace and erase that tradition. And I think uh, keeping your uh, eye on the historical moment and a broader context of yoga is very important. And all of those caveats before we use the term Jain yoga really need to be made and need to be uh, at the foreground. I would also mention that in our contemplative studies uh, book volume that I did with Dr. Rita Sherman and Prudy Shotama Bill Moria, what we did is we were really trying to expand the notion of contemplative studies. There's a certain assumption, Protestant assumption with that as well, too, that values sort of individualist, you know, Western individualism and approach to spirituality and suspicion against religion. So we subtitled it uh, ritual and prayer uh, as well. And so really trying to understand contemplative practices in a South Asian context is not just sitting, closing your eyes and meditating on your the inner voice and connection to the divine, like it would be in a more Protestant context, that really does involve these embodied practices, body, um, bhakti practices, these ritual practices, and that we have to be careful not to de decontextualize. And remember the historical moment, that's my synopsis of uh, Steve Vos's excellent presentation there. Um, I really, really uh, appreciated that, especially the dialogue uh, with Tilo uh, as well. I think that we all benefited quite a bit um, from that last spot. Okay, so um, it is uh, 3 o'clock to 3.30, and it's time to um, open things up for discussions. Um, I do have a, a list of questions that have been asked by our audience members, uh, who I hope are still here if you ask the question. Um, and I think I'd like to kind of prioritize some of those uh, because we haven't heard much from the uh, audience. So um, let me start with one that uh, came from Shankar Iyer, um, who's been a student at ours at um, Ari Hunter for a while. We've all seen him in many of our classes. Um, and this is uh, Shankar's uh, question. And I know Dr. Long already uh, answered this question in the chat, but I thought it was still important enough that we bring it back up and see if we want to sort of 
pass it around a little bit because I thought it was um, uh, provocative. So in the last couple of talks, we have heard how Jains have used shared terminology to afford maximum value, I think he's quoting me there, to other traditions and to understand interlocutors by their own self-definition. I think that sort of resonates with what uh, Steve Ose was just saying too. Assuming that there were rather few Buddhists left in India by Ashoda Vijaya's time, the historical moment, what do you think uh, were his motivations for using Buddhist terminologies in this work? Uh, and then he says, to elaborate a bit more on my question, I've heard that Jain libraries were responsible for preserving a lot of Buddhist literature in India uh, after uh professed Buddhism had waned. Perhaps Yashoda Vijaya's usage of Buddhist terminology is a reflection of that continued story, or more generally, of a respect for an interlocutor, even in that interlocutor's absence. And I guess I would also um, uh, mention uh, Tilo's uh, conversation with how the Buddhists were showing up uh, at the, Buddh I mean, how the Jains were showing up at the Buddhist mindfulness. I know operating in Jain communities, uh, I've often been told that Jain uh, kids, when they go to school, when people ask what religion they are, they say Jain, the answer is what's that? And they say it's like Buddhism. And I've always been like, well, actually, it's kind of not at all like Buddhism, as Tilo mentioned, there's Atman and Anatman. I mean, so um, anyway, uh, does anybody want to uh, mention anything about, I guess, uh, as Steve Vos might call it, the historical moment of Yashoda Vijaya's time uh, and how he is dealing with the uh, Buddhist interlocutors? Um, and I see uh, Jeff Long's uh, hand just went up as well there. Oh, this will be really quick because uh, Anil Mundra also um, uh, wrote this in the chat, and I, I think it's worth uh, underscoring, which is um, a lot of the uh, texts, a lot of Jain texts, and especially uh, Shovijia's, uh, many of his texts are commentaries, in some cases, commentaries on commentaries on commentaries on root texts that were written when Buddhism was still very much there. And so by necessity, they end up elaborating on, uh, you know, arguments with Buddhists. Um, but I think there's a deeper part of your question about that particular historical moment. And so I've already written and said stuff. So I'm going to leave that for others. Yeah. Could reiterate too if you wanted to. Um, okay, does anybody else want to talk about uh, Yashoda Vijaya's um, historical moment and how that relates to Buddhists? Yeah, I can build on that a bit if you want. Yes, so, I'll... yes. Anil, thank you so much for the. Can you read Anil's explanation? Because yeah, as also as um, long just summarized, like these conversations were coming from uh, yeah previous conversations and actually as. I've been studying Yashu Vijaya. Sometimes he's literally he copying from the previous Jain authors. So it's like dialogues and conversations that have been going on. But then uh, if we think about the environment of Yashu Vijaya, as Dr. Vos was explaining, uh, it was a very, for example, he lived for many years in Varanasi and it was a very cosmopolitan environment. And he was kind of living with other thinking, other thinkers, other monks at that time. As, as Dr. Voss also explained, at that moment there were translations projects, uh, tra yeah, translations projects into Arabic, into Persian. Some of the uh, Brahmanical li literature was also being translated, not only the, the Jain literature. So, of course, the moment he was living is very important. This is something I'm going to look further in my dissertation. I've, I've already studied, but not as much as I would like. And then I wanted to add something more about, about, about these questions that uh, have been posted here. So in, in my talk, particularly about this uh, issue of the four bhavanas, so, and also in my chapter, so I was not even feeling comfortable calling them Buddhist or even Jain or, because first of all, if we look to the Sanskrit, the, the, the Sanskrit is Maitri, Mudita, Upeksha, and Karuna. The Buddhist, the Pali, is, met, is slightly different. It's Metta, Mudita, Upeksha, and Karuna. And the Jains, sometimes they change two of them, as I've shown you. So I, 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 I didn't... F yeah, and also in the Upanishads, we find... We, in some more older Upanishads than the... Than, than the Jain text that I was looking, we find also the Sanskrit, the same Sanskrit that the Buddhists were using. So I, when I was reading all this and trying to put it in my chapter, I, I remember some of these uh, important 
reflections that John Cord and also Dundas uh, made in some of some of the most well-known books, and they point us, they remind us that we should think sometimes about these traditions as South Asian, not just. So, so I, I would think that in the particular case of the uh, four bhavanas, I'm calling them the four bhavanas because some of the modern authors, they have used this, but they point, for me, they are pointing out to some maybe share practice that I'm not sure who is borrowing from who at, at this point, maybe later. And if you have something to share, you can tell me, please. And then something else I wanted to say about Yashwi Jaya is that, well, he wrote in four languages, as far as we know, in Sanskrit, Prakrit, Gujarati, and Hindi. So in a sense, for me, I, I do think that this is a, at least some kind of an indicator that he wanted to reach speakers of those languages. But at the same time, uh, I have here some, I was checking some of the, in, in the Brills Encyclopedia of Jainism that was published recently. Uh, there is a chapter by Andrew Moore that he reminds us that we can only speculate. Uh, just let me read two sentences because I, I try to keep these sentences in mind when I'm reading this text, not to decontextualize them or, or, or some something like that. So he, he says, we can only speculate about how the Jains have may have used their text. Perhaps Jain monks recited the stories of gathering of lay Jains. He's talking here about lay Jains as a form of instruction. But I think it also applies to other kind of texts sometimes. And he keeps on saying, it is also unclear how the texts have influenced Jain life throughout the centuries. And then he keeps, he keeps on going. So yeah, for me, it was kind of challenging and I came up with the best conclusions that I could, but I would appreciate further insights. And then the last thing I wanted to say, um, uh, sorry. Okay, and the last thing just is more in regard to the context that I think there is so much to unpack there. Uh, and one of the reasons is because this, yeah, Yashu Vijay wrote in these four languages and most of uh, his texts have not been translated into English. So there is so much that remains to be done. So we have work ahead. Hey, you hear that? Everybody get to work. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Alba. That was a really, really comprehensive and important um, response. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have another question, unless somebody else wants to uh, speak more on that. Okay, I have another question from uh, Rajmani, uh, Chaitanya Prakash. Um, he asks, can you please explain the various components of Jain yoga beyond physical postures? I think he's sort of alluding to some of this decontextualization of modern Jain yoga. Um, will Jain yoga include mantra chanting, music, some spiritual kirtans and song recitations? Uh, so uh, I'm sure pretty much anybody on this panel would be eager to answer that question. Does anybody want to uh, discuss that? I think this really is alluding to the decontextualization that Tilo and uh, Steve were speaking about. So, um, Rajmani, uh, Chaitanya Prakash, if you didn't catch the answer from our last two speakers, uh, it's very problematic to reduce Jain Yoga to physical postures. It's problematic to reduce Jain Yoga to just meditation, even though those may be, may be important aspects of the Jain Yoga tradition. It's important that we don't redefine it in such a way that excludes the traditional Jain Yoga, which very much would have all the practices that you mentioned. Uh, in our book, uh, The Contemplative Studies, we have a lot of uh, social science there that describes the pujas to gurus, uh, their singing, uh, all of that uh, occurs. Uh, Pragya Jain herself, I happen to know, is an excellent singer. Uh, as a Jane. Um, so the kirtans and the singing and the music. Uh, we also heard the uh, the story of Kapila dancing uh, is a is a form of you know becoming a kevalagnani dancing, right? We heard from uh, Venu Metta, uh, which very much you know problematizes a mutually exclusive binary. I think that's kind of one of the themes that uh, Steve Vost was talking about a little bit here. It's not either bhakti or jnana. It's not either embodied or soul, you know, that sort of either or dialectic, um, you know, the Jane epistemology is nothing if it's not a resistance to mutually imposed false illicit disjunctions and false binaries. 
I mean, that's what Anekantavad really is, is a movement towards a dialectical logic. And the critique of Akanta is when somebody falsely imposes an illicit disjunction, right? So that's really what it is. The emphasis on eternality too much for Nyaya Visheshika Yoga Sankhya versus the um, influence too much on flux for the Buddhists. They're all positing a false binary, a false dichotomy. Whereas the Jain impulse towards dialectic, both and, that we see with the Syatvada and the Saptabhangi there, that is very much more akin. So I think when we're looking at Jain yoga practices, we shouldn't have those same sort of false binaries because then we're not thinking like Jains, right? We're thinking with illicit disjunctions. It's not either jnana or bhakti. It's not either body or soul. It's not either desire or no desire. It's not either poverty or nivrti. You know, those are, I mean, all of those um, sort of juxtapositions and dialectics came up in our talk. So I think uh, Chaitanya Prakash, um, I think that that would answer that question as well, too. So it all has a place. And I see uh, Dr. Long has more to say about that. Uh, just a little bit, just, just to uh, underscore what you're saying uh, by an example, um, in, in uh, Yashavijiya's Gyanasara, even though he does posit uh, a progression from what we would today call outer to inner, at no point does one give up the outer practices, right? It's it's not uh, it's not the case that you are progressing in the sense that, okay, now I no longer need to chant, I no longer need to sit in a particular way. You continue doing all of that, even as you're cultivating uh, this an anamana uh, experience. So, yeah, it, it, that's precisely right. Right. Thank you for that excellent. Excellent co comment, uh, Rajmani. I know it's late at night. He's down there in uh, Chennai. So I don't know if he stayed up all night uh, to to hear the answer to this. Um, if anybody else has anything to say, Parvinji, did you want to uh, address that as well? Thank you. Thank you, Kodanji. I've been hesitant to uh, say anything among this esteemed scholars. But I think a few questions have come up. So I just wanted to talk about it. Particularly, particularly in our question answers, I saw a question or comment about the uh, yoga practice that we are seeing, commercialized yoga practice uh, that we are seeing. I mean, they used a word that I don't want to repeat here, but uh, I think the key thing is we, we got to look at the yoga that has been commercialized in the Western world or even India now is just a preamble to the actual yoga practice. If you really look at that, that's preparing your body to get into a, a situation where you can really get into what, from my understanding, what Jains want to achieve out of yoga. Yoga, by definition, is union. But at the same time, I think Steve pointed out, it, it takes us into this union as well, because while we are connecting with ourselves through yoga, we are disconnecting with the mundane worldly affairs as well. So it, it, it works both ways. But the the process that Jain yoga takes us and it's it's a it's a real process. It's not something disjointed, a very well structured process. Jain yoga takes us through physical exercises, but essentially it wants to take us to meditation, contemplation, and then go higher and higher in consciousness development. So we get to the stage we are really get in touch with ourselves, which is our soul. I think this, 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 what I've heard today, uh, this is an area I think we need to spend more time on that. I think really bring it out, the 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 salient aspects of Jain yoga, and these are very critical aspects that that all of us need to understand. The world needs to understand. Yeah, these are these are great points too, um, Parvin G. And I'm glad that you uh, mentioned the comment there. I, yeah, this is a word that I wouldn't um, repeat publicly either, um, but it is still an important point. Um, uh, maybe I will say it just. But he he asked, uh, and I'm not going to delete the comment because it was it was a good comment, uh, despite what may not be um, the best language choice. But um, this is perhaps not the context of the workshop. But I did not hear anything about the popular yoga in the West. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say it. forgive me and plug your ears if you're adverse to harsh language. He says what is called the bastardization of yoga. Um, obviously problematic terminology, um, but would anybody care to comment on that? And then there was another uh, 
comment in that same vein. Uh, this was perhaps not the context of this workshop. This one's anonymous, but didn't I did not hear any? Oh, that is the same comment. <laughs> oh wait, did I get did I get it wrong? Let me see. I think there yep. was another one. Uh, yep. uh, oh, so, um, it, it's the same chain of it's the same, it's the same chain of comments. Yep. Okay. So yep. um, I think I think something which maybe should be said uh, about Western modern Western yoga. I think this speaks to Tilo's uh, sort of framing how uh, the Jain modern Jain yoga movement itself is increasingly structural structured like global capitalism, um, which seems to be inherently problematic. But then if we also think about the uh, bankrolling of the Mughal Empire on the part of Jain's. Uh, maybe there's a history of of capitalism there that is not completely untraditional. Um, so I think something might need to be said about uh, the intersection between the modern transnational yoga, postural based yoga movement, modern Jain uh, yoga, and how that may be uh, problematic. And I think I saw uh, Dr. Long raise his hand on that point. Which very very briefly, um, I think the very fact that we had such a long and rich conference without bringing up this topic yeah. itself shows that there's much more to this topic than what often pops into contemporary people's minds when they hear the word yoga. Good point. Such Good a point. great point. Such a yeah. great point. Okay, uh, Tilo, I think you had a lot to say that related to this. Yeah, but just, just shortly um, replying to this comment, um, I, I think both um, yoga, postural yoga as it's practiced in, in Western countries nowadays and, and these all these various contemporary Jain and yoga traditions, they stand within the same genealogy. They have the same history of a hundred years. And they are both products of a of a, a east-west exchange which which went back and forth various times. And and there's multiple moments within that development that have been well described by scholars like um late 19th, early 20th century uh Indians um picked up yoga as um, something that actually had a function within the independence struggle, like the the, uh, the physical um, exercise element, which would make a stronger nation. And, and these kinds of things uh, can be found in the discourse of Vivekananda or, or, or people com contemporary to him and to later. And um, early posture yoga was influenced by, by Western uh, workout and like wrestling um, um, context also so both eastern and western yoga nowadays are the product of the same exchange between the east and the west since more than a century so we can rhetorically oppose them but they're actually structurally very similar too yeah great great point and uh steve vos is eager to um mention something on that point as well yeah i mean i think that for my current research that uh, I'm doing on some contemporary Jain movements, I think the the sort of the Eastern Western sort of dichotomy is has broken down in ways in which I think we need to start using the phrase transnational or the term transnational, um, and really start to think about how it is that there are organizations that are based in India that are largely appealing to diaspora audiences, um, and that are selling a certain kind of a cosmopolitan view of yoga, Jain practices, meet your maker, meet your, sorry, meet your heritage, um, kinds of things. Um, and so, yeah, saying that this is sort of, yeah, it's definitely bi-directional now. Um, so yeah. And, and I would just say, if you want to talk about the bastardization of yoga, like yeah, there's a, a good number of, uh, sort of folks in India that are doing things like how to do yoga in the back of your car in between That's meetings true. while you're driving, while your driver is sort of taking you across town, like who knows? So yeah, I mean, I wouldn't sort of like put it on like anyone's sort of laid at anyone's feet just yet. Um, but to say that, yeah, there are ways that the the understanding of how to make uh, Jainism appealing to a modern audience has often led to sort of how do you use Jain principles to cope with your middle class job in modern day capitalism? Um, and so that's not necessarily wrong or bad. I mean, this is sort of the world that we live in, but it is also like. Yeah, like how do we sort of instrumentalize Jain yoga practices or any kind of yoga practices so that we can do something else with them other than sort of focus on the moksha idea? I, I think I think that um, we keep kind of dancing around this point. Um, I, I hear so many resonance with the critiques of modern uh, mindfulness movement, 
uh, as well, too. You know, one of the main critiques is that it enables global capitalism. I mean, if mindfulness is supposed to be about like healthy, then really what it's doing is just making making it so people are better workers. I mean, is that really actually contributing to their health? Like, how do you how do you become more peaceful when you're in an abusive environment? <laughs> Is that really what we want to reduce, you know, mindfulness and yoga? And I got, a, I, I received a master's degree in Buddhist studies and um, a, a big field of study was secular Buddhism. And I just scratched my head at this um, and then how it would, uh, the, the mindfulness movement fed into that. We've used the term medicalization uh, in this context. And um, sometimes I, I take pause at this because on the one hand, yeah, it's good. We, you know, we can incorporate modern, you know, epistemes. But at what point are we redefining traditions and contributing to their erasure? And I think that that is really the question. So when does a tradition start? How do we define what's traditional and therefore valid and therefore authentic versus what is modern is therefore not valid and not authentic? Um, again, I would say be caution of the, the false binary, but there is certainly a point where our emphasis on a modern interpretation can erase the um, the traditional. And I think we've had that caveat in multiple ways too. Manu Meta, I see, has uh, something to add here. Thank Please, you, thank uh, you, Manu. Um, I think um, um, I'm thinking about uh, Parveen Ji's uh, point about, and also Dr. Rose's point about that, how Jain yoga can be useful when we talk, when we think about, uh, you know, modern and popular use of yoga as it comes from India slash Hindu slash Hindu nationalism. And I see development of uh, yoga thing as come out as projection from India uh, in three stages now. The first one was that that um, Patanjali guy, um, Ramde Baba makes it accessible to the mask, uh, giving it a new face that it's no more just a yogic hidden uh, practice done in isolation, but can be done in like 20,000 you know, audiences doing it at the 5 a.m. In, in at some like, you know, Ram Lila Maidan in Delhi. And then lots of CDs are coming out. And so he's like basically transforming the entire idea of yoga from textbook to completely, you know, physical bodily practices for good health. The second stage was that, and many people have missed this, like noticing because it's not been really created any like political uh, uh I mean, commentaries, but Narendra Modi's projection of Yoga Day, you know, declaring somewhere in June or July, I forgot the day because I don't observe that, like, but like he's declaring that and, and it's bringing back that, okay, India is claiming back the yoga thing. And India is making a face that we, we are the authentic authoritative agency of yoga. And the third stage, which I'm seeing as in like Indian, who is like very connect, highly connected to social media from Indian handles, that yoga has become like, you know, a, a kind of a product of a social media influencer now in India. It's no more very yogic practice. Any, anybody who is like doing some yoga practices, it's like, you know, have more than 60, 70,000 uh, subscribers and and in 15 seconds teaching like yoga for your eyes and face yoga is like booming a lot. So amid this all changes, it's very important for us now to really establish how we want to talk about Jain yoga. Because it's a kind yeah. of a perfect time. Yeah, this is this is important. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, appropriation is a word that surprisingly hasn't come up. Um, you know, appropriating yoga to reinforce other structures of power, you know, uh, perhaps Modi's yoga day is not necessarily a way of sort of standing up to colonialism, but I mean, maybe it is that. I mean, maybe it is uh, step in, standing up against the appropriation of yoga by the West and sort of a reasserting of Indians' sort of cultural heritage, Indian ownership, Indian cultural sovereignty over yoga. And that may be very important. Absolutely, yeah. But on the other hand, is he just appropriating it for some Hindutva sort of nationalism is he making it for his own so who's benefiting uh from these dialogues you know what does the discourse mean in the cultural moment i think is uh and yeah and we also have to see that like when he's he declared yoga day on one particular year in one particular but before that he started like okay all the schools on this particular day will come together and he would lead one yoga session and what he's talking to the world by doing that 
that he's uniting India, presenting it to the world, using yoga as an apparatus. So like, what language is talking to the world? Right. It's something it's, really essential to think about. When anyway, it's all of the above that you have talked and Kojan has talked, it's it's political move. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think it has nothing to anything uh, to do with spirituality. One thing I would submit, uh, if everybody sees the value, yoga is the word. Okay, yoga is what it means in terms of union. And and one of the westernization results of the world is that we call it yoga, just like we call Rama, just like we call Mahavira. Something for the scholars to think about. Actually, Parvinji, that's uh, those are Hindi pronunciations of those words. And if you were taught Sanskrit, you call it yoga, and it's it, really you know, okay. yoga, ha, yoga, yoga, yoga. You know, I mean, but. Um, I, I've asked this question a lot, and someone even uh, posted it. Uh, but this is not a East-West thing; it's a Sanskrit Hindi thing. No, which <laughs> which, which might be might be East-West too. It might have a component to that because uh, we we in the West approach South Asia through Sanskrit generally, right? right. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of um, discussion, increasing discussion, how we may have disempowered vernaculars uh, in the process of that, which is why everybody should study Gujarati. Um, um, or Hindi. Um, <laughs> sorry, Vaini, but I did say that for you. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, so I think it's important. Um, my general thing is that uh, if I get corrected on my pronunciation uh, from somebody from South Asian uh, heritage, I usually just accept the, the critique, <laughs> even if it's a Bengali pronunciation of yeah, whatever. But yeah, I think it's an important conversation, but I'd say it's not wrong, but it also might be as Westerners, we might, you know, if we get corrected in that, we might want to stop and think, you know, is our, is our exclusive use of Sanskrit itself a form of hegemony? I, I, That's a I, point. Totally I, point. I understand the point, uh, Jeffrey and Quotin. I got it. Uh, Alba. It, it, uh, it, it ends at O oh, in Sanskrit, but mm -hmm. in Western cultures, it becomes ah. It's only about short or and long as so it's yoga, not yoga, but yes. it's yoga. And then, of course, there's actual incorrect pronunciation, too. Yeah. The most yeah. common letter mispronounced is the uh to ah. Uh, yeah. Particularly if you're, uh, I think, East Coast. <laughs> um, but then West Coast, we have our own little problems with pronunciation. Everybody has a different. Uh, That's right. And I like to try to be accepted on accents as well, too, because I would never correct somebody's beautiful Spanish accent, you know. Um, but that being said, there is a certain point where yeah, I, I, it's, <laughs> yeah. well, and 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 you know, uh, and and it is a fair point. I mean, yeah, the that difference between ah uh and ah, uh, I mean, I my students have a hard time hearing it. They have a hard time hearing aspirated sounds too, um, and so and dental sounds. I mean, these are these are the things that. Uh, they can't hear and then they have a hard time reproducing. And I, I think the what I really appreciate about what Kojin said is that yeah, when you know, even if you're like me and you start getting into an argument about Sanskrit and Hindi and so on, uh there, there has to be an attitude of humility, right? It can't be this kind of, well, we're Absolutely. here to tell you about, you know, who you <laughs> are. And, and so I, I I fully agree. In fact, um on the advice of a good friend in the community, uh, often when I uh give talks to Jain groups. I won't say anekantavada. I'll say anekantavada. Right? It's good because that's the term people know. And I don't think yep. there's anything wrong with that. You know? Yep. Okay. We've had those issues with editing books too. Um, you know, which terms do we, because you know, a lot of times I just want to Sanskritize everything because it's most recognizable. But then again, at what point does that become its own form of hegemony? So these are, these are also good questions. I love linguistic conversations. <laughs> I can have <laughs> Um, I believe we're running, uh, we're just about six minutes over time. I've really enjoyed this conversation a lot. Um, and I think that uh, there was another question about how yoga is so associated with asanas and breathing techniques and whether um, breathing in asana has a place in Jain yoga. I think that's been answered by a lot of our uh, yeah. section on embodied yoga. You know, we've had multiple different presentations that showed Kayotsarg, uh, pranayama as being both advocated by the yoga shastra but also a caution against it you know i mentioned that and so, uh, there was also another mention of that so i think that um 
we should probably uh, wrap up here and start to end the conference because I do really like punctuality in, in general. Um, so I, I suppose we will have a um, couple uh, closing remarks. Um, for my closing remarks, I would like to say this has been an absolutely outstanding conference. This is really one of the best uh, online conferences I've ever intended, uh, attended. And I think a lot of that had to do with the quality of presentations. You all put a lot lot of thought into this research um, and you really uh, put your best foot forward, so to speak. Uh, there was also something about the flow of everything that happened, both in the first half and the second half. It really seemed like each presentation was in direct conversation with the previous presentation and was in conversation with all the others. So I'm really sort of struck by how much we're all asking the same sort of questions. Uh, and, you know, I think that that's important. Um, and, and I'm really, really, really thankful for that. So anyway, I'd like to thank all of our uh, panelists in particular for creating such an excellent, excellent uh, conversation today. Thank you. Uh, a few of you stayed up all night. I see oh, Pragya is still here. <laughs> so I don't know what time it is where she's at. Tilo is uh, up late too. So several of you are up late. Uh, I respect you for violating your bedtime. As people know, I do not do that. Um, <laughs> Um, so thank you very much. And um, also thank you to the Ari Hanta team. You know, we have a whole marketing team. We have our sort of executive team uh, that's worked hard on this and has encouraged this. And I really want to thank uh, Parveen uh, Jane here, who's uh, in attendance. Also, Dr. Christopher Miller, who, like some of you, is should be. He's in bed right now, uh, which I can't say I blame him. Uh, thank you to Christopher Miller. Also, uh, uh, um, uh, Taina Rodriguez has worked so hard on promoting this. Uh, promote uh, Patel is not visibly present here. He's probably in the audience, but he's done so much to encourage all of our work at Arihanta. So I want to thank uh, all of our uh, executive team at Arihanta. And of course, the attendees, we had fantastic attendance, uh, you know, fluctuate in between anywhere between 40 and 80 attendees at any given time, which is, I think is exceptional for an online conference. So really my closing remarks are just thank you all very much for uh, all of this. Um, and I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, eight hours later, I'm still enthusiastic and ready to talk. <laughs> And I'm sure I'll be feeling the same way. Uh, and then I would like to turn it over to uh, Parvin G uh, for some of his closing thoughts and comments. Jai Jinayant. Uh, first of all, Kodan Ji, great job. Yes. Moderating this conference and leading all the efforts that you talked about to bring us to this point. What a journey today. What a journey of learning today. It's just, it was just amazing. Uh, honestly, I didn't leave my chair or desk even for a moment because every talk was great. And eight hours, Kozanji, is like a tapasya today. So because we learned a lot. So it's it's part of that. Uh, what we saw today is just a glimpse of what our scholars are doing, which, which I would call it a trailer to the movie. If this glimpse is so great, think about the actual work that they're doing. It's just, it's just amazing to all the scholars who participated today. Thank you very much. Uh, you are all sort of divulging into the old age, age old subjects through the various texts that, that our Acharyajis have written over centuries and centuries. And you are extracting the nuggets out of that to share with us. Okay. But the beauty of what, what, this group of scholars is doing, you're presenting in a way that I can, a, a common layman can relate to it. I want to learn how to apply these studies to my daily life, and you guys are helping us. And that is a tremendous value that you're bringing. Kojanji, you talked about, through our teachings, are we modifying or westernizing the teachings? No, we are discovering, re, we are rediscovering covering all the teachings and presenting it in a way that everyone can, around the world can understand. Jane have done a great job in keeping this philosophy to themselves. And I say that very, it's my common statement. I tell, tell it to everybody. This is high time we bring it to the world. World needs to know it. And there is a value in doing that. Uh, so I think this is just, this is just, Great. And from Arihant Institute, I don't want to plug in too much, but the whole purpose of our platform is to bring you guys together. Use our platform 
to share your research, your your scholarship. We are going to take it around the world for you. Work with us. And that's our whole objective. We want to make sure the world learns what Mahavir taught 2,600 years ago. You guys are doing it. But until now, it has been kept into a sort of localized sphere that we want to break and, and bring it out. The, the good example is, in two years, students from 20 countries have approached us and taken our courses, which is not a small feat. It's all because of you guys. If you look at our master's degree students, almost 90% are non-Indians. That tells world needs to know this, this, this philosophy. World needs to know how do they apply it to our day-to-day -day life. That's what we are doing at our Hint Institute. Help us to get to that stage where world can use, it's not for us. We are not pitching ourselves. We are pitching our philosophy that the world really needs to know. So at the end, I really want to thank everybody. And in the morning I said it, but I want to say it again. Kudos to you, all of the scholars and educators who have put your career to educate the world that the knowledge that the world needs it. I really, really appreciate that. We really, in Jain Dharma, teachers is placed at a very high level. And we mean it when we say that. Keep doing it. Our job is to stay behind and support you whichever way you want it and reach out to us. We will figure out a way to fulfill what your requirements are so that you can excel in what you're doing. These are my parting words. Great job today, Kojanji, and great job, everybody. Truly, truly appreciate that. And we're gonna meet again. We have another conference coming up in a few months. We want to see all of you. And again, not to do any marketing, but spread the word because Arihanta Institute needs to read, read, reach the world. We really need, particularly among your peers in academic community, theology departments, religious departments, bring out the messages to them. We want to take it out to the world. All right. Thank you very much and Jai Jinayant. Thank you, uh, Dr. Parveen Jain. In case you didn't catch it, he's the founder, CEO, and chairman of Arihanta Institute. He's also been engaged in philanthropy for decades, immense, immensely good work for the good of our collective humanity he's been doing, and recently has really uh, turned his attention to philanthropy for the academy and a place where it's sorely needed uh, as well, too. So thank you for all of your work, uh, Parveen uh, G. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, with that, um, thank you all very much, and I hope to see you again uh, very soon. Jai Jinendra. <laughs>